Generals, ladies and gentlemen, commander of uh, the military academy, welcome to this year's uh, annual uh, conference on um, land operations and combined arms. And this year's uh, topic is warfighting at the Army Corps and division level. I uh, see several faces here that I've seen before. Welcome to all of you. Some will be almost regulars now. So we'll look forward to also to next year's uh, annual conference with uh, yeah, new interesting topics. This year, the host will be uh, the excellent uh, Major Thomas Brott. And uh, thank you very much for this uh, opening. And uh, the fl uh, word is yours. The floor is yours. Thank you, General. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Land Operations and Combined Arms Conference with this year's topic, Warfighting at the Formation Level. Uh, my name is Thomas Brott and I will be your hosting guide through this conference. Uh, I work as a planning officer here at the Military Academy uh, and I have prior experience as an army from the Army Engineer Corps. Firstly, I want to extend my <laughs> thanks to all contributors to this year's conference. Uh, thanks to you, the conference maintained a high uh, international standard with valuable contributions from both uh, researchers and professionals. While the conference is organized by the Military uh, Academy as part of the Norwegian Defense University College, uh, it also financially supported by the Army and the Home Guard. The founder and driving force behind this conference is the responsible officer, Lieutenant Colonel Trygve Smith. His commitment to research and development has led him to organize and develop an R&D conference uh, over the past three years, turning it into a significant milestone and focus area for the Military Academy uh, and the Defense University College. When we initiated this conference three years ago, uh, its main purpose was to bridge the gap between uh, the research community and the professionals. Uh, the military profession must be firmly grounded in research and this conference aims to be a platform where for researchers and uh, professionals to engage in academic discussions uh, and knowledge exchange. Recent global developments uh, characterized by increased instability and uncertainty have led to, led to greater investments in military power and necessitated change, uh, changes in the military to address tomorrow's security challenges. These investments and changes uh, must, in turn, be research-based to make informed decisions. This conference is meant to be a small contribution towards building a robust academic and research-based uh, foundation for making informed decisions regarding development of the future uh, land forces. We have great confidence that this year's program will effectively address these themes. Uh, the program is designed with 30 minutes presentation and includes ample breaks. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me it's a privilege to introduce our first speaker, Major General Lars Levik. He's a current commander of the Norwegian Army. Major General uh, Lars Levik is a distinguished military leader with extensive uh, experience, having served as Commander Brigade North. Uh, and head of section for the national security policy, crisis management and preparedness in the Norwegian Ministry of Defense. In addition to a long extensive mil military career, uh, the Major General Levik has also invested in his academic development, graduating, graduating from esteemed institutions such as the US War College and Advanced Command and Staff College in the UK. This combination of real-world experience and scholarly understanding positions him as a well-rounded leader. His impressive accolades include the Legion of Merit from the US and the Defense Medal with Laurel Branch from Norway. Today, Major General Lars Levik will share his insights on commanding land forces in the 21st century, the Norwegian model. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Major General Lars Levik. Thank you very much, and um, also thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about my, my favorite team, the Army. 
uh, and and also looking at how we can command and control the army today and in uh, and in the future. Uh, looking at the audience, there are um, some people I'm really looking forward to hearing their questions. So this will I'll try to be rather short and then open up for questions. And also looking forward to discussing with you in the uh, in the breaks coming up. I'll start by describing the framework, the setting that the Norwegian army operates within. The Norwegian defense concept, which you see on the um, on the slide, was born out of our experience from 1940, the Second World War, where we realized the hard way there is a big difference between friends and allies. That was also reinforced by our experience throughout the Cold War, where we developed stronger relations to some allies within the alliance, within the NATO alliance. Uh, and as you can see, kind of our concept rests on a strong national defense, where the Norwegian armed forces kind of make up the, the main part of it. NATO and NATO's collective defense, and I'll get back to some of what that actually means in regards to plans and, and how we see ourselves. But also a strong bilateral cooperation and also bilateral plans with a number of allies. And all of this is underpinned by the total defense concept, kind of opera operationalizing the idea that it's not the army or the armed forces that are to defend Norway. Norway is to defend Norway, and that kind of uh, requires a whole society approach, uh, which also, again, was born out of our experience from the Second World War, established during the Cold War. And luckily, when the Cold War ended, we did not get, uh, we, we did not get rid of the total defense concept. We kind of just left it. So when the situation changed again, we had a concept, we had the laws, we had the regulations in place, and it was about modernizing this concept. And it's uh, very, very important. Looking at where we are, where Norway is located, um, that has of course not changed. It's important, and our, our strategic setting is, is um, first of all, with a strong transatlantic link. That is important for us in regards to both our bilateral uh, relationship, but also being a NATO member. And looking at the region where, Norden, where, where, where Norway is positioned, you can view it as having two strategic directions, the North and the Arctic, and the Baltic. And on the slide here, these are depicted as two different areas. And in some way they are, but they are connected. We believe that if a crisis emerge, it will not be either or. This area will be a one region, and um, the situation in the north will be linked to the Baltics, and the Baltics will be linked to the north. Then looking at what's the mission of the Norwegian army. I have, as a chief of Norwegian army, I have the traditional mission, which is to organize, man, equip, and train the force, which you kind of uh, traditionally um, associate with the chief of staff of any army. Uh, that also includes <coughs> being the primary advisor to the chief of defense and the government on all uh, questions related to land forces. That is also the same as all my colleagues in, in Europe. What makes us a little bit different is the fact that I'm also charged with leading the army, leading all uh, land forces um, in the northern parts of Norway in peace, crisis, and wartime. So I also have a what we call a tactical commander role. Uh, I'll get back to some more detail what it actually means, but to try and describe it in the framework which we're discussing at this conference. The role of the chief of the Norwegian army as a tactical commander can be described as a combination of elements which we associate with the land component commander, 
elements which we associate with the division level command and a dash of territorial command as well. And all this is done with a headquarters which is um, rather small. So it means we need to find out how we do that. And I'll get back to at least some of the way we approach it. I'm not saying we have uh, figured it all out, but I think we are actually onto something in regards to, um, to handling these three tasks. And to be honest, even though I haven't received, or the army hasn't received, significant increase in resources when we got the third task of being the tactical commander, it actually makes sense. It makes sense because it's now much, much easier, I think, for all of us, to, when we are prioritizing what to train and what to focus on, it's all linked to operational plans. And I think that is a very positive development. This is... Um, a way of describing how we try to organize these two roles on a daily basis within the army. What you can see on the left-hand side, that's the operational plans going all the way from NATO regional plans, GRPs, down to our own plan, which is the guard. And on the right-hand side, you can see kind of the peacetime regulations, related to money, manning, equipment, all those things. I'll get back to the, the, uh, the regional plans and, and, and their role. But what we are trying to achieve, and I would say we are fairly successful in achieving, is by combining the operational plans and the regulations regarding money, manning and everything into a annual army coordination order, which regulates all the things we do, on a daily basis, that being supporting um, NATO with EFP in Lithuania, patrolling the border to Russia, training recruits, or school leaders, or whatever. Everything is kind of merged into one army coordination order, which looks 18 months ahead. That gives us both the ability in an organized manner to combine the operational and the manning equipment and training bits. It also gives the army units a perspective which allows them to plan uh, and not be detailed directly by the army, army headquarters. It also then allows the army headquarters to some extent at least to elevate from the daily business which I still think is best handled by battalions and brigades, to looking at the more overall strategic issues and operational issues. Um, the regional plans um, that are being developed, and of course I cannot go into detail on them uh, in this forum, but confirm my strong belief in the importance of plans, because they give directions not only for the Norwegian army, but within a framework of the alliance, and also linked to key allies. Uh, and uh, we have, since the work with the graduated response plans started a few years ago, now the regional plans, that's allowed allow us to have nested plans um, with allies and also as a part of the Norwegian Joint Force. <coughs> We are living in historic times. I'm probably not the only army chief who said that, I think. But actually, I think this time I have, compared to at least the last 10, 20 years, I think there is stronger reason to say that we are living in historic times. And as we can see um, around us in the Ukraine, in Gaza, moreover, more, more or less all over, things are not necessarily going in, the, 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 in, in a positive direction. Seen from Norway, seen from the army headquarters at Bardefoss, 1,000 kilometers north of here, there's, actually, there, there's one good news. The good news is that Sweden and Finland have both applied for NATO membership. Uh, and... Uh, It might be that I spent more than 30 years in the army, but I, I really, really, I, I can find lots of interesting information and knowledge in looking at maps. 
uh, and I think you all recognize where this map is from. It's uh, the Nordic countries without borders. And on this map, we have put in the most important roads. We could have involved, included railroads, airports, harbors, but we, we tried to keep it a little bit easy. And also, we have put in the major army formations in the three Nordic countries. So what I can read out of this map is a Nordic region without borders opens up lots of opportunities. Looking at Norway without with borders, there's one main road from south to north, 2,000 kilometers. If you include Sweden and Finland into this, there are numerous roads going north to south, also west to east, opens up lots of opportunities for the most important things in most important thing in military operations, logistics, right? But also for lots of other opportunities. Um, so that's really the good news. Having said that, it also means there are more roads from east to west. So it's, these roads are not one way, they are also going the other way. So the, the one on the other side can also see the same picture as we're seeing if, we, if you turn the map the other way around. The other bit is that uh, this illustrates a point which I think is specific for land forces. Where a, a nation deploys its land forces, tend to reflect its strategic interests. Because land forces, even though we are mobile, our role is to be there. An aircraft can fly over there for an hour or two, maybe three, and go back to the base. Ships sailing through the night, wherever you need them. But army units tend to be stationed where, where it's important strategically. And this reflects that even if we are now looking at the Nordic as one region, it also reflects a very strong difference in the three countries' strategic interests. So the Nordic land forces are typically focused and concentrated up north, while the Swedish and Finnish land forces are typically concentrated in the south. That is a factor which we need to look into and work based on, because I don't think that will change. The, a NATO membership won't change that. That's kind of the, the foundation as we move forward um, and make it maybe even more important for all of us to cooperate. For the limited number of, for instance, land forces up in the Arctic, um, we really need to cooperate to make the most of it. But again, Sweden and Finland being parts of becoming parts of NATO is by far the most positive news these days uh, and, and um, provides great, great opportunities, I think. And we will exercise some of them at Nordic response in, in Finnmark and Northern Finland, Northern Sweden uh, this winter. So, <coughs> what's the doctrinal frame, framework? What's the um, framework for, for land forces. Uh, I think we have provided a number of tomorrow's army pamphlets that will be left uh, at the back of the room. That's a, a, a doctrinal uh, pro uh, product from the army. And I'm very proud of it, mostly because I did not write it. I got the, the, the honor of signing it, but it was produced by a some of our most brilliant majors, lieutenant colonels, over a period of about a year, and issued in 2021, and provides kind of the aiming point for the Norwegian army as we look forward, not the next four years, but maybe 15, 20 years. Uh, and, and, and even though I know it's in Norwegian, so I, it's, it's limited, um, how, how uh, for, for the, it's, it's a limited use for some of you, but still, I, those who haven't seen that, I, I strongly recommend have a look at it. It's, uh, at least I'm very proud of it, and, and for us it is very useful from everything to discussing what kind of long-range fire systems do we need, how will the manning of the Norwegian army look in 20, 
35, to how will we integrate into the joint force, combined joint force, in 2040. It gives us um, a really good aiming point, I think, for, for moving forward. Multi-domain operations. I'm not going to spend much time on trying to explain and argue why. Um, that's, that's the operation, that's the term we're using uh, for where we are operating, not only in Norway, but with all, all, of, all our allies. And what is missing in this picture is also the fact that all operations will happen in an environment where also diplomatic, information, economic, and lots of other factors uh, will play in as well. Then looking at what's the role of land forces. What's the role of the land forces in this context? Land forces control territory. Control territory where people live. Um, land forces are the only one capable of defeating enemy land forces. Land forces are the only one capable of seizing and holding key terrain and securing key infrastructure. And none of this is happening on our own, but you cannot do that. You cannot do those tasks without having land forces and having land forces on the ground. Then, when we do that, we do it by executing combined arms. Some elements of those combined arms have, were born out of the trenches of the First World War. Some elements were born out of the maneuverist warfare, at least in parts of Second World War. Some elements, and you can kind of see in these two elements, but also new elements being combined into modern combined arms on the battlefield of Ukraine or in the streets of Gaza, as we are standing here. So combined arms is not static, but it is about combined arms. And that combined arms bit is also not something you do only with land forces. Yes, there are combined arms between land forces, but also within the multi-domain framework to include civilian actors. And for us, especially the total defense system. Okay, looking ahead, What's, what, what are kind of the, so some of the key aspects I would like to address when, when talking about the Norwegian model? Uh, how do we approach this? Operational plans. It is very, very important to, that we now have a framework in place which I can ensure that the Army's operational plans are nested with the National Guard headquarters, the Chief of Defense, and NATO and regional plans. That provides a unity of effort, which I see no other way of kind of achieving. Still, I fully recognize that plans, we will never execute a plan. But by planning, by having these processes going, we will be in a position to be able to adopt to <coughs> whatever will be in front of us. And there are two things that is certain, I think, in the future. One of them is for the Norwegian army. There, there, are, there are two things that is certain. One of them is we will be surprised. History shows again and again and again that we are surprised. But then having plans to start from actually provides the ability to start executing even when you are surprised. And in a manner that is not only based on your current understanding, but is actually nested into a overall concept for defending Norway or contributing to the alliance. 
The other bit, which is certain for the Norwegian army as long as we operate in Norway, is that wherever we go, we will meet a whole bunch of them. And that's why I'm kind of addressing, looking at some of the combined arms, and I will especially like to address the 40,000 Home Guard soldiers being all over Norway. The army provides the ability to seize and hold terrain to defeat enemy land forces. We provide the ability to maneuver, fire and maneuver, and defeat enemy forces. The Home Guard provides the local knowledge, so we can do this in a manner where we can make the most out of their local knowledge, um, support the local population, and that's a very, very important um, force multiplier for me as a land commander. Therefore, also recognizing this, we are doing this not only in times of crisis and war. The army and the institute of the army have tactical command of the two northernmost home guard districts on a daily basis. So meaning this very, very close army home guard link is being executed on a daily basis, which is really, really important. The other bit is, of course, being a part of the Joint Force. That was a, why I was a little bit late this morning, because I attended the weekly Joint Commanders meeting uh, with the National Joint Headquarters in, in Buda. And by not only meeting each other now and then, but actually by meeting each other, doing operations together 24-7, 365 days a year, we're also getting that effect, I think, in being able to not only function as a joint force in times of crisis and war, but actually by doing it every day, we will increase that ability also, whatever might come in the future. An allied integration. We have been, I have been, many of those sitting in this room, we have been integrating, integrated together on operations like in Afghanistan literally fighting shoulder to shoulder, uh, also in the Balkans, in Iraq, and other places around the world. The last, I would say, five to seven years, we have gone through an um, a, a evolution in Norway as well. Going back to 2014, we, on a not very regular basis, but we had allies coming to Norway to be cold and miserable. There's plenty of opportunities to be called invisible in Norway. Then we recognize, okay, we, we, we might actually start, start to improve this. So then we started being called invisible together in the same area. That was a step in the right direction, but kind of didn't really make the most of it. But by having the regional plans, having operational plans together, we are now still being called invisible. But actually, almost everything we do is mission rehearsals. And that's provide a much, much clearer focus on not only how do we handle the weather and all that, but actually how do we operate together. So that's what I mean by allied integration. Uh, and that includes lots of different things from exercising uh, regular VTCs with, with allied commanders, operational plans, Etc. Etc. And all those things are important. All those things are linked to things like MOU and statements of requirements and all that. All, all those things need to be there. But at the end of the day, I'm pretty sure that also what we're doing with having this linkage between people, the Home Guard soldier and the Norwegian soldier, the F-35, um, the F-35, F-35 pilot and the company commander. The battalion commanders from Norway, US Marine Corps, Germany, UK, US Army, get to know each other, spending time together in everything from a beer call to our exercises. That create that personal knowledge, that create that level of trust, which I think is actually the most, still is, even in, in the 21st century, that is still the most important bit. Because that trust is what you can fall back on when things become difficult. And they will become difficult.
but then you can make that phone call. You can meet that allied commander and say, well, how, how, how do we do this? And we all will have to operate within the framework of our political masters, but still, trust is still the most important bit and the most, I think, the most important product of the things we do every day uh, preparing for crisis and war. Future opportunities. Um, I'll make this pretty brief, so there's time for some, some questions. Talking to our allies, command at Echelon is back. So division level, core, core level. Um, and we need to approach that with an army that is, as of now, a couple of brigades worth of soldiers and maybe moving towards a third brigade. How do we do that? We need to appro approach that in a manner that is adjusted to our resources, while at the same time being recognizable for the allies coming in. Uh, and the first test we will get on that on a much larger scale is Nordic Response 2024, where we will have a Norwegian division type formation, including allies. There will be a Finnish Swedish division type formation commanded by the uh, Command General of Second Met. That will be one of the one of the first times when we actually start from talking about it to actually trying to exercise this. And we will exercise this in a, about as far north as we get, in Finnmark and Northern Finland, in March, which provides lots of opportunities to be called invisible, <laughs> even though the sun is back. So, um, also when looking at how we develop forces, we have had the tendency to say we need to copy our allies. And I think that makes sense in some regards. For instance, the fact that the Nordic countries, we have pretty similar mechanized brigades in types of organization, TTPs, lots of the same equipment, same main battle tanks, same infantry fighting vehicles. That's good, that makes it interchangeable. But that, I think that's only one way of approaching the, 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 approaching the future. The other is actually looking about being mutually reinforcing, which is actually what's happening between the Norwegian Army and the US Marine Corps. Because we are, some would say, we are developing in two different directions. Equipment-wise, doctrine-wise, that's maybe how it looks from the outside. But for me, it almost looks as if the US Marine Corps is developing its future force to fit perfectly into the, no the Norwegian, the Nordic problem set, and also to be combined with a competent army formation on the ground, cooperating with them. So their long range fires fits well into our sensors. The way we can, they can move in the, uh, in, in the littorals, fits very well with our ability to move on land and that can actually be an example of when we are mutually reinforcing. And the last bit, and potentially the second most important bit after logistics, is, is being collected. And if I had the, if, if I kind of knew how to do that, I would either be a four-star general or probably a billionaire, I think. But we have to get away from approach where we're trying to buy the safe systems, buy the safe systems, having identical system, because that's not gonna happen in an alliance with 30, more than 30 members. We need to look at how we can use protocols and make sure that our, we are inter interconnected and using also available civilian technology, everything from satellites to whatever. That's the ability for especially a small force like ours to be able to act faster, cooperate closer with our allies than any opponent. And that's kind of the path to the future. And also why we actually are spending as much money on C4IS as we are using on main battle tanks. And it makes sense. Both of them make sense. So ladies and gentlemen, I think we're ready to proceed.
It's a privilege to introduce our next speaker, retired Major General Gary Deakin. He will sh share valuable insights on lessons identified from planning and commanding warfighting with NATO Army Corps. Major General Deakin's remarkable career includes serving as Deputy, Commander, uh, De Deputy Chief of Staff Plans in Allied Joint Force Commands in Naples, uh, Commander of uh, 51st Infantry Brigade and Headquarters in Scotland, and Deputy Director of Strategy, Plans and Policy in U.S. Central Command, among other key roles. His experience also encompasses command roles, notably leading the 1st Battalion of Duke of Lanchester's Regiment during combat operations in Iraq. His dedication and leadership have earned him numerous commendations and awards, including first becoming an officer of the Order of the British Empire for his role as a battalion uh, battle group commander uh, in Iraq before being made a commander of the same order, Order of the British Empire, for his contributions as Director of SHAPE's uh, Comprehensive Crisis Management uh, Center. General Deakin holds two master's degrees, one in defense technology from Cranfield University and another in defense studies from King College in London. We look forward to your presentation, General. General, mm. the floor is yours. Mm. Th thanks, thanks, Thomas. Uh, General, welcome. Thank you very much for, the, uh, for, for inviting me here to join you all today. Um, I haven't stood on the stage and talked anything military for about 18 months, so I'm a little bit rusty. And the one thing you miss when you leave the military is not having a team around you helping you do everything. <laughs> As a NATO general, I miss the outer office, I can tell you. And so my biggest stress today was getting my presentation on the back <laughs> to work. <laughs> but, but really good to be here. And um, uh, the key thing about the, the uh, um, DCOS plans appointment in... in um, Naples, of course, was Exercise Triumph Juncture 18. And so I'd like just to kick off with, uh, with a video made by the staff then uh, on that. If you can show the video, please.
63,000 troops, uh, 300 fighters, 63 warships, and we lost what sadly lost one at the end uh, on recovery, and we lost a German soldier due to a, a road accident at Endex. Uh, remarkably low, low casualty rate, actually, considering all our planning. Uh, and those ships included the US carrier strike group, the first time we brought one into the Arctic Circle for some, for some years. 28 nations, including Sweden and Finland, and also Iceland. And I'll come back to that uh, uh, later in some, some, le some lessons that we'll learn. So German Netherlands call, good to see the team here who was there. Um, uh, six land maneuver brigades, two brigades minus in the littoral. So a lot of, lot of land component uh, action <laughs> as part of the NATO response source. So, so significant. And I think we probably spent a year planning the Live X and the CPX. And the key thing, and the Commander Land Forces mentioned it earlier, Nesting that with the total defense concept was a completely new thing for a, for a NATO headquarters to do, a joint force headquarters to do. Um, I'll come back to it through my, uh, through, through my presentation. Um, it's a really tall order, lessons identified, planning and commanding warfighting Army Corps in 20, 20 minutes. I've got five lessons that I'm just going to try and highlight and bring to life with some stories, and then hopefully I'll, I'll go at quite a pace, but I'll try and talk a little more slowly than my art colleague did. We have a habit of doing that, so if I'm talking too quick... Just throw something at me, Jim, or wave, and uh, don't tell me off for not wearing a poppy. I didn't get one, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, so five lessons. The first one, number one, is get the context right. Absolutely get the context right. This is a model I used as, uh, as, as plans for many years. It's out of the uh, Harvard Business School. It's called the Kniffin model, and it's how you look at a problem, first of all. Yeah, and I used to try and get commanders to do this. Now, we, the military, live in the bottom right in the simple there's our orders, there's our direction, that's the stuff we do, yeah? Actually, chaotic, that was the 7th of October in Israel. Yeah, the complex is probably Ukraine, Putin right now, yeah? Uh, the complicated is our NATO exercises, because we know everything and we know everybody, but it's still an alliance and it's extremely friction. friction. So you can take that model, and I throw this out there for a so I can come back to it, and... Just think about where we're operating and what the land component, what the core headquarters is going to be doing and what sits in. And, and as previously mentioned, getting that, getting your position, getting the lane right, the fight right is, is key. So context is absolutely everything. And it, that plays then to the changing character of war, doesn't it? I mean, and, and it was referred to in the last presentation, look at Ukraine now, contains many of the features of post-conflicts, perhaps the trenches, no man's land, barbed wire of World War I. The minefields of World War II, the armor, artillery, and the rocket systems of the Cold War. And we see high-end high anti-tank and air defense systems and un unmanned air and maritime systems in use. But critically, the new piece of context, and it was referred to in the last position, is we have unprecedented battlefield transparency by commercial satellite imagery, geolocation capabilities, smartphones, internet, so social media, and AI. All this context and particularly add to that wars amongst the people. Really, really key. And I grew up in an army that didn't fight wars amongst the people unless we went on counterinsurgency operations. Trident Juncture 18 with a total defense plan <laughs> brought it home in Norway how it is wars amongst the people, even if you're fighting you know, a peer equal adversary like, uh, like, like the Russians. I'm a disciple of Rupert, Rupert Smith. When I went through Staff College and you'll have read his book and his, heard his thinking on wars amongst the people uh, I, re I li r listened to him speak recently about it, and he, he, he characterized it slightly differently, and he talked about the fact that, think of a gladiator's, think of the film Gladiator and Russell Crowe in the pit. The currency of the pit is blood, swords. Yeah, that's the currency. And then around the pit, in the stadium, in the uh, Colosseum, are the people. And within the people, there's the confrontation, and the currency is ideas is information so it's, it's a conflict and, and that's what we're traditionally but now there are no walls we're fighting the other people inside the confrontation and the blood and the information and it's a really interesting way of looking at at a problem and when you look at context and think of it we want to get everything to here so that we can execute effectively so you unwind this to get it to the to the right place really really hard to do but uh, i offer that as as, uh, as lesson uh, num number one. I, as I grew up, just had la air, land, and sea component when I went to staff college, when we were on <laughs> ACSC all those years ago. Um, my old but now you've got cyberspace and information. 
and there's more coming. My four-star admiral in uh, Naples, uh, Admiral Foggo, used to bang on all the time about actually logistics is the most important one. And Trident Junction, I'll come back to it shortly, demonstrated that, and it's good to hear that's been mentioned a number of times. I, don't th I think command has become even more complex and has to adapt. And it's beyond collecting information, organizing logistics, planning and executing, to the need to synchronize disparate activities. From my experience, this has made command more collective, more collective, and I think that's what the commander was talking about when he describes his different roles as a leader uh, here in Norway. And decision-making authorities become much more, much more disturbed, uh, dispersed, and the empowerment of subordinates is absolutely critical, which is really challenging when you've got such modern communication systems. I recall planning the executing the LiveX and CPX for Trident Juncture, and the plan absolutely having to nest with the defense concept. Did it? Question mark. I think we did a really good job at messaging it did. The actual practical realities of the ground, I think we could have done a lot, lot more. And, uh, and I think the fight wouldn't have gone the way that it did on the exercise. It would have been very different because it was very scripted, very set. You know, and the CPX even proved to be, be slightly different. I recall being the, lead, the commanding the forward liaison team here in Norway for it. I was effectively the f joint commander's lead uh, in Stavanger and then in Boda, and I bounced backwards and forwards between the two. The commander, the admiral, was in Naples. <laughs> really? That just didn't fit right. You know, the, it just didn't fit right. And, and uh, th there's, there's a whole thing that comes from, from, th from this piece. And I think your aspirations for a joint command, a land component command, you're thinking that you, you need to think about those capabilities because for real, those communications links would have been dropped. They would have been disrupted. And we tried to get him up for the LiveX out into the Mount Whitney because he wanted to command from the ship. Couldn't get him on board. It was too rough. I put a planning staff on the ship in, uh, in Portugal to sail all the way up into the North Sea. They never saw their commander. <laughs> they spent three weeks very wet and very miserable. <laughs> Bless them. They were not happy when they got back. I had to owe them some, some leave. Um, the other thing about that uh, particular exercise was, the did we have the force structure right? We used the NATO response force. But I remember the plan it was all about the north. We did the north piece and we did the Baltic. But the north piece was the German Netherlands Corps. Lots of tanks, lots of heavy stuff, single roads. Oh, come on. You know? I, we learned very quickly that the plan was flawed. And the key to maneuver was the literal. It was all about maneuvering in the little in the, in the north of Norway. Uh, we weren't thinking, because we were ticking the box to get the German Netherlands Corps through the NATO response force tick. We were looking at ourselves, not the, not the enemy. So a really, really good... A, a, a good lesson to, 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 to learn. I kind of, bit, bit, it's a bit of a theme of my career. You know, we take a hammer to knock a nail in and we just keep using the hammer. Israel right now, really interesting, you know, what the, their approach. We need a, a, a nice, really smart screwdriver and you need to adapt to, 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 to make it right. <clears throat> and of course, the logistics tail was huge and I'll come back to it, uh, to, 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 to it shortly. There's a thing called log fast in NATO which, uh, um, which, is a, which is the way of synchronizing and getting all your kit ashore. I think it took us four months to get all the kit and equipment here. It took another four months to leave. I think the Italians were the slowest. I think we sat Italians in, in Norway some three months after the exercise had finished. I'm, I don't think they wanted to go home. I think they'd fallen for some beautiful Norwegian <laughs> partners or something. But well, I remember tracking the logistics. It was huge. And Logfast was the tool. The U.S. Marine Corps, I know there are U.S. Marine Corps in the audience, didn't know what Logfast was. A month to go and had nothing on the, day, on the, on the system. <coughs> Absolutely incredible. And thankfully, the Commandant the US Marine Corps heard about it and they, went, they stepped to it and got it right. But God, talk about last minute. And we still had kit and equipment. Wrong port, wrong location, wrong time. And I'll come, come back to it. Uh, some really, really great lessons. And there's something that comes from that about exercising for real, actually doing it and not simply doing a CPX. You know, I did many years in the ARC where we CPXed a lot. But when you actually do it for real, the lessons come to life and you realize that the plan uh, <laughs> was flawed. And, and I'll come back to a little bit of that. Okay, that's lesson number one. Always get the context right. Really simple. Lesson number two, commander's intent. Okay, commander's intent. Absolutely critical. Two very quick stories that relate to this. First one um, is I was in deputy, US, I was deputy CJ5 in the US Central Command and I led the coalition planning effort for the counter-ISIS campaign. 
Uh, and we brought, when, that, when that happened, I arrived as the Sinjar Mountain Crisis and Mozart fell. And uh, <coughs> it was my first day, Sinjar Mountain. And General Austin, who was the commander, he, he knew me as Brigadier Sinjar. That's what my nickname was. Anyway, we pulled all the planners in from the Middle East. We had 200 odd planners, 50 odd countries, NATO, everybody we can imagine. Took them all to Tamba to make the plan. Obviously, the combatant command plan, but then how we were going to bring it down to all the different components that we're going to do. Um, and the reason I highlight this is because we got the language wrong at the beginning of the campaign. We got the intent slightly out of sync. And I'll tell you why. So we made the campaign plan. We did it all. We were going to brief President Obama. I was at the briefing. It's five slides. Uh, context ends ways means. And I'll just use one example. Um, our recommended, the planner's recommendations was going to defeat Dash. Defeat Dash. Okay? For the land component, you understand, we'll take, take away its capability, make him render him useless. And we used Dash because all our Arabs said, use Dash because that's an offensive term to them. Yeah? The commander in chief said, we're going to destroy ISIS. Destroy ISIS because that was the political view. And he's the commander in chief, so it was turn to your right, gain height, and let's get on with it. Uh, but I think, and you'll see top right, defeat came back. We never got quite to dash, I think, US State Department. But as you take that down to the next level, that's really important that that is understood. And I remember General Austin, who was a brilliant leader. I was a core commander when I was a brigade commander in, in Basra, um, coming down and just being absolute clarity. And after that incident, he said, OK, people, this is not what we expected, but we're going to make it happen. But we will walk back. We will change the narrative over time. So it's how you as, you know, y and, and so getting that intent that's going to go to the core headquarters or wherever you want to call it is really important. I'm a student of Helga Hansen, a German retired four-star. Four, four parts, end state, unifying, which is unifying purpose in your mission, effects you want to achieve, the principles by which you're going to do it, what's your main effort? One piece of paper. And the best I ever came across was uh, David Richards in the arc and then uh, a, 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 another key unity of effort. So getting the commander's intent right understanding the context, what is being directed, and then absolutely focusing on it. Just conscious of the time. I, um, we were warming up in the arc. I was chief plans in the arc, warming up for a NATO response for exercise. The commander was a cavalry officer. Are there any cavalry officers in the room? Please don't put your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> cavalry officers are really lazy, aren't they? Really lazy. He's nodding his head, look. And uh, this, ca this commander, this three-star, who became a four-star, was particularly lazy. And his chief of staff, uh, who later also became a four-star, uh, was not lazy, but he'd known him well. He'd been his divisional chief of staff and his brigade chief of staff, so he knew how to handle him. We're going in for the brief, mission analysis briefing, and I'm chief plans. It's all set. I've already made the plan. Freaking brilliant. It seems great. We don't, need, we don't need the commander. He just needs to go, yeah, I'm doing it. Anyway, the chief of staff says to me, okay, Deakin, we're going to screw this briefing up. I'm going to kick you under the table when I want you to shut up because we've got to get the commander engaged. And I was like, um, really, sir? Honest? So I sat there, went through, and, he, and I got the, got the kick. Sometime later, I got another kick. And you could see the Comarch was starting to boil up. Next minute, he lost it. <laughs> get out of my office. This is dreadful. Shouting and screaming. I got up, followed the chief of staff out like this. In my head. Complete devastation, thinking my career is over. It's done. I walked into the chief of staff's office. He turned around with this massive smile on his face. Just big beaming smile. He said, yes. I went, really? He said, well, wait, wait. Next minute, the commander comes out of his office, screams at his MA, clear my diary. This is just freaking news. Clear it. I need 45 minutes to myself. 45 minutes later, myself and the chief of staff are standing to attention almost in front of the commander. He gives us a piece of paper. Probably the best intense statement I've ever seen in my life. Absolutely engaged because we got him in that place. It wasn't a nice journey, and I, get, I kept my career. I think it delayed me a year or two. <laughs> but, but, uh, but that's the key. So lesson number two, get the, get the, please get the commander's intent right and, and fight to get it there all the way through. Okay. Um, next is it's number three. It's all about the planning, not the plan. I think it's been said about three or four times already. And I'd just like to bring it bring it to life. The, the OPP, the NATO planning process, oh my God, what a nightmare. It's painful. That's why the Comarch was so uninterested because he just didn't want to go through this whole process. But it is about delivering a shared in, I, I vision. It is about developing a common understanding. Uh, and it is about taking ownership. 
and getting the staff to understand really 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 important but it is hard especially when you're dealing with egos commanders with ego okay really 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 hard but you've got to get them engaged and you've got to get them planning and they can't just focus on signing off the plan it's not that it's continual planning if i go back to my centcom experience coalition campaign plan counter isis uh general austin i don't think he signed off the plan for 18 months we were in the fight we were you know we were in the fight right in it but he didn't sign it because we were continually adapting it continually adapting it because as soon as it's finished it's so and there's a mindset and there's a nato thing right i've got to sign it all off and it's done there it is i remember being a, in the ark and we make a plan we go off go, we go off on tour around the uh around all the units that we're going to going to deploy and i went to the turkish corps in uh, istanbul a brilliant organization they were using it as a doorstop <laughs> keep a door open <laughs> which brings me to the next brilliant uh, thing about planning, planning not the plan, and that's about mission war gaming and mission rehearsal, and we don't do enough of it. And that particular experience, I remember the mission rehearsal in a in a, uh, a convert in a stables in Germany. We went in there and we built the model in the stables of the ground that we were about to fight over. The commanders were there, and the commanders would get on the model and describe to Comarch their intent for how they were going to do that fight. The synchronization was there, and we'd war gamed it to death all the way to get to that point in time. And I remember doing that, and I remember there were some real challenges with language, there were some real challenges with understanding. That was the only way to get it right, was to mission rehearse it and war game it beforehand. Uh, I recall being in Afghanistan, and uh, I was chief plans with the IJC as the ARC, and we, um, we did a war game. Uh, it's a really, really good one. It was, we were doing the transition plan, and we bought some tech in, we bought some US and UK techies to, to give us some models, to give us some outputs that are objective. It was a thing called PSOM, it's a brilliant piece of kit. And we campaigned over a week. A, a day was a month. We didn't exercise, it was like, let's visualize what it did. And, and we got bring General Petraeus, General Scaparati would come every evening for a bat brief. And they were horrified by the outcomes of the gaming because the casualty figures were massive. What actually happened in the end? we weren't far off what we'd gamed, sadly and tragically. And our transition plan was deeply, deeply flawed. Look what happened in, in the end, you know? All we, we, because of another story, but you, can, you could see it in the gaming, but nobody was brave enough to accept that that's the case. And, and there's a real cultural issue here. Commanders don't like to be told that's not a very good plan or it's not working. And, you know, and, and that relates to something else which is really important. We don't fail in training, do we? I never went on one NATO exercise where we failed. I've been on exercise in the ARC where they changed the red team so we'd win, even though we were losing. So mission rehearsal and war game is where you can fail in private. Because this is about Stratcom, isn't it? You're not going to show that Trident Junction was a failure and that we got kit all over the place. And, but there is a really important point about being, having it, being safe to fail, and that's really hard in the military. Really, really hard that you can do that because you know that's people's jobs, experiences. But I would contest that's a really important point about planning, not the plan. And then I think final point on this one is having the right toolkit. And if you do this right, you'll see whether the tool is correct or not. And, and, and one of my big planning adages has always been plan the second battle first. Right to left thinking, not left to right. <laughs> you know, I think Azra, Iraq, Afghan, all the other stuff. And, you know, look at the ungoverned space, what's going to happen next. And I wonder if the Israelis are thinking... Second battle first. And there's some great, great debate going on about that right now, isn't there? But so really, really, really important. Um, the, uh, and, and in that, contingency planning is really, really important. It was great to hear a bit of that this morning because you've got a contingency plan and you've got to do it rigorously at every level and find time to do it. So Because then you're on it and you've got some start point. And because uh, where it's failed is when we haven't had a plan and it's the last minute and you're into, in, in, for, in for a hard time. Okay, that leads me to mission rehearsal and war game, which I've already kind of um, covered. <clears throat> what I would like to highlight here, come back to um, Trident Juncture again. We did a war, we did a uh, we did a war, trying to get NATO to do a war game on this was really hard. Uh, live X the war game, Live X the CPX. We did it. We did a rock drill. We took everybody to Naples. And we're halfway through the rock drill, and the Iceland team reps came up to me. And, what about us? Like, what? They weren't on the Joa. They the hadn't gone in the mapping. 
for the live ex, Iceland became absolutely decisive because that's where the US Marine Corps needed to go and fuel. They drank all the beer, by the way, in, in, <laughs> in Iceland. <laughs> all of it. Um, but that was so critical. It was mission critical to, to the defense of Norway. And we, we didn't realize it until we got to the rock drill. A, mi a very minor mapping error made by a geo individual. Well, Iceland aren't in it. Wrong, wrong answer. So, so the, the importance and the lesson that came from, uh, from that. And then th out of that uh, leads ne neatly to uh, the future of that. This is where we're going. Synthetic environments. Uh, this is a, this I've used the tool. I tried to introduce the tool to Naples. Didn't win because it's just too complex. Uh, co a company called Improbable who visualize stuff. And, and uh, they, they were using the COVID pandemic to map to map out how you're going to do vaccines, ha map out how it's going to... You could take this to wargaming. Brilliant. I mean, this is, you could sit on your desktop and actually visualize how this is going to happen a different way. And take that to campaigning. Ex our biggest drama, and I've just listened to the superb brief by the Archie 2 there. Our biggest challenge is we exercise 24-7 battle rhythm for three or four days or a week, two weeks. Nah. That brings you to the close fight all the time, doesn't it? We should be campaigning and plan. You need to fight the whole plan all the way through and adapt it as you see it. And we, and we don't, um, despite all the efforts. And then the that's lesson number four. And then my last lesson, with literally five minutes to go, and we've heard it. And I remember getting in trouble. I was a staff college instructor at the staff college. And I used to, I used to describe logistics as loggy stuff. And uh, I had a couple of uh, logistics students in my syndicate who made a complaint <laughs> about me. I didn't pay enough time to logistics. Um, and perhaps because it's, it's lesson number five, I'm probably still not quite getting it. Um, but live uh, Trident Juncture and all the other stuff is so critical in you, if you get it wrong. And I remember one of my last things I did in terms of maneuver, I was, I was a brigade commander and I got selected to command a CJTF, an experimental CJTF exercise in West Africa. And the idea was we would use the striker brigade concept uh, which is a new concept, all wheels, you go in, you land, you disperse the force, all seeing eye, you know, transparent battlefield and all that. You then mass it when you need to strike, and then you disperse it again. Really, really good thinking. It was fast, it was quick. You know, sort of, this is, this is the idea, our idea and thinking. Great. Except for the field hospital was 90 ISO containers. You know? Now, I think there's a big future coming in this, and, I, and this is where I think you really can start thinking in terms of research and development. Um, I was at a brilliant um, Aerospace Innovation Day last week. Battlefield electrification could be huge in terms of dropping off fuel, getting rid of fuel, having batteries. Battery technology is getting better, better all the time. Uh, <coughs> you know, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, data analytics. Data an I saw this tool last week where if you get all the data off the vehicles and you get it into the right place and you analyze it, you won't be servicing your vehicles in time. You'll be serving your vehicles because you need to do so. This is Formula One tech that's used, you know, and it's brilliant. And, and so, so that I think the way ahead is, is this, you know, this, this next revolution in, is going to be the way ahead in terms of making, making, this, uh, making, this, making this work. Okay, um, with literally three and a half minutes to go. In conclusion, some big lessons there, really simple. Uh, I could go on for all day about deeps in all of them, but, but bottom line, get the context right. Really, really, really important. And keep doing it. And, and I, I think what I mean by that is think slow, act quickly. So really think through the problem. I think they call it Pixar planning. Get the commander's intent and interrogate and make commanders do the work uh, and hold their feet to the fire. And once you've got the intent, you're on. You're on it. Off you go. Just deliver. And do all you, all you can. Planning, not the plan. Don't even need to sign it. Just, just make it, make it happen. Mission rehearsal is really, really important. The future in terms of uh, the way that looks, war gaming, and then finally logistics. Absolutely, the last piece. Okay, I'll shut up. I'm in time. Just. We have time for Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to introduce our first returning speaker uh, from last year, Professor Antonio Echevarro II. Uh, he's, a uh, he's the General, Mac uh, General Douglas MacArthur's Chair of Research uh, at the U.S. Army War College and the Editor-in-Chief of U.S. Army War, Pre uh, War College Press. 
with a doctorate in modern history from Pr Princeton University and a visiting a research fellow at Oxford University's Changing Character of War program. Professor Echevarra is a scholar practitioner of strategic thinking. Uh, he has authored six seminal books on the subject and holds a rich academic background. And for us Norwegians, we know <laughs> much of that written work uh, from, uh, from the academy. You can find his work at the NDCU curriculum in several courses. Today, Professor Echevarra will address the pressing issue, achieving integrated deterrence through integrated defense, implications for land component commanders and below. This presentation explores how the US and NATO uh, can enhance deterrence through comprehensive defense, uh, defense concepts and real-time intelligence. Please join me in welco welcoming Professor Antulio Echevarra. Real honor to be here uh, once again. Um, totally my pleasure. Uh, also, it's great to see the general again. Uh, he was a star in one of, my one of my seminars back in the day. One of the few people to ever actually understand Clausewitz on the first try. <laughs> okay, uh, my agenda is a bit ambitious for 30 minutes. I will skip some of these parts. Um, but I do need to say that this, uh, in my obligatory disclaimer, um, these are my views, not the U.S. government in any way, uh, and so on. So you can blame me and not uh, Uncle Sam for what you're about to hear. All right. So a quick definition of deterrence. Um, lots of definitions out there, tons and tons of literature on deterrence. Deterrence has essentially been a uh, strategic preoccupation for the West for a for decades, really, um, ever since the Cold War, especially when they were thinking about the terms, really took a, went into high gear. So I define it more simply as measures taken to dissuade an actor from taking an undesirable action. Okay, that applies not only to foes but also to friends. Sometimes you want to deter someone from taking an action. You don't want to harm them necessarily. It, Example of Eisenhower and French and British and the uh, Suez crisis back in 1956 and so on. So times you, know, you need to exert some deterrent pressure to get uh, uh, your objectives met or to not lose ground vis-a-vis uh, -vis your objectives. There are two types, uh, two uh, natures for deterrence. So one's very active, active steps that you take that can be provocative and then are essentially opening a door to war to violent conflict. More passive deterrence measures, building a moat around your castle, making sure your walls are high, those sorts of passive things are not necessarily going to lead to conflict. So, but it's important to know that you are, if you're making certain choices about deterrence, some are gonna be riskier than others. That's not always obvious to people making decisions and so on, but yeah. Four types, general deterrence, that's like uh, having a speed limit, general deterrence, according to the literature, almost never works. You have a speed limit out there and a little sign that says, anyone caught speeding will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Doesn't seem to deter many people to use, you know. So uh, if it can't be enforced, as we discussed last night, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to deter anyone from doing anything specific. So specific actions do not shoplift and you've got cameras and so on uh, preventing that. Direct your trying to deter an attack against yourself. Extended, that's the world we are in now. You're trying to deter an attack against a friend or ally. Uh, Ukraine conflict is an extended deterrent situation. And uh, in fact, we are in a proxy war situation vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine uh, and have been since February of 2022. So that complicates things in ways that I hope will become clear uh, as we get further along here. So. Two basic methods by punishment. So you're going to try to persuade your uh, actor, rival, what have you, that you're going to be able to hammer more and more cots on them, to keep them from taking a certain action to the point that that action may not be worth it anymore to them. Um, an example of that is broken nest. I'm not sure how many are you are you uh, familiar with that particular term, but. Uh, since Taiwan produces something like 
70 to 80 percent of the semiconductors and since those are valuable especially to china trying to buy something like 90 percent of its semiconductors from taiwan so one theory is if the chinese were in fact to try to cross the strait invade taiwan taiwan ought to destroy all its factories that produce semiconductors thereby creating kind of a broken nest phenomenon and imposing such costs on china that oh they would regret having taken that uh, action. Uh, theories about that, pro and con, big debate. Um, but we'll move on to the next one, denial. So convincing that uh, someone ought not to attack you or uh, some sort of aggressive action because your defense is so strong that they're not going to be able to prevail. Porcupine strategy is a metaphor used for that. So uh, making Taiwan or Ukraine uh, bristling with weapons like a porcupine to the point that an attack would just not succeed. Um, downside to that, though, is if given enough time, an adversary will come up with a plan. Plans do matter sometimes. Will come up with a plan that he thinks is better than your defense, and then he will attack if he really has the will to do so. Um, so a downside to the cost and benefit is that not every adversary thinks in those terms. They don't think about uh, costs and benefits in the same way we do, and you know, the same value system and so on. So, uh, so that can be also risky uh, as an approach. Uh, I looked at the literature from, yeah, Cold War 1950-ish all the way up to the present day, uh, tons and tons of it um, in small font like size nine font, it would take still 10 pages uh, listing. But I went through the major highlights and pulled out the big trends for you so that save you some time. Um, so we went from the Cold War, big rival powers, um, violent state actors, um, and trying to deter really nuclear Armageddon. Um, trying to deter conventionally as well, but that received a lot less attention than nuclear weapons did, uh, for obvious reasons in some ways. Then as we moved into the 1990s, we shifted, Cold War ended, we started looking at more and more violent non-state actors and our assumptions uh, about, and the assumptions are important here because our assumptions about those violent state actors, yeah, they could do harm, they could hurt, and, but they couldn't really collapse a modern state uh, and you had, as a modern state, all kinds of uh, weapons of national power available to you. To, so there was something of a, what we might call a Jupiter complex, where we as a major power, superpower, looked at trying to deter these smaller actors as if we had um, unlimited resources and, and they did not. They had advantages, of course, and it's hard to eliminate groups like uh, you know, terrorist groups and so forth. Um, we've seen that in recent history. All of these approaches, though, do need capability and credibility. The Terrence, there's an old canard that says it's really in the mind of your target, right? Your actor, the person you're trying to dissuade. Uh, I think that is mostly true, but I think there is a military problem I should hope to identify here that if we focus more on it moving forward, I think that our ability to get our messages into the mind of our adversary foe target, what have you, um, will improve. Deterrence, ultimately, you have to be braced and ready for it to fail. Um, but that's in some way, being prepared to defend is also uh, a good way to deter. I will skip through these, uh, there are 10 of these problem areas. Um, we can go back during Q&A uh, if there's time, but I'll just give you a quick second or two to look at the slides and everything, but some of the uh, bullets may be obvious to you all, but yeah, okay, so let me get to why did deterrence fail on February 24th, 2022? Um, so the big question uh, that I've been asked to research, uh, part of my time at Oxford was to look into this, uh, create a part of a research team to look at the Russia-Ukraine war and gain some lessons out of that. Deterrence-wise, those lessons, I was told, if at all possible, should be able to apply 
to the Indo-PACOM region of concern, so on, so for obvious reasons, right? And that's uh, tall order, but there are some things um, that do work. Seven answers as to why uh, the turns fail. First one, miscalculation. This is kind of a general answer. Everybody has pulled this off the internet for the most part. Lots of think tanks are putting it out there. Um, but overconfidence, uh, bias on the part of the Russians and Putin himself. Um, even though NATO had discovered a large part of the Russian plan and had told this to the Kremlin, um, if you remember, we were one step ahead in this case. A lot of times intelligence is not really very good, but in this case it was really, really good, very exquisite. Um, and so we warned of false flag attacks and all those things before they happened and so on, and yet the Russians still came, right? Um, so that's number one. Uh, the fear and time factor. So Richard Ned LeBeau uh, has advanced this as a theory to, to counter the opportunity window theory that poli sci uh, scholars were uh, pursuing for the longest time, which is that theory, according to that theory, is you know, your adversary will attack if there's a window of opportunity and they think they can grab a piece of territory or whatever before you have a, a chance to react and you won't have to pay too high a price and so forth. But the um, other one that Ned LeBeau um, advanced was that, no, um, there's something like 1914, Germany, World War I, whereas the situation is tilting further and further away from Germany's advantage. And if it waits, um, it'll get even worse. Time is not in its favor. So it has to act now because if it waits, it will be, you know, uh, and in that situation, um, you end up uh, provoking your adversary into the very action that you didn't want to happen in the first place, right? By becoming a little too strong, a little too credible, your ability to use force, and so on. So, uh, number three, three, lack of will, and the fact that the Russians do have a force, they were able to deter some NATO leaders from taking military action, uh, and so on too soon. Lots of other factors embedded in that reason, um, like what are we actually fighting for vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and so on. And so um, Lawrence Friedman um, was one of the first ones I, I talked about on this issue. He said, well, sanctions were the go-to method for the West and the White House, and they have not worked. They're not really a serious threat. The Russians have, in some ways, were used to them. They took measures to insulate their economy um, from sanctions and so forth. So they didn't have much of an effect. They expected sanctions, and so they attacked anyway. Um, and we took military force off the table. But one of the problems with uh, that argument is the security dilemma part of uh, deterrence. The, so um, as I said, active deterrence measures put you on the path to potential war. So you start climbing up the escalation ladder with your adversary when you start putting, you start taking active deterrence measures, putting military force on the table, making threats and so forth. At that time, remember, most military analysts thought the Russian army was better than it turned out to be. And so it was, you know, rational calculations, rational actor model, all those things said, you know, um, maybe we would be wiser not to do this. You know, in hindsight, look at what the Russian army really turned out to be, Russian military in general, uh, is not all that good. Um, there's a lot of it, it keeps coming, you know, uh, but that's in a way a historical part of the Russian way of war as well. They absorb massive casualties, come back at you next month or whatever, uh, and don't seem to end. So, um, number four, you know, NATO was just not focused on a larger scheme that the Russians were pursuing that they intended to push into Black Sea, uh, ultimately into Mediterranean, gain influence there in one way or another, maybe more naval presence there, but access to warmer ports and so forth and to all of that. So we didn't deter the right thing, quoted Andrew Moynihan, a friend of mine, uh, a great Russia scholar. And inconsistency, uh, inconsistency Patina Rentz, another friend of mine, a uh, great Russia scholar as well, we just were not consistent in the message we kept sending to Russia, you know, so 
2014, Crimea is seized, and what happens, some, some protests and everything, but uh, not a lot of strong messaging coming uh, from the West. U.S. passivity, so Walter Russell Mead says, the more the U.S. tries to lead from behind, to let others step up and more, do more of the share of security and so forth, the more the U.S. loses its ability to deter uh, and the more it draws red lines and then erases them and so on, the same kind of phenomenon. And finally, the special case scenario where the Russians were, they just see Ukraine differently historically than we do. And they see it as part of uh, a really long history, history that you know maybe have been written by Russian historians for the most part, whatever. But that they're in some ways entitled to that land and territory in ways that we don't understand when a nation becomes independent and so forth and that we uh, do not want to recognize their uh, cultural claims on it and so forth. So lots of uh, explanations. There's an eighth one missing, and I'll try to talk about it in a second. This slide just sums up uh, what I've been uh, discussing here. I'll quickly move on, but I'll just give you a second or two to, to glance over it. A lot of it has to do with the credibility deficit, um, not having the will to back up things. But on the other hand, there are some capability problems as well. Um, NATO, I am not entirely convinced, was really ready for war in any case back in 2022. Um, the fact that it takes uh, months to get a leopard tank out of mothballs to be able to send to, and there was some political uh, reasons that there was a delay, but a lot of, uh, a lot of, not all, but a lot of NATO, I think, was uh, just more complacent and did not see uh, the threat to the East quite the way it does now. Um, so we have a tendency to default to deterrence by punishment uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, usually we are out of position. Despite U.S. and its pre-stocks and everything, the U.S. cannot be everywhere. So the first three or four days of an attack goes advantage to the, uh, to the aggressor in many cases. Um, and that's the same in the Taiwan scenarios and so forth, but it was the same essentially here too. We just didn't have forces in place to really deter effectively. Uh, so this is part of the military problem, the dual challenge that I feel like we have to be able to solve this in order to get the message into the head of our target, our adversary, whatever, persuade them uh, that we mean business. So we can't solve that. We need to solve it. The position gap. We also have the temporal gap. I mean, really, really good about the stuff in the middle because the maneuverist approach to war and our troops are better trained. It's got better kit, better doctrine, more, you know, highly motiv motivated and so on. So in a stand-up fight like this, we are pretty good and we're probably better than, you know, it's about any other kind of force that might be out there. But when the war drags on, there are lots of things that begin to bend the situation um, not to our liking, against us, essentially. Part of it is a political cycle. So every four to eight years, there's a potential 180 degree change in foreign policy direction. When, if another administration is elected and they run on a campaign platform that says that they um, you're going to get out of the war. This is the Vietnam thing, right? So Vietnam, for example, was a democratic problem all the way up to the election of 1968, and Republicans were con continuously criticizing the Democrats for the handling of the war. In 1968, the Republicans get elected, and it becomes their problem, and the Democrats are on them and criticizing them for the direction of the war and so forth. And this, uh, you can see, um, Afghanistan, Iraq, same type of dynamics uh, playing over and over again. And the, the parties will not shy away from using a conflict as a political football. Uh, again, this is all my, this is not the U.S. government speaking right now, it's just me. So all the tomatoes and everything else that might be, you know. Uh, it's, it, so essentially, that is one of the reasons that the protracted war, even though we have uh, other things in our favor, the protracted war is not necessarily a good thing. And once the political infighting starts and it heats up, intensifies, then the public will starts to sag as well. It follows that trail because it assumes that our political leadership knows 
more about the situation than the general public does. And so it will become confused and frustrated and over the divisions, and ultimately it will side with getting out of the war. If we can't accomplish anything constructive and there's no point in being in it, then let's pull out. So, um, so we have to somehow solve that. We can solve the production capacity, material aspect of it. Our defense industrial base was not ready for a major war. We discovered that. We're working and we're doing things. We're putting band-aids on the problem right now in the hope that this will lead to a larger and better solution down the road. But the stockpiles were not adequate, um, not especially if you're going to try to maintain deterrence more globally than just in the vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine, Eastern Europe, and so on. So we can fix that part of it, but we will never be able to fix, unless you take democracy entirely out of the picture, we'll never be able to fix the political cycles that take place and the fact that for eight, 12 years or so, there could be a radical change and the U.S. is not going to be there for someone whom we promised we would be there uh, in the beginning. So we have to close those gaps in some way if we want the terrorists to work. One solution, the, uh, I'm going to move more quickly because I think I'm the feeling that I'm running out of time here. But um, So the total defense concept that I've heard uh, being discussed here, mentioned by uh, lots of folks, virtually every eastern uh, border, NATO state, bordering Russia, so it has some form of uh, total defense concept. Um, the Ukrainians had theirs, and they pulled it together kind of last minute, um, and they didn't fund it very well. Uh, they rolled the uh, territorial defense forces, which had assumed control over all the volunteer battalions and some National Guard units and all those things under one command, and they put that command under the UAF, uh, Ukrainian Armed Forces, and so on. But there was not really time to train because they, they did that back in 1 January, um, and the attacks happened, what, six weeks later, seven weeks later. Um, it wasn't really time to train. Funding streams weren't there. Command and control wasn't totally worked out. Uh, leadership uh, deficits, though there were some veterans who stepped up and took charge of some of these battalions and so forth. Um, but there were people who had kit in their basements um, left over from 2014 and before and who got that kit on and formed local battalions and so forth. And, um, and they did, in some ways, just enough to slow down the Russian advance. The Russians made some mistakes, too, I think, by not waiting their attack heavily enough, especially on, via Kyiv um, and taking Kyiv. Um, air, ground, assault, and so on, had they put more emphasis on that, um, uh, it might have been a different outcome. Um, so, and they were surprised by Ukrainian resistance, they didn't expect that, so their intel was off and so on. So they made enough mistakes as well for it not to happen. But uh, the territorial defense concept, the total defense concept, I think is one that can work to slow down the fait accompli, stymie it perhaps enough for the proverbial cavalry to arrive and so on. Whether it's Taiwan or somewhere else or other parts of eastern, uh, I'll call the eastern flank of NATO. Um, and so on. Now, because the bigger questions I have, let's see if I can move on. Yeah, the bigger questions I have are, yes, on paper, everyone's got this total defense concept. But to what extent is it being funded and trained? And what are the standards to which it is being trained? Are they NATO uh, standards across the board in some way? Are these, uh, you know, mixture of volunteer battalions and TDF forces and whatever, are they interoperable? Are they working together side by side like the regular forces are uh, and doing great training exercises and so on? Because we know that this assault was, at the Russians' launch, was part hybrid and part conventional, mostly conventional. But by part hybrid, I mean that they already had um, infiltrated into Ukrainian bureaucracy and local government officials and so forth, those individuals who were going to turn once the Russians penetrated for far enough into Ukraine and they were going to turn to the other side and so on. So they already had done the uh, subversion and espionage part of it. it. Turned out to be not as effective as they had hoped, obviously, so in this case they could have done more planning because that plan 
uh, wasn't ready, it didn't suffice. But um, so that was a, the hybrid part. And I would bet that if the Russians come back at this again, no matter how this particular phase of the Russia Ukraine struggle kind of ends, um, and the Russians come back at this uh, problem again in their eyes in five, six, ten years, they will not make the same mistakes that they made this time. Hopefully, they'll make other mistakes. They probably will because you know the corruption, and everything else. They are they have a ability to learn, but it's going to top off at some point. They're not going to learn enough because their higher-ranking uh, leaders and so forth are influenced and uh, motivated by other things than Western folks are. So, um, so that is part of let's see the question. So, uh, remember those numbers: hundred thousand and eight hundred thousand. I'm going to get on to the next slide. Uh, next couple slides, actually, because when we get to command and control, if there's an influx of those kinds of numbers, uh, if someone in Norway were to be attacked and you've got a loss of volunteers and so on, and then do you have the command uh, apparatus in place to absorb uh, some of those folks and get them into action right away and so on? Um, maybe you do. I just don't know yet. Uh, part of the next phase of my research is to look at how ready everyone is. Uh, and readier more now because they've got the serious threat, whereas before, people who were talking up the threat, I think, were looked at as more, uh, not quite scaremongers, but they were, um, they were not considered necessarily as credible as they are t today because it all happened. So, so the big question, obviously, we have to resolve the alliance issue. Uh, is Ukraine going, and lots of theories and proposals out there, is Ukraine going to be brought in or not, in one way or the other? Um, because that will affect the defense architecture that gets in, put in place um, along the eastern flank. And uh, is Ukraine going to be part of it or not? Will Ukraine create its own sub-NATO alliance, um, which is one of the things I would be thinking about seriously um, if I were a Ukrainian uh, high-level official. In fact, I did ask the uh, Ukrainian ambassador to the United Kingdom um, that very question. He said it's been talked about, but they, they're uh, going in position they want to be part of NATO, so they are not tr doing anything to distract from that goal. They want to be a part of it. So there are ways to me fast-track Ukraine in and let the Russians hold Crimea for a while and then maybe try to take Crimea back. Like, you know, there are we could talk about all of those, you know, and use up the rest of the conference probably, and it's not. But really, NATO is, there's a strategic cacophony argument out there, which is Western NATO states are more focused on non-state actors, counterterrorism, and those sorts of things, whereas Eastern NATO folks are more interested in deterring and dealing with Russia. And so maybe at some point we will come to um, a point in history where where there's a separation, a schism between NATO West and NATO East. And as long as the U.S. is in both of them, I'm not sure that's necessarily bad. As long as the U.S. is there and both sides are able to focus on the major threat facing them, um, this could actually be one thing that helps voting people into NATO move along a little more rapidly and, and what have you, all of that. So that's part of it. Um, one of the keys, as I think I mentioned on the previous slide, is that the intelligence sharing was vital. I mean, uh, everything from targeting and so on uh, was vital, and so we need actual policies put in place on how we're going to proceed moving forward with our allies, other partners, and our proxies. How are we going to, how much are we going to share? The U.S. really, really has a hard time sharing intel, uh, and I think we need to relook that habit of ours. Uh, defense industrial base thing are you? Okay, so this is echelons above reality is what, uh, what I used to call it back in the day when we were in, when I was a line officer. Anything core and above was just, you know, well you have to start somewhere even if it's in an unreal place, right? Um, so what uh, what kinds of things should uh, higher level uh, land component commanders be thinking about uh, that comprehensive framework in which or through which um, these total defense concepts that each nation appears to have can be uh, integrated in some way. It's going to cost money, of course. It's going to cost 
it's, it's going to require um, you know, rigorous strategic assessments about where everybody is and so on. Um, to what extent can some of the Baltic states uh, cooperate, train with um, you know, TDF from Ukraine, for example? Should Ukraine actually become part of NATO at some point or have its own alliance? All of those things. So, uh, so that's part of it. And then we need to look at the readiness question. Is the funding really enough to get readiness to the level you want? And it's never enough, right? So what are the priorities going to be? And how is that going to work? Uh, the authorities. So uh, I think SAGU uh, has come out publicly. Uh, I was part of a team that visited them back in April. And one of the uh, leading officers there talked about uh, lack of authorities to do the kinds of things they were doing, meaning that um, they had authorities to plink bad guys, um, violent non-state actors, you know, uh, leaders of terrorist groups and so forth. Didn't have authorities to be launching um, or helping someone else launch lethal rounds into another country to take out, you know, generals, Russian generals or whatever, uh, destroy units and supply depots and so forth. They have those authorities now, but they were trying to, the officers, you know, were talking to were trying to fight the day fight, the five meter target and so on, but they're also trying at the same time to establish these authorities to get approvals so that all, everything they did was legal. That's been done now, but we need to avoid that in the future. We need to have those things in place already so that we don't have that issue because it had someone started raising a question about um, what we are doing in this legality and so on, um, there would, it would be you know, difficult for people to answer those questions. Um, let's see, what else? Um, yeah, our, our uh, operational doctrine is too focused on us doing the fighting at this stage. We got that, we were, you know, remember that green line, we're really good at all that, but the, um, we need to talk about proxies, we need to help uh, people fight better the way they fight. We tried mission command, didn't really work. It's, uh, we have to remember that U.S., for one example, put mission command in place in the early 80s, 80, 81, and still by the 90s was having problems, and still running through uh, National Training Center, different rotations and so forth, still had commanders not willing to trust and to go mission command-wide. So we can't expect to, to train another entirely you know, different unit, different culture and so on, um, to absorb that overnight and be able to fight that way. It's better for us to um, give them the materials and know how to fight better their way and so forth. Am I out of time? You were standing up, so. <laughs> All right, okay, so I don't wanna keep you for lunch, but I think the rest of it is pretty self-explanatory. There are a couple of things here. I think that the um, TDF style forces, I'll just use that as an easy label, uh, need to be um, thinking about and need to be trained on and so forth, especially down here. We know these things are happening fast um, and they will probably be uh, part of the character of war for the next four or five years anyway. Maybe after that, I wouldn't bet anything on it. But, um, but they also need the law of honor conflict. They were not uh, versed on that at all. They were not behaving ethically and so forth in the beginning. And if you want to maintain Western support and so on, political and material, then you, you know, all your troops include those that are uh, wearing armbands. And um, you know, there was a lot of fratricide um, on the Ukrainians when this happened um, and so forth. For But I'll, I'll just stop there. I think our next uh, presenter uh, is well known for the most of you. Uh, allow me to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Trygve Smith. Uh, the visionary and key organizer of this conference. Lieutenant Colonel Smith had, uh, have had a remarkable career in the Norwegian Army and is currently the project uh, leader at the Land Operations section, section of the Norwegian Military Academy. Uh, with operational experience ranging from armored battalion levels to brigade operations and mentorships at core level, Lieutenant Colonel Smith's experience is both broad and deep. He has served on operational, tor uh, on operational tours in Lebanon and uh, Afghanistan and has contributed significantly to the training and development of armored crews and units. Lieutenant Colonel Smith holds a master's degree from the Norwegian Staff College 
uh, with a specialization in intelligence and master's degree in business, <laughs> with specialization in intelligence and a master's degree from um, business. Uh, sorry, master's degree in business administration from the Norwegian School of Economics. Uh, in this third edition of the conference, he steps up and not only organized and host, but he also contribute as a speaker based on his own research. Today he will share his insights on the topic land operations on the North Kalut, re uh, the requirement of, uh, for a de dedicated core command. Lieutenant Colonel Smith, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, <coughs> sorry. I need to start with a disclaimer. This is, of course, only my uh, ideas and thoughts and my conclusions. So this is not uh, the official line in Norway. <coughs> the North Kalot is um, the area of uh, Norway, Sweden, and Finland, which is above the so, uh, polar circle. I use the term North Kalot figuratively because the natural uh, military southern bo uh, boundary would be down to the northern end of the Baltic Sea, the Bottenviken, which is just south of the polar circle. An important assumption for my assessments in this presentation is that Sweden will join NATO. Dr. Watling and General McFarland concludes in their 2021 study on the future of the NATO Corps that the core echelon is likely to be the keystone in future operations between the operational and tactical level of war. This is because tactically relevant effects can now be applied throughout the operational depth of a force and because multi-domain uh, multi operations require a level of command that would cognitively overload or dangerous, dangerously bloat divisional headquarters. With the war in Ukraine, it is even more clear that the core echelon is necessary. Ukraine did not have this echelon before the war, but has now stepped up several core commands. I will come back to the required core capabilities later. A little bit uh, of a terrain orientation, which is uh, essential for this uh, presentation. I'd like you to uh, to mark the North Atlantic, the Geuk and Svalbard, the Norwegian Sea, Troms and Finnmark, and Nordland counties, which are the two um, <coughs> northernmost uh, counties in, in uh, Norway. The Lapland region of Finland, the Norrbotten county of Sweden, and Bottenviken. Also, Hammerfest and also some rail infrastructure and harbors in uh, Norway and Sweden. I'll come back to road infrastructure later. Europe is on fire and the pyromaniac is on the loose. Russia expanded its brutal war of ag aggression against Ukraine with a full invasion last year and have destroyed many of Ukraine's cities, damaged most of its uh, critical infrastructure, and killed tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers and civilians. Russia shows no second thoughts about sacrificing hundreds of thousands of its own soldiers in this war to exterminate Ukraine and annex its territory and population. Although both the Russian Air Force and its Navy has taken losses, it is primarily its army which has sustained substantial losses in both men and material. However, Russia has displayed an ability to learn from its losses and adapt their tactics on the battlefield, which also has inflicted severe losses to the U Ukrainian forces. After the war in Ukraine, either is won or it goes into a period of less intensity, as we saw in the Donbass towards the last part of the period 2014-2022, it is assessed that Russia will be able to rebuild its military capabilities within five years. However, there are dark skies on the horizon in Asia and in the Middle East. Simultaneously with a major war in Ukraine, which already has meant substantial consequences for the rest of Europe, both regarding security policy and economical, 
The conflict between Hamas and Israel has been stepped up into a war, as well as there are dark clouds on the horizon in Asia. China is challenging the position of the United States, not only in Asia, but also on a global scale. And China will uh, uh, soon be just as strong economically and militarily. China's economy is about 10 times bigger than Russia's, and its defense budget was about five times bigger until the latest adjustment in, in Russia due to the war with Ukraine. It cannot be ruled out that USA gives up stemming China's increase, increasing influence and advance, however. Advance. However, it is most probable that USA will continue to prioritize its military capabilities towards the Pacific and to balance China. China's political leadership has ex expressed that they consider Taiwan as a part of China and that their intention is to conquer or reunite Taiwan with China. This is stated in their five-year plan established a year ago. We should be very careful with brushing this off as pure rhetoric meant for domestic consumption in a totalitarian regime because this backfired uh, see, uh, grievously when we look back at Putin's uh, statements about Ukraine some years, uh, some years back. CIA's uh, director has also said that the risk of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is increasing. The requirement for an increased Nordic defense capability. It is not likely that Russia will challenge NATO in an open war today. However, the risk is increasing that the USA will have tied down a large part of its military capability in the Pacific, Asia, and possibly also some of it in the Middle East. If the US wants to remain a global power, it cannot avoid being engaged in the Middle East, says Jonathan Cohen, a former US ambassador to Egypt. Together, this implies that it is the European NATO nations which have to deter Russia and ward off war in Europe. Much suggests that Putin and the closest group around him which stood behind the decision to make a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, had a biased basis for that decision delivered by the FSB. It is very unlikely that they under, um, it is very likely that they underestimated Ukraine's capability and will to fight, overestimated their own, but also brushed aside anyone who opined that these assessments were faulty. With a fascist regime which almost exclusively builds its world picture and understanding of the situation both inside and outside of its borders on highly regulated information channels, which is unlikely to challenge the wanted world picture, it's much more likely that such errors of judgment which led to the invasion of Ukraine will be repeated than not. This is what we must base our plans on when we plan for the strengthening of the Nordic military capability. We should prepare ourselves to do most of the job of deterrence, preparing to secure and defend our own ter territories, while we also prepare ourselves to support our allies to the south of the Baltic Sea. The Nordic countries' security priorities and their land forces on the North Kalot. All of the Nordic countries can be reached by conventionally armed missiles and air forces from Russia. It is also clear that all of us have uh, concerns about the security of critical infrastructure offshore and on the ocean floor. However, with the limitations of this presentation, I must focus on the security priorities which relates to the deployment and utilization of the land forces. Denmark lies behind the bulwark of other NATO nations uh, land forces and has chosen to focus their efforts to strengthen the defense of the Baltic states, both through their deployment of ground forces and by strengthening the command function through the multinational division north. Finland has a long border towards Russia and natura naturally has a primary focus to defend their strategic center of gravity, which is around Helsinki. Sweden has the strategically important island of Gotland and their southern coastline, including Stockholm, exposed to potential Russian incursions as a natural priority to, def to defend. However, Finland will naturally defend all its territory 
and have forces posed within the North Galat to defend Northern Finland. So does Sweden, which also has forces posed uh, within the North Galat to defend Northern Sweden if need be. These forces, composed of regular army units and territorial units, are in both nations, making up substantially more than a brigade, which for the command warfighting function requires the equivalent to a division command capability to control. The focus for Norway's land forces logically lies to the north due to our border with Russia, our proximity to the bases of the Russian Northern Fleet, and the importance of the coast of Finnmark, Troms and Nordland counties for uh, NATO's operations in the Greenland, Iceland, United Kingdom gap, and in the Norwegian Sea and up towards Svalbard. These would primarily be naval operations, but the land operations would be important both for anchoring the naval operations and securing naval bases. Not least, land operations are important for denying Russia positions around the extreme north of Norway, denying Russian deployment of coastal defense and air defense missile units to achieve anti-access air denial a further 250 kilometers to the west and north as part of their best end defense. The submarine fleet operating out of the bases in and around Murmansk are important for Russia's uh, nuclear uh, retaliation capability and deployment of new NATO strike capabilities in the region should be carefully considered to balance the deterrent effect through the potential effects of such systems against the Russian bases, with the potential effect of escalatory tension in the region due to the th threats such systems could be towards those bases. The Norwegian Land Forces in the two northernmost counties holds the numerical equivalent of three brigades, although there is only one army brigade among them. The territorial forces, the Norwegian Home Guard, are security forces with limited combined arms capability and combat power. However, Finnmark Land Defense, uh, FLF, consists of both regular army units and territorial units. The number of forces and the extensive, um, uh, yeah, the number of forces, the, um, and the ex extensive area they would cover requires the equivalent to a division command capability to control them. And thus we see that there in, in this region there is an equivalent of three divisional commands. To sum this up, although the Nordic countries except Norway would prioritize units to defend the region south of the North Kalot, this area is still very important for NATO. The land forces in this area consist of divisions uh, of division-sized forces in all three countries, and they require a core command to lead and coordinate them. It would not work to have one of the division commands to also take on a double role as a core command. The span of command, the amount of work, and the complexity of the task would be insurmountable. However, we also have to acknowledge that the competency to run core operations has to be developed. Therefore, doing two jobs at the same time as you have to build competencies for a new level of command is just not realistic. You may now tell me uh, that I have forgotten about the existing 10 NATO corps, which could deploy to take up this role. I have not. There are, however, several reasons why I would argue that any core command which is given the responsibility for the North Kalot has to have the area of operations as a permanent dedicated focus. The area of operations and competence requires uh, requirements for a core command. Uh, my good colleague and friend from Sweden, Colonel Carlson, who will speak tomorrow, will go more into detail about terrain, climate, and the infrastructure on the North Kalot. But I need to cover the main points. In Norway, the terrain in Troms and Firma County is generally characterized uh, by steep mountains running down into the sea or with narrow valleys with steep sides. In the eastern parts of the county, there are some large mountain plateaus characterized by rocks and boulders in different sizes with marshes and lakes. Roads are very few and often twisting in and out of deep fjords. Maneuver is very challenging and slow. Several places are even, hard, uh, are even hard to pass, even for agile, all-terrain vehicles. 
some areas impossible and even for these. With snow conditions, some of the rock formations are easier to pass for tracked vehicles, but then again, deep snow makes vehicles consume 50 to, 10, uh, 50 to 100% more fuel, and you need large tracked logistic vehicles for supply. I would like to highlight that uh, in this area, the, the roads depicted, they're not only the main roads, but in some places, the only roads. So comparable or compared with uh, the rest of Europe and the, and the USA, there are almost no infrastructure here. Uh, in these uh, uh, counties, there are only a couple of places where there are trees tall enough to hide and main, uh, any main equipment such as artillery and tanks. In many places, the, uh, the vegetation is this tall. It's hard to deploy more than a platoon of armored fighting vehicles abreast, and the terrain is many places like a huge defile. Finding places for obstacles for delaying or blocking an enemy is easy, but it's hard to find cover from UAVs, aircraft, and satellites. Ground-based air defense is therefore extremely important in this terrain, both to counter enemy reconnaissance and attacks through the air. Needless to say, Missile defense is also important. The terrain in Sweden and Finland is generally less steep, but has the same plethora of marshes, lakes and rocks, making maneuvers slow. The mountains of Norway shield Sweden and Finland from the hard winds from the Norwegian and Barents seas, so the trees are taller and you will find more pine trees giving more cover. However, there are more options for maneuver than in Norway, although only with great care and good reconnaissance. My aim is not to give you a geography lecture here, but if you have not exercised regularly in, in, in this terrain and don't know it, you are not able to plan operations there. You may then plan an advance abreast with a motorized wheeled brigade up a mountainside and over a mountain plateau, which is just possible for ATVs and snowmobiles. Or you may plan to land a light battalion on a plateau where there are only two narrow tracks leading off, so any casualties, if there is no flying weather, would just die, bleed out. And this can happen for weeks. <coughs> Unfortunately, I have witnessed both of these um, examples. I'm absolutely not trying to ridicule anyone. My point is solely that, the exp that experience in exercising in this terrain and thorough knowledge about it is crucial for any level of command. The higher command uh, level, the more catastrophic and far-reaching is any miscalculation and faulty decision. Infrastructure is sparse on the North Calotte. The impl implication is that there are few roads which can serve as main supply routes but also a few which can serve as auxiliary supply routes. The railroad between Narvik uh, in Norway and uh, Luleå in, um, in Sweden is the northernmost stretch, although there are a couple of stretches north of Bottenviken in Finland as well. There are five roads from Finland entering Troms and Finnmark, but only one from Norland County. <coughs> From Sweden, there is only one which connects with the only road running along the length of Norway towards the border with Russia. The road network in northern Sweden is also sparse, but there are six crossings into Finland. As you see, the single road connecting uh, Troms and Finnmark with the, with the south of Norway is uh, vulnerable. The five roads through Finland would thus be important for defense plans of this county in Norway. It is also worth mentioning that the railway track gorge is the same between Norway and Sweden, but different between Sweden and Finland, because Finland um, chose the Russian uh, many decades ago. Needless to say, the flow of supplies and troops in this theater has to be closely managed uh, but also the priorities for the defended asset list for the ground-based air defense have to be very clear in order to keep the harbors, railheads and MSRs open. 
This is the job for an Army Corps command to coordinate with the Joint Command and the Joint Logistics Support Group. Coordination of uh, rear area security, utilizing territorial forces and police forces uh, for this, is also an important job. A core command with sufficient long-term planning horizon is probably required to ensure consistency in plans across three nations' land forces, with the Joint Command, the JLSG, and with civilian authorities. The task is substantial. Due to the infrastructure and the obvious requirement to secure MSRs also through Finland into Troms and Finnmark, as well as the requirement to coordinate logistics operations in the Norwich area with operations in Sweden and Finland, the suggestion presents itself that the boundary between joint commands should follow close to the polar circle and not follow national boundaries. Air operations and missile defense over the North Kalot defending from threats from the Northern Fleet Operational Strategic Command also clearly pr presents the same logical joint command boundary. The main effort of NATO in this wider region would most likely also be the naval operations countering the Russian Northern Fleet, thus giving the land forces a supporting role. To counter the Russian ground forces in the Northern Fleet Operational Strategic Command, requires a unified land command under a core commander. Combined with challenging terrain, there is also rather challenging climate in the autumn, winter and spring. For land forces to operate on the North Clot, special training is required to cope with the climate in such a way as to be able to conduct military operations. It requires six to 12 months of special education and training to operate in this climate for battalion task groups. To build sufficient experience to command brigades and formations, my assessment is that it takes the, this time plus the same time for each level of command to master the challenges of terrain and climate. For troops not accustomed to the climate, the climate on the North Cloud may be considered wintered winter for almost 8 out of 12 months. Fortunately, we have allies with the specially trained Marines, commando forces and mountain troops able to operate in such a challenging climate in the Arctic. However, except for the mountain troops, these are all aligned to be reconnaissance and surveillance troops, primarily to serve the fire's function. These are, of course, uh, important for a war in this region, but we are still dependent on maneuver forces to hold and possibly retake terrain. We cannot allow a new butcher to uh, happen on our soil, and we may need to liberate a Kherson in the high north. Experience from Ukraine has clearly shown us that it, it is required to have a sufficient volume of land forces, especially maneuver forces, to be able to replace losses and have sufficient resilience over time. If war, if war break out, uh, breaks out, it is fair to assume that there will be no allied maneuver forces available for fighting on the North Kalot. If available, transfer forces will uh, probably take months, and we can also assume that we have been uh, surprised. That is, no, uh, that is to say no warning orders have been given for transfer yet. Thus, for the first year of a war, the Nordic countries should be prepared to fight the ground war or mostly with their own maneuver forces. This has substantial implications for planning. Training level has a direct effect on survivability on the battlefield. Numbers of available weapon systems and personnel, as well as training level and quality of leadership, influence the exchange ratios of casualties. However, quality of training and leadership cannot replace numbers beyond a certain limit, unless one size quality is abysmal. Russian forces may lack the same level of quality in training and leadership as ours, but they have shown an ability to produce quality among parts of their army structure, able to inflict substantial losses on a peer adversary. The enemy ground forces in the Northern Fleet Operational Strategic Command are strongly depleted by the war in Ukraine. The Norwegian Chief of Defense told yesterday that the Russian deployment along the border with Finland and Norway equaled a battalion. However, the normal deployment of Russian forces facing the Nordic forces on the North Glot is three brigades, with an additional option of two air assault regiments trained for operations in this climate. We should plan for a return of this, um, this strength within five, years of the uh, within five years of the cease 
of high intensity operations in Ukraine. Thus, to guarantee that we can deter or block any Russian aggression in this area, the Nordic countries should have the equivalent of five mobile brigades with high readiness and short reaction time capable of fighting a mechanized enemy. Possible Russian strategic and operational objectives could be to push A2 AD further to the west to support their northern fleet in, an, in a deployment of the Bastion defense and or the oil infrastructure at Hammerfest, which would make a nice uh, cash inflow for Russia. An excuse to invade could be to protect the ethnic Russian population immigrated to Troms and Finnmark since 2000, which in some communities in the eastern part of the country makes up 20% of the population. Therefore, the main axis of attack will point uh, all points towards Troms and Finnmark. We cannot count in among the five mobile brigades the current territorial forces in Norway. The Norwegian territorial for forces would require strengthening in all warfighting functions, primarily anti-tank weapons and anti-mobility capability, but also in all other capabilities al as well as training to be counted as, as regular forces. Thus, if you take the mobile forces in Sweden, Finland and Norway, we have the approximate sum of three, so there will be a requirement to step up uh, the Norwegian army, <coughs> at least uh, with uh, what we call a regular army unit, with two brigades. So, finally, army core capabilities. The future core will not simply be a command echelon, but will need to be actively engaged in the deep battle to enable victory in the close by its subordinate divisions. It is likely to be engaged throughout its operational depth and will need a full complement of fires, engineering, sustainment, ISR, intelligence, CBRN, and political components to operate effectively. The core must retain sufficient cognitive ca uh, capacity to maintain awareness of and fight across the multi-domain battle space. It is clear that the core needs uh, a suite of enablers and some key competence among its staff. I will highlight just a few I see critical develop to develop in a possible Nordic core. The war in Ukraine has shown us that electronic warfare is a key activity to both enable own operations and deny the enemy to, do to dominate the electromagnetic spectrum. It is required a high level of competence to deconflict own C4IS and electronic fires, as well as to protect our command function. Electronic warfare is also paramount to enable the utilization of drones, both on the ground and in the air, as well as to deny the enemies the same. The plethora of UAVs, both for reconnaissance and attack in today's operations, which can provide a significant advantage to the side able to dominate the EMS, also underlines the requirement to master electronic warfare. The plethora of attack UAVs combined with a multitude, uh, multitude of cruise and ballistic missiles in the Russian arsenal also clearly shows that a layered uh, ground-based air defense is required in the core area of operations. Long-range strike capabilities seem essential to shape the battlefield. Due to enemy A2 AD capability, the core need to have its own suite of strike assets, not completely relying on the air component to, to deliver it, although joint fires are still important. Also, here is uh, electronic warfare, a precondition to enable our own and confuse the enemy system. We should not forget that it is quite complex to co coordinate the core enablers, both on its own and with subordinate units operations. A core command needs a lot of training to be able to do so. This is also a strong argument to have a dedicated core command for the North Calot, well known with the unique requirements related to the terrain and the special climate there. Thank you. It's an honor to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Kirkland Bateman. 
the chief academic officer at the Expeditionary Warfare School at the Marine Corps, Corps University. I want to emphasize that uh, emphasize Dr. Bateman's contribution to this to this uh, uh, conference uh, that are significant. That this marks his third contribution as a speaker, uh, underscoring his vital role in the academic success of this conference. So thank you very much for that. Dr. B uh, Kirkland Bateman has a distinguished background, having served as an infantry officer um, and a strategist with the um, uh, Joint Staff, Army Staff, and Army Cyber Command. He retired as a colonel back in 2013, uh, after the, uh, 25 years of commission service. Old. Uh, with over 15 years of teaching, curriculum development, and academic leadership, Dr. Bateman's impact on uh, professional military education and joint professional military education uh, programs are at various levels are noteworthy. Dr. Kirkland Bateman continued commitment to this conference and his extensive experience makes him a valuable uh, contributor to our conference uh, this year and also from previous years and hopefully from the years to come. Hopefully, yes. Thank you. Dr. Bateman, right. yeah. the floor Thank is yours. You. <laughs> Well, thank you, Thomas, for that kind introduction. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real honor for me to be here participating in, a, in this important conference. It's my third year, as Thomas said, and um, I think each year has gotten better and better. Um, you know, I have nothing to do with that. It's, it's you all that are making it better and better. So um, wonderful to be here again, and, and I'm excited to share with you today. Um, so before I continue, though I need, need, do need to provide the disclaimer that these are my own views you know, not reflective of the, the U.S. government, uh, Department of Navy, Marine Corps, or Marine Corps University. Um, so uh, when Trigvin and I first discussed what you wanted me to talk about, uh, we settled on the topic that you see in the program, com commanding uh, combined operations at the, at the division level, a view from the U.S. Marine Corps. And from that, I produced this very clunky title um, that you see up there, U.S. Marine Corps Division Operations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but like any good academic or, in my case, procrastinating academic, I was, you know, revising my, my presentation even up until this morning. Um, and so I think I have a, a, a little more elegant title uh, to share with you. Um, and it's really what I want to do is to share a case study of Task Force 61-2, um, a, a model for naval warfighting, which um, that task force has only been in existence for about 18 months. Um, and so what I want to detail uh, as a case study to get after sort of how the Marine Corps um, is commanding and controlling uh, at the division and perhaps the MEF level. All right, so with that, um, this is what I'm going to cover uh, over the maybe the, hopefully no more than about 20 to 25 minutes so that there's time for questions. Um, but I wanted to go through what, what the purpose of what I'm going to try to communicate, um, the problem itself, of why the Marine Corps has, has found itself in a, in a time of change and transformation. And then getting into more detail, what exactly uh, do enabling distributed naval operations in a contested environment look like? Um, how does that translate with um, the division reconnaissance, counter reconnaissance operations and the importance of those? Uh, and then lastly, pulling it all together, hopefully, to, to share with you sort of the case study of Task Force 61-2, and then hopefully have some time for questions, as I said. Okay, so the purpose, um, really, as I said, I want to provide some context for exactly how the Marine Corps Force Design 2030 efforts have progressed, but in a very narrow context, uh, really within the European theater and with what uh, the Second Marine Expeditionary Force has been doing, along with Second Marine Division as, as one of its components. Um, so highlighting those efforts uh, really in, in naval operations, and when I say naval operations, I'm obviously speaking about uh, both the Navy and the Marine Corps. And I, I forgot to apologize up front. I have a hearing disability, and sometimes I don't moderate my voice very well. So if I come across as shouting, somebody wave at me, and, and I'll, like, I'll tone it down. Okay. Uh, the next thing is really um, the third thing I want to do is explore this, this concept of, of uh, reconnaissance and counter-reconnaissance and how uh, we in the Marine Corps envision and are, and are already exper experimenting with what that's going to look like. And then lastly, as I said, kind of putting all that together, detailed Task Force 61, 
to case study um, for how the Marine Corps can support the U.S. European Command and our partners and allies uh, in the region at the division and the MEF level. <clears throat> And for some reason, I slid my notes all the way to the top, or to the bottom, which doesn't help. Okay, so um, the problem then, right? Uh, you know, two decades of um, irregular warfare operations in Iraq and Afghanistan really turned the Marine Corps into a second land army for, for the United States, and one that, that we cannot afford to maintain. Um, and really hearkening back to both... Um, um, OAF, OEF, and, and even Desert Storm, and you see um, these kind of maps where, you know, big divisions and cores, you know, making this sweep across the desert, or, you know, battalions and, and brigade combat teams cycling in and out of uh, Iraq or Afghanistan over and over again for that period, you know, pr produced, as I said, this idea that the Marine Corps was supposed to be the second land army, and then when you couple that with the way that we task organize um, in the Marine Corps, um, the Joint Force and other services have a, have a hard time figuring out what, is it, what it is that we're exactly supposed to do. So we use, thing, we use words like the Marine Expeditionary Unit or the Marine Expeditionary Brigade or the Marine Expeditionary Force, the MAGTAF, you know, the, the Marine Air Ground Task Force. And no one knows what those mean uh, necessarily outside of the Marine Corps. And so they oftentimes will default to sort of what the command structure of that unit is. And so they look at a MEF, oh, three stars, it must be a core. Well, there's a huge difference between what, what the second Marine Expeditionary Force, two MEF, brings to the fight versus like the 18th Airborne Corps or the first, you know, first armor or whatever. It's a massive difference between what that uh, happens in the Marine Corps versus the Army. Um, and then further, as I, I've highlighted some of the, the key documents with, um, you know, the 2018 and 2022 national defense strategies, we have shifted from uh, violent extremism to great power competition, right? That is now the, the main threat for the United States, that uh, competition from peer and near peer rivals, and, and specifically China as the pacing threat, not the only threat, but the, the threat that we are going to pace ourselves against as we look to transform um, and, and uh, create new concepts um, and new types of units. But um, I would argue that much of what we are doing with respect to that for Indo-PACOM against a China pacing threat is very relevant and can be tailored and scaled to what is needed in the European theater against Russia um, as well. So, in light of these changing priorities um, and uh, different directions from higher headquarters, uh, General Berger, the, the 38th Commandant, uh, really set out a bold uh, and ambitious restructuring of the Marine Corps, first with his um, Commandant's Plan and Guidance in the summer of 2019, followed up very shortly by the Force Design 2030 White Paper, and then there have been annual updates uh, to that. Um, and really, uh, as I said, really bold and ambitious restructuring to return the Marine Corps to its naval roots, to, to be expeditionary. Um, you know, we, we, he said, you, if you can't get it to the fight, then what's the use of having that piece of equipment? So we don't have tanks anymore. You know, we're trying to, di we are divested of any tracked vehicle to the greatest extent that we can, because you just can't put those on amphibious shipping. You can't put those in aircraft and get them to where you need them. Um, so really a new era of competition uh, as I said, starting with his, his guidance and then the Force Design 2030. In, in April of 21, the, the first real annual update to Force Design 2030, um, he laid out three key um, activities prioritized for action that needed to be done over the next uh, year. And that's where Task Force 61-2 comes into play. So first was to accelerate experimentation with maritime multi-domain uh, reconnaissance constructs and activities to enhance the ability of the stand-in force uh, to dominate the information environment. Secondly, was to sense and make sense of the situation and win, uh, and then finally win the recon and counter-recon competition. And so really this idea of trying to balance 
um, what is happening in force design, the transformation and experimentation that's necessary, but at the same time, maintaining relevancy for stand-in forces to, to be in competition and to be the crisis response force. And that's really what um, Task Force 612 has been able to illustrate over the last 18 months. And as I have it there at the bottom, you know, the quote from MCDP-1, Warfighting, um, that, you know, war is both timeless and ever-changing, but the nature, the basic nature of war is constant. Um, it's in the means and methods we use you know, evolve continuously, and it's incumbent upon um, all of us in the Marine Corps to understand that and to really internalize that. I was having a conversation with Jonas at lunch about, about this particular publication and about, about maneuver warfare as a, as a philosophy. Um, I remember when I, I first came to Quantico as, a, as an Army major, as a faculty advisor to come into this, to the school where I'm now the dean, and the, the publication was only like two years old. It's 1999. And I remember reading it. It's like, this is heresy. This would never work. Um, and, and you heard uh, Tony Echeverria in his uh, presentation talk about mission command and the struggles that the Army had and with mission command. And I came from that generation. I'm like, this will never work, um, this maneuver warfare thing. How could that possibly happen? But I've, I've seen it. I'm now a true believer um, that it, it does work, but you have to empower your subordinates. And that's really um, what a lot of this is about. So laying out the problem, let's look then at what exactly is uh, or are distributed naval operations in a, in a contested environment. I put up this map um, about how the Arctic transit routes and the projected navigability um, up through 2030 because it really illustrates everything that, that you all know, those of you um, uh, from Norway or other um, Arctic countries, that you know this, the polar ice cap is receding more and more of the Arctic Ocean is navigable, and then of course Russia and and China are moving into this newly exposed maritime domain terrain and trying to take advantage, and they're doing things to compete with that. What we would want to offer uh, from a Marine Corps perspective is that um, in a naval expeditionary environment that's contested. Uh, distributing your forces means that you have persistently forward, partnered, and distributed units that are amphibious and capable of close combat, uh, located throughout the key maritime uh, terrain. So you have to find the terrain that is most uh, suitable for the operation. You can't just plop the division um, or you know a regimental sized unit down on a piece of terrain. You have to distribute it throughout that terrain to make it even more. Uh, powerful. You've got to integrate it with all uh, elements of national power. That's essential, really, to the Marine Corps' uh, future. We focus on the littorals. You've heard um, the general um, this morning and, and other speakers have, have talked about the, the fight in the littorals, and that's, that is where we uh, come into play as a naval force. We, pr we can provide tailored forces to act as a persistent littoral strike force um, as part, again, of that stand-in force uh, to be in contact until the rest of uh, the, ar the Army or other joint force can come in with much more uh, ability and staying power. Uh, and key to the, all of this is creating units, uh, forces that are small, that they're mobile, and that they have the lethality that they need that is either organic or that they can tap into uh, through a variety of C2 nodes very, very quickly. Um, also key to this, you know, we've, we've all seen uh, in Russia, uh, the Russian-Ukraine war, as well as the armenian Azerbaijan uh, conflict, that large concentrations of forces that lack mobility are particularly vulnerable. And so we want to we move away from that. You have to have distribution, you have to be dispersed, and you have to have mobility. And, and just in the last presentation, Trigva talked about how difficult mobility is over land uh, in this kind of terrain. And so we rely then on, sur on some kind of surface uh, connectors, on aerial assets, um, obviously weather dependent, but mobility absolutely key to survival. Um, and, and just as the Marine Corps, just as we're conducting uh, force design activities to address China's competition and threat in the Pacific region, uh, then it's also, we're also transforming to provide tailored forces for the stand in force uh, in the contact layer in the European region. And as I said, particularly, uh, I think in the high north um, 
as the polar ice cap continues to create more navigable maritime terrain. So with that, um, you know, a critical component of this new concept of employment for the Marine Corps is uh, the recon, counter-recon fight. Um, and it's, for this, it is absolutely critical that Naval Joint Force Commanders, that they have the multi-domain. So for us, again, we, we can operate uh, in the maritime domain, we can operate in the land domain, we can operate in the air domain, um, but that those capabilities are available to the Joint Force Naval Commander, and we should be prepared to extend those to our allies and our partners as they need them. So uh, in particular, the, the 2023 annual update to force design, so the one just released uh, in June, details that the Marine Corps requires littoral multi-domain reconnaissance capabilities that our light armored reconnaissance battalions don't, do not currently provide. And so ultimately we're gonna to transition to a mobile reconnaissance battalion construct. What exactly that's going to look like and the timeline uh, is still due to be determined, but there, there have, the basic construct um, is that it'll consist of a maritime reconnaissance company. So some, uh, some kind of company element that, uh, that has the ability to conduct reconnaissance in the maritime domain, a light mobile company, uh, so a company that would have some sort of vehicular uh, asset for a land base, but it would have to be wheeled and it had to be very light, um, something that you could put in the back of an Osprey, uh, as well as onboard ship or other larger platforms. Uh, and then lastly, a light armored company. I think that'll also be, end up being wheeled. Um, all of these will have greater reach and, and lethality than currently the light armored reconnaissance battalions have with the LAV-25, which is pretty outdated platform. Uh, we envision that uh, recon, counter-recon forces will come equipped with littoral mobility capabilities, maritime surface search radars, small unmanned aircraft systems, suites capable of communicating over the horizon and across the joint force and fully capable of conducting maritime multi-domain reconnaissance. Um, one of the things I, I want to uh, highlight, and I'll move on to the next slide, um, is that Marine forces will ultimately implement kill webs, establishing ways to channel and funnel information to the right echelon, to the right decision maker, and to the right shooter. And we're asking NCOs and junior officers uh, to have authorities and make decisions that traditionally were two or three levels above um, what they were normally doing. Things that battalion or brigade commanders um, were traditionally doing in the last fight, we're gonna ask NCOs and junior company grade officers to do. And in order to do that, they have to have education, they have to have the training necessary to do that. Um, one of the photos I wanna to, want to highlight here um, is this young man here. This is Sergeant, Sergeant Caleb Miller. Um, at the time, he's probably 22 years old. Um, this is 2021. Um, no, 2022, and he, you know, he is a section leader in Second Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion, um, and he he actually spearheaded much of sort of the 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 uh, solutions to the recon counter recon um, experimentation that uh, then General Donovan, the Second Marine Division Commander, tasked the Second LAR Battalion to do things of like taking commercial. Uh, communication systems, linking it with a surface radar, all man portable, and then um, securing and digitizing it. He, he was even coding, you know, on kind of the forward edge, uh, doing stuff that was just really, he was passionate about, and his battalion commander gave him the ability uh, to do it, and, and off he went. So great, great story there. All right, so um, time is clicking away, so having detailed uh, sort of um, what the, the problems the Marine Corps faces and why we had to transform the efforts that, that we're undertaking, meeting this, this changing character, um, and then how the Marine Corps is focusing on the recon, counter-recon effort uh, to support the joint force and allies and partners. I have two slides that I want to go through um, to kind of highlight the Task Force 61-2 case study to show how all this kind of comes together. Um, so really, the 61-2 has its roots from Task Force 51-5, which is, you know, the 51 is 5th Fleet, and then the 5 is 5th Marine Expedition Brigade, all in uh, NAVCENT, Naval, Naval Central Command. Um, that is a proven concept um, that provided uh, tailored naval forces across Central Command's AOR for a number of years. 
Um, and in fact, the, the Navy and the Marine Corps used the task force concept um, a lot in World War II. And then kind of post-World War II, we fell away and it, and it really hasn't been used very much since then. But Task Force 612 was established in March of 2022, so just about uh, um, 18 months ago. Um, General Donovan at the time was the second Marine Division commander, and he was the first commander of Task Force 612. It really led the way in experimentation uh, with maritime multi-domain reconnaissance, um, executing operations, uh, command and control of air, surface, anti-submarine, land-based operations, uh, and the execution of those counter-recon missions. Um, it provides the fleet commander with a purpose-built C2 capability, um, you know, designed to respond to crisis response across multiple combat commands, while also uh, representing and advancing the Marine Corps' force design 2030 efforts. So experimenting at the same time as providing forces uh, in the contested area, in competition, and at the same time, having forces ready to respond uh, for crisis response. So really three aspects to it. Uh, and, and over the last uh, year and a half, just to highlight some of the, uh, the things that it's done, some of these pictures are from those activities. Uh, but Task Force 612 is, um, has interoperated, interoperated with an expeditionary sea-based ship in support of African Command operations. Um, interoperated with an Ohio-class guided uh, missile submarine, um, you know, had, had recon marines with, with uh, rubber inflatables, you know, being launched off the, the deck of the submarine on the surface. Uh, an Arleigh Burke-class guided missile destroyer interoperated with that uh, using its fires um, with onshore sensors and communication platforms, so leveraging the, that long-range fire. Numerous military-to-military -mil military training events with several partners and allies, um, like Formidable Shield in Norway, uh, multinational exercise in Iceland um, earlier, and then humanitarian assistance disaster relief operations in, in southeastern Turkey after the earthquake. All of these, as I said, can, uh, you know, occurred in the contact layer in a theater that's focused on that ongoing war with Russia and Ukraine. Um, and it really what I see is that Task Force 62 is this model for, for naval warfighting, experimentation, crisis and competition. Uh, and then lastly, uh, sort of the slide two of the, of the case studies, um, talked a lot about the genesis of 61.2 in the previous slide, uh, but in this relatively short period, 61.2 uh, has led the way in experimentation, really focused on maritime multi-domain uh, reconnaissance. You see a lot of some of the pictures there. Um, there's the Ohio class submarine, uh, Ohio, where um, the, uh, the Marines launched their, uh, their, their, uh, their boats off of, um, executed a variety of operations, uh, command and control of air, surface, anti-submarine, land-based operations, the, the recon, counter-recon. Uh, it's really advancing naval integration of Marine Corps capabilities in Naval Forces Europe and U.S. Sixth Fleet's area of operations. Um, and during the second iteration of the task force, uh, uh, the second Marine Expedition Brigade was was uh, part of the task force, and it uh, commanded the Kearsarge Amphibious Ready Group, um, with the 22nd Marine uh, Expeditionary Unit that was embarked. Um, so, pretty big for a Marine uh, General Officer to command uh, the the ARG. Uh, that was really not really done before, uh, and then ultimately. Um, the forces provide a range of options to support the fleet commander and enable uh, employing larger fleet marines uh, in, the, in the force. Multi-domain sensing forces, as I said, will have littoral mobility capabilities, C2 suites capable of communicating over the, over the horizon, small unmanned aerial systems can tap into a variety of uh, surface long-range fires and aerial fires, uh, and some of that is all, all depicted in there. Um, those are pictures from Operation Archipelago Endeavor of September of last year and then Operation Northern Viking um, of this year. All right, it's been a pleasure. I have a few minutes left, but it's been a pleasure to share with you how the Marine Corps is advancing experimentation efforts uh, within Force Design 2030 while providing tailored forces to support the Joint Force allies and partners. Thanks for your time and, and attention. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you have. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to introduce Lieutenant Colonel uh, Alf Enger from the Norwegian Home Guard staff, where he serves as the G10 development. 
He has served 20 years within concept, concept development and experimentation, notably starting the Norwegian Combat Lab as part of the Norwegian Army Warfare Center back in 2004. He has also served in the Norwegian Defense Researcher Establishment, the Norwegian FFE, uh, and the Norwegian De uh, Defense uh, Procurement Agency. In his presentation, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Enger will address the critical topic of territorial land forces in multi-domain multi operations, uh, the requirement for development. development. Recent experience from the war in Ukraine have highlighted the need for territorial land forces to be pr prepared uh, for a range of roles, including regular infantry, even if they are not uh, originally designed for this purpose. Additionally, they must be ready to participate in operations where, the, uh, where threats emerge across all domains. And Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Enger will shed light on how the Norwegian Home Guard should respond to emerging challenges in all domains. Please join me in welcoming Lieutenant Colonel Enger. Thank you very much. <coughs> Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a timeless truth that uh, any military organization must adapt its identity and direction to changes in its external environment. I will start by giving a short overview of the history of the Home Guard, where it started, where we are going at the moment, and try to give you some thoughts of where we should go in the future. The lecture is uh, structured as uh, shown on the slide. The idea of the Home Guard was born in London during World War II. In many ways, it was primarily to control the numerous armed resistance and stay behind groups by organizing them into one organization. The Norwegian Home Guard was established 6th of December 1946. One year earlier, the Home Guard Council was established. The main civilian organization was given the task to form a council in order to maintain support and a connection between the Home Guard and the people. The council is still viable today and is strongly committed to the Home Guard. Hove Kjentman, the Home Guard local guide, is a well-known and well-established uh, term. This is the log local Mr. Fixit a local asset facilitating and supporting other units doing their tasks in the area. Today, the Army and the Home Guard are complementary parts of the land forces. The Army conducted combat conducting combat operations and the Home Guard conducting territorial operations. I would like to show you a short uh, movie about the Home Guard. What is the Home Heimevernet er overalt, både i by og land. Heimevernet er 40 000 kampklare soldater. Heimevernet er på kort tid klart til innsats over hele landet. Heimevernet er forsvarsvilje og forsvarsevne. Er også mennesker. Naboen din, kjæresten din, kollegaen din. Heimevernet er deg og meg. Sammen skal vi forsvare hele Norge. Yes, what she basically said was that the home guard is everywhere. The home guard is 40,000 combat ready soldiers who will in short time be ready all over the country. The Home Guard represents the will and the capability to defend our country. The personnel is our neighbor, your brother, your sister, your girlfriend and boyfriend. The Home Guard is you and me. Together we will defend the whole of Norway. The present force structure in uh, the Home Guard today is about 40,500 personnel and comprise the Home Guard staff the Home Guard Warfare Center and 11 Home Guard districts 
uh, all of which are situated as depicted on the map from the north to the south. The Home Guard districts can be compared to light infantry regiments with force structures varying from around 2,000 to 5,500 troops. The areas of responsibility of the di different districts vary a lot from quite small uh, to over 5,000, 50,000 square kilometers, from urban terrain to subarctic conditions with three to four inhabitants per square kilometers. The current number of units at the district's level are uh, 12, in total 12 rapid reaction units and 207 home guard companies. The staffs are relatively small. For instance, the Home Guard staff has uh, approximately 80 personnel, and the district staff is approximately 35 personnel. Today, the Home Guard is also conducting basic military training of Ukrainian soldiers in the UK through the British initiative uh, Operation Interflex, and more specialized training in Norway, teaching military skills at uh, snipers, patrol leadership and medic or first aid. So what is the Home Guard soldier? The Home Guard soldier brings the combination of military competence, local knowledge and civilian competence, experience, networks and relations. Based on observations over the last years, extracting from the support to the police health and health services during the pandemic, uh, by the protection of civilian infrastructure and force protections to allied forces visiting Norway and the ongoing support to Ukraine, we believe that a Home Guard is an organization characterized by independent and innovative soldiers, capable of handling unforeseen, unforeseen incidents. They know the resources of the local community and know how to utilize the networks when they are called upon. The area commanders are the core in the organization being the armed forces local representative in the community. They are volunteers hired in a part-time job motivated by their role, which primarily is to take part in the defense of their home territory. How do we do this? The Home Guard conducts territorial operations in order to maintain or reestablish a safe and secure operating environment. They are resolved through building situational awareness, protecting critical assets, combating threats. The ability to do so depends on the close cooperation with other actors in the area, military and civilians. Basically, a comprehensive approach um, to exercising the local territorial res responsibility and conducting territorial operations are the key to the Home Guard structure. Thus, the dimensioning task for the Home Guard include leading and supporting own and uh, assigned forces, protecting and securing prioritized military and civilian infrastructures and objects, force protection of allied reinforcement, protecting and securing main lines of communications, surveillance and control to establish local and regional situational understanding, ability to react to emerging situations th through employment of both rapid and quick reaction units. And last at not but not least, interaction and cooperation with the rest of the total defense system. Through accom accomplishment of these missions, the Home Guard will facilitate for the mobile forces to conduct operations and facilitates for the units supporting the operations through securing necessary freedom of maneuver and security. The interaction and cooperation with the rest of the total defense system takes place in on all levels in the Norwegian society, at municipality, county and state level. It can be illustrated with the trinity and the daily cooperation between the district commander, the regional chief of police and the county governor. This trinity relationship are similar, similar important on the local, regional and central level. The Home Guard districts constitutes the hub between military forces and civilian authorities 
regarding local and regional coordination with the Norwegian, within the Norwegian total defense concept. Regarding contact with um, uh, an interaction between allied forces and local authorities or national forces operating out of their assigned AOR, the local district commander is the one to contact for easy access to the total defense actors. He or she will certainly know whom to contact and which resources and arenas for interaction to utilize. You will find similar structures at all uh, at the local levels in all municipalities. At the top level, you will find the Central Total Defense Forum with the Norwegian Directorate for Civil Protection, DSB, the National Police Directorate, POD, cooperating and coordinating with the National Joint Headquarters. So, what about the future? The society is in constant development. It, it, it is digitized and privatized in order to get effective services and deliveries to the population. In today's modern society, services and social functions are closely intertwined and in dynamic development with frequent and market-driven phasing in of new technology and new services. With a focus on economy, choices may have been made that are unfortunate in terms of security policy. The armed forces is a part of this, or the Norwegian armed forces is a part of this, and has steadily grown more dependent upon civilian society and its services and infrastructure. For example, for ex hospital services, communications, infrastructure and logistics. An uh, adversary will always look to the weakest link to attack. As long as, the no as long as Norway can rely on NATO to support its military in face of an conventional attack, it seems like the weakest link might be the society. Then we need to understand the society and have insights in values and value chains to be able to protect critical infrastructure and critical societal functions together with civilian authorities and organization. So for the future, we need to provide relevant and complementary support to other departments in the armed forces, the police and other civil contingency organization. And also for the future, it will be a central aim for the Home Guard to enable these organizations to better fulfill their missions. So what are our contributions to multi-domain operations? Experience and pictures from the war in Ukraine tells us that the whole, of the whole society in all domain is targeted with the aim to force the Ukrainian state and decision makers to give up. To meet these types of threats, robustness must be built in the whole society. From both the military side and the civilian side, it seems reasonable to have a future organization to function as an integrator. This gives the Norwegian Home Guard the identity for the future. It should be a military organization, as today, to be able to contribute in all parts of the conflict spectrum. It should be an organization that devotes attention to challenges in the gray zones between peace and war. The Home Guard should devote attention to societal security and protection of vital societal functions and critical infrastructure. It should be an organization characterized by independent and innovative soldiers capable of handling unforeseen incidents. They should know the resources of their local communities and know how to utilize the networks in event of crisis or a war. It should also be a distributed organization with a local presence, affiliation and anchoring in the population. This gives the organization a short reaction time and a good situational understanding. We need continuously to develop our capa capability to, uh, to build situational awareness, protection capability, combating capability and our cooperation capability. And this will uh, enhance our capability to conduct territorial operations and exercise territorial, territorial responsibility in the framework of multi-domain operation.
What about capability development? There is a small film down in the right corner. Could you please start the film uh, for us? For the last years, the Home Guard has uh, prioritized concept development and experimentation uh, within information and communication technology to build situational awareness and to uh, change information for coordination in the total defense system. This is done by bring your own device, uh, same type as uh, sim same ID as they use in uh, Ukraine. Uh, and gives us uh, a uh, potential of 40,000 sensors out there uh, all over the country. Um, the result of this experimentation has been very good and they are now a part of the material program procurement program uh, called MIME. The next thing we have to do is to investigate how to increase protection capability and combating capability. Example in these areas are it could be the man pads or it could be anti-tank solutions or organic indirect fires. As my commander used to say, the home guard areas or companies are basically light infantry companies capable of tasks from force protection, securing vital infrastructure and if needed, combating minor enemy forces and breaching the trenches. Solution like uh, the ones shown on the slide will increase the home guard capability to support warfighting at formation level within the existing framework. The Norwegian home guard vision is ready today and for future requirements. We will support warfighting at any level conducting territorial operations with the aim to protect military capabilities, critical infrastructure and the population. Main elements include securing and guarding infrastructure, surveillance and control, facilitating and receiving allied support, host nation support and military civilian cooperation. The Home Guard has the potential to contribute to increased national resilience in that it has local anchoring a distributed structure to provide flexible support and the ability to cooperate with civilian organization. The last slide here shows some uh, pictures from the education and training in the Norwegian Home Guard that the, that the Norwegian Home Guard are doing for uh, the Ukrainian Armed Forces. In conclusion, to the lecture, I would like to quote Major General Mons Haukland, who was the first commander of the Home Guard. He said, in the Home Guard, we do not see problems in all tasks, we see tasks in all problems. And this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, concludes my <coughs> brief. I am uh, pleased to introduce uh, Navy Captain Remy Jakobsen, an accomplished military leader uh, with a distinguished career in the Norwegian Armed Forces. Uh, with a broad background in military logistics, you might see a, uh, a theme here. <laughs> uh, Captain uh, Jakobsen has served in various roles within the Navy and the Joint Perspective. He has held positions at the Defense Joint Services, the Ministry of Defense, uh, the Naval Academy and the Norwegian Defense Logistics Organizations. Notably, ha he has served as a uh, project manager, deputy commander, and is currently the commander of the Norwegian Joint, Logi jo Joint Logistics Support Group. Captain Jacobsen, Jacobsen's educational uh, qualifications include a Master's of Science in Economics and a Master of Management with specialization in Supply Chain Management. He has also success successfully completed the command staff course and a senior executive course from the Norwegian Defense University College. Today, Captain Jakobsen will uh, share his experience 
uh, and expertise in uh, developing the Norwegian Joint Logistics Support Group, Theatre Logistics in the High North. Sir, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, and, and good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as he said. I am the commander of the Norwegian uh, Operation, uh, no, no, the Norwegian uh, Logistic Operation Center, also uh, called as the Norwegian JLSG. Uh, the last few years, I've been so lucky to work with a developing pro uh, project, uh, looking into a, a third NATO JLSG, uh, supporting Joint Force Command Norfolk. And uh, through this uh, presentation, uh, I will talk about the Norwegian uh, Defence Logistics Organisation, about uh, logistics, mostly on the rear area, theatre uh, level logistics. And I will give you an introduction into the NATO JLSG before I talk on the development that we have done uh, on a Norwegian JLSG with close ties to, to Joint Force Command Norfolk. Uh, the recent developments in NATO is of course of importance and the Nordic countries joining has given this work a new dimension, an extra dimension if one could say. Uh, the presentation uh, is my, uh, it's on based on own experience <coughs> experiences and of course uh, from open sources. Um, it is uh, unclassified, uh, that was some of my issues when I was ma making this presentation to, to try and, uh, and get it unclassified. But I hope I have, I will provide you with a good, good picture on, on what we are doing. Uh, the Norwegian Defence uh, Logistic Organisations plays a critical role in supporting the Norwegian Armed Forces, ensuring readiness. Uh, the primary mission is to provide logistics to all branches. This includes procurement, supply, maintenance and transportation. And one very important aspect is integrating civilian logistics into the military uh, supply lines. Logistics isn't just about acquiring and maintaining equipment. Uh, it's also about getting the right resources to the right place at the right, right time. Uh, the Norwegian Defence Logistic Organisation manage the military supply chain, ensuring access to necessary materials and supplies, home and abroad. Two roles are important for the organisation. One, the strategic to resource and enable the Norwegian Armed Forces. And the second one, which I am uh, engage, engaged in, is commanding the operational logistics, movement and sustainment of own forces in Norway. Uh, the NDLO has four divisions. Sourcing and procurement is one. Uh, supply, maintenance, and we have a logistic school center. To be able to lead uh, a national logistics operations center is commanding assets and uh, enablers. It is operating with procedures similar to a NATO JLSG. And the last years we have been building this capability to Joint Force Command Norfolk. Uh, the NDLO is located where the armed forces are. Uh, it has approximately 2,000 employees. Uh, the capacity can be doubled uh, by using reserves. In addition, a capable contractor network and readiness partners can increase our capability several times. Uh, the NDLO is important, as I said, in the integration and utilization of the civilian logistics for military use, for own forces, but also for uh, allies with host nation support we have in place capabilities and a logistic system that is well tested. Uh, then into some theory or parts of it. Uh, Admiral Henry Eccles stated that logistics is the bridge between military operations and the nation's economy. The linkage is best represented in the nation's process, resources and system used to generate material and personate. Personnel. <coughs> this includes production and procurement for forces and serves as a foundation of military logistics. It influences the swiftness uh, with which a country can mobilize and how long a country can endure in a country conflict. Uh, 
there are differences and similarities between civilian and military logistics. Civilian logistics is defined as the part of uh, the supply chain uh, management that plans, implements and controls the efficient, effective forward and reverse flow of storages of goods, services and related information between point of origin to the point of consumption to meet customers' requirements. It is mo mostly profit focused. Military logistics relates to planning and execution of sustainment and movement of forces in <coughs> the execution of military strategy and operation. It discipline that, uh, it's um, the discipline that encompasses resources needed to keep the means of a military process going in order to achieve desired outputs. It's including planning, managing, treating, operating and controlling these resources. NATO concepts, both on the strategic and opera operational level, involves the delivery of logistic support through tailored uh, multinational structures and organizations. Each operational logistic plan must be tailored to the specif specific situation allowing the best methods of logistic support and command and control to be adapted. Sustaining forces over time are challenging. Uh, land forces are personnel and equipment heavy and demand vast amount of material and supplies on a steady basis. <coughs> uh, military land logistics are the backbone of any army. They, uh, this is complex and multifaceted field encompasses uh, the movement of personnel, equipment, supplies and resources. Effective land logistics play a pivotal role in ensuring the success of military campaigns as they directly impact the force mobility, sustainability and readiness. One fundamental aspect of military land logistics is the deployment and redeployment of troops. This involves the strategic movement of soldiers to and from the theater of operations, requiring careful coordination, transportation assets and well-established supply lines. The transport of equipment and supplies is equally critical. Vehicles, weapons, ammunition and provisions must be delivered to the right place at the right time, a task that necessitates sophisticated inventory management and distribution systems. The development of secure and efficient supply chains is es essential to ensure a continuous flow of resources to the front lines. Maintenance and repair of equipment is also integral to land logistics. Armored vehicles, weapons and communication systems require constant upkeep, which demands skills personnel and spare part availability. Maintenance facilities and depots plays a crucial role in keeping the military assets operational. <coughs> Further, uh, land logistics involve coordination with various civilian entities, such as transportation companies, for the movement of military cargo. Military units rely on rail, road and air transportation networks to facilitate their operations and often through the third line theater logistic system through the joint logistic network. Uh, land lo logistics are intricate and indispensable component, component of all operations that enable force to move, supply and sustain on the battlefield. Without efficient ef and effective logistics, the ability to project and maintain power in the land domain would be severely compromised, highlighting the critical role it plays in modern warfare. Um, <coughs> then I will move over to the JLSG. Uh, for those without a lot of joint or multinational experience a NATO, uh, in a NATO environment, the JLSG can seem foreign. Even for those who have experience, the situation is the same. Uh, the JLSG concept has been around since 2005, but it's still new. Uh, the JLSG has only been employed very little in real uh, world scenarios. Uh, one, one important point here to mention it is that the JLSG is very close to the American doctrine on multinational logistic commands. 
<coughs> in most cases, the JLSG supports the component commands by providing services and support to meet requirements through the use of a combination of assigned forces, host nation support and contracts. The main purpose of the JLSG is to enable greater cooperation in logistics across NATO, optimizing the logistic footprint and to reduce the overall expense to NATO and contributing uh, nations. Uh, efficiencies can be gained. While it may not be possible uh, early in the stages of an operation, transition to a NATO JLSG over time uh, certainly improves the logistical situation. Uh, the effectiveness of the JLSG is further enhanced by utilizing several modes of uh, multinational logistics, such as logistic lead nations, uh, logistic role specialist nations, multinational integrated logistic units, or multinational logistic units. While land component uh, commander are responsible for planning, coordinating and executing their own first and second line uh, logistics in the joint operational area, the JLSG is responsible for executing of third line logistic or theater logistics. The JLSG is coordinating and executing uh, reception staging onward movement, RMSD, and, and is important and goes hand in hand with the third line sustainment. It also remain, uh, maintains a recognized logistic picture, coordinates host nation support, contractor support, and support from national support elements. It's optimizing and synchronizing logistics in the theater. It supplements and eases, eases the burdens on the nations and the national logistics, increasing the uh, overall uh, unity of effort and achieves a greater economy of effect, um, effort by using available forces and creating a single logistic command in support of the Joint Task for Force Commander. Overall, the JLSG serves as an important enabler for the alli alliances missions, ensuring NATO forces can deploy, operate and sustain themselves. It highlights the importance of logistics in military operations, underscoring the need for efficient and flexible support structures. <coughs> well, then, uh, Joint Force Command Norfolk and the development of the Norwegian JLSG. Uh, Joint Force Command Norfolk is the NATO command responsible for enhancing the Alliance maritime posture and capabilities in the high north and the North Atlantic. Established in 2018, it operates as one of three uh, force commands in Norfolk. Joint Force Command Norfolk's primary mission is to ensure uh, the security and stability of the high north and the Atlantic, a region of strategic importance due to its uh, role in transatlantic link and the potential for uh, emerging sec security challenges. Uh, the command is headquartered in Norfolk. Its location uh, facilitates and coordinates and collaborates with other NATO commands, partners and maritime organization. Uh, the, the idea of the Norwegian JLSG was, was brought forward in the processes when the JF uh, Joint Force Command was established. This relates to the invasion of Krim and Ukraine in 2014 and the refocus on defense and deterrence in the Euro-Atlantic area in 2016, the NATO command structure adaptation process. Two fo factors were important in this work. First, uh, it was the, the, the importance of the Joint Force Command for, Norf for, for Norway, uh, relations towards the US, NATO and of course UK. The second one was the exercise Trident Juncture in 2018, showing that Norway and the Norwegian Defence Logistics Organisation was a capable logistic organisation. This led to a debate and a decision to establish this JSG capability in the frame of the National Logistics Operations Centre. A project established in 2020 uh, with the aim to bring this capability. We have now uh, built the capabilities over the last three years and are now able to take a role as lead nation establishing a JLSG headquarter in support of Norfolk. Uh, Norway has an aim to provide the commander and a cadre staff, 
<coughs> but as important is the necessity to be augmented by allied partners op operating in the theater. Uh, the aim has been established uh, as a multinational NATO structured JLSG capability that can support uh, Norfolk in the whole of the theater. And the intention is a NATO force structure ambition. We have established the headquarter, it is in place and have a initial capacity. But it's still work that remains and it is still rem uh, dependent on the work um, uh, developing in, in NATO. Since uh, the decision in the Norwegian long-term plan to build this capacity uh, within the NDLO, uh, this has moved forward. During exercises in Norway, like Cold Response 2022 and Joint uh, Viking in 23, experiences has been gained and an initial operation capability has been established. We have done this in a capability um, uh, pro building process, standard NATO dot MPLFI process over four phases. First the study, then the development with a change of organization with testing and evaluating. Several experiences is gained and we are uh, sure that we have the ability to support uh, the Joint Force Command uh, if we are asked. Uh, Norfolk is the most important actor uh, in our network and we have been supporting them with both logistical competence and planners. Uh, in addition, uh, our logistical network in, Navy, in NATO have been engaged and the Na Norwegian <coughs> in initiative have been welcomed. And we are co cooperating closely with other JLSG entities in NATO both with the, 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 the Joint Force Command JLSG, but al also on the Nine, nine Corps uh, uh, JLSG. The work is in progress, uh, both rela uh, related to formalization in NATO and the new development, with Finland as new member and Sweden soon entering the alliance. Our next milestone uh, is the exercise Nordic Response, testing the headquarter further evaluating the units and integrating Nordic personnel into the headquarter in a, in a greater extent. Uh, the development of the joint for uh, JLSG to Norfolk will continue with the Nordic partners. And then I will move on to the Nordic perspective, which, which is very important uh, to us at, uh, currently in the work we are doing. <coughs> Uh, three major shifts had effect on the work uh, with the, the JLSG in support of Norfolk. Firstly, uh, the Joint Force Command and NATO is in change. Uh, Joint Force Command Norfolk is moving from a NATO force structure MOU organization to a NATO command structure organization, just like Joint Force Command uh, Brunsum and Naples, so they are going to be similar. Secondly, Finland has become NATO member and is es expected that Sweden will join the alliance soon. The third element is the ongoing question related to the Joint Force Command and the, the theater they are responsible for, uh, the joint operational area. Uh, Norway have started the JLSG ini initiative, but there are several nations that are relevant when contemplating uh, the establishment of an JLSG in the Atlantic area. Other countries uh, have independent roles like US, UK and France. Uh, several of these are less relevant if one are looking on where a potential opponent, opponent may be. This means that the Nordic countries can be more relevant and placed in an area where defense and deterrence in the Euro-Atlantic area are most likely to occur. From this, one could draw the conclusion that Nordic countries are essential to the discussion of military logistic and JLSG location in the Joint Force Command Norfolk area of responsibility. One JLSG supports one Joint Force Command. Uh, a common understanding in the Nordic countries uh, wish to be is that they wish to be placed under the same Joint Force Command. And it's likely that one should include regional logistical expertise and a command capable of planning and coordinating the execution of theater level multinational logistic support. A, logist uh, a JLSG 
if placed in this area, should have a core <coughs> manning with personnel from the Nordic countries. It should also have zero, day zero connectivity and be capable of coordinating the RSOM sustainment and the RMSD uh, processes. Host nation support and contractor support is also important task. A Nordic GLSG, able of conducting operation in the whole JOA, including the Nordic countries, has the same logic, uh, lo logic as the concept of the Norwegian GLSG. But it takes time for Finland to integrate into NATO and for Sweden to join and integrate. It will also take time for them to be, be able to take active roles. The development of the Norwegian J and JLSG will continue and provide a JLSG capability until a new path is decided, if it is. Exercise Nordic Response is an opportunity to build a common Nordic understanding of what the JLSG is and means. Enablers subordinate to the JLSG will also be considered and explored in a Nordic perspective. <coughs> then, uh, from a logistic perspective and the land domain, uh, the Nordic nations joining NATO will be improving both the national and the NATO ability to move and sustain forces in the region. Uh, before Finland joined uh, and Sweden, en Sweden enters, NATO uh, reinforcements of Norway has been focusing on moving and sustaining forces in the north-south no, south north direction. Norway, as a small country with fjords, mountains, challenging and complex terrain, have only a few and narrow roads and rail systems, and weather uh, affects operations as well. This gives limited options, and it would be relatively easy for an oppon opponent to challenge the small nets and nodes of our joint logistic support network. Now, uh, with new members, uh, Finland and hopefully Sweden soon, this will open up and improve the ability to move reinforcement and sustain forces in the whole region. The network of rail, road, ports and airports will improve, providing a broad set of alternatives and redundancies. In addition, it addresses closest, closer military cooperation and integration between the nations, also logistically. Norway will be an important reception area, but the final destination will not only be in our uh, area. It will be more on oriented through Sweden and Finland. As well, it can also be a transit route for other theaters. Logistic options have increased. It will improve sustainability and resilience in the Nordic region. The theatre as a whole will most likely move from being mostly maritime focused to a more balanced and joint perspective with more attention on the land domain. And coming in for landing, uh, the Norwegian Defence Logistics Organisation is a cornerstone in Norway's national defence. Through efficient uh, procurement, supply, maintenance and logistic, we ensure that the Norwegian armed forces are well prepared, well supplied and ready to pro protect uh, nations' interests. The last four years, we have been working on the JLSG, cooperating with NATO and Joint Force Command Norfolk. This is in change and Finland has joined, Sweden will soon follow. This will affect the Nordic countries in all domains with more cooperation and integration of military logistics. A NATO joint logistic support group is a vital function of the NATO logistic and support structure. A JLSG to Joint Force Command Norfolk is under development and will continue to be developed with new members. Support to multinational land forces requires a clear understanding among contributing nations that national logistic organization exists in a multinational framework in support of combat operations. The JLSG represent this multinational logistic support to the land forces on the battlefield. It optimizes footprint, the logistics. It provides an effective and efficient number of supply lines into the theater. And it takes into account the different, different national support structure 
and the composition of multinational logistic support. Logistics is important in any military operation. A GLSG is in the rear area. Uh, the theater or third line logistic entity connecting national logistics with the fighting forces in a multinational flame, uh, frame. Ensuring ARSOM continued sustainment and RMSD. It's a lifeline of multinational land forces in the theater. The land domain and the land component in the theater are dependent on these effec effective rear area logistic systems. And so NATO provides doctrine and the system for logistics. Interoperability between, between nat NATO nation is of essence in order to establish a multinational effective logistic system. Norway has been developing a capability as a JLSG to Norfolk. Uh, this will be de developed further uh, in the NATO in change with Nordic member, new Nordic members. We have laid a good foundation for a third NATO JLSG tailored for Joint Force Command Norfolk. And with tho those words, I conclude my brief. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second day of this conference. And it's an honor for me to introduce our first speaker for today, uh, Christopher Lawrence. He's a distinguished historian and a military analyst uh, with wealth of expertise. <coughs> Mr. Lawrence has been a large contributor to this conference as well, as this also marks his third participation, where he previously um, where he ha has previously inspired participating cadets to, uh, to engage in academic writing and, uh, art and articles based on his research. So, uh, cadets, you have uh, something uh, to look forward to here now. Currently, <coughs> he serves as the executive director and president of, a, of the DUP Institute. Ms. Lawrence is dedicated to scholarly research and objective analysis of historical data related to armed conflict and its resolution. The DUP Institute is renowned for its independent historically based uh, anal analysis, analysis of uh, lessons learned from the modern military campaigns. <coughs> Mr. Lawrence's extensive career includes serving as a program director for various significant data uh, projects such as the Ardennes Campaign Simulation Database and the Kursk Database. He has contributed to studies on casualty uh, estimates, air campaign modeling, urban warfare, counterinsurgency, and more for esteemed institutions such as the U.S. Army, Department of Defense, the Joint Staff, and the U.S. Air Force. Today, Ms. Lawrence will delve into the critical topic of force ratio. His presentation will share research on what it takes to achieve success on division-level combat and beyond along with the crucial uh, role of human factors in these endeavors. Please welcome Mr. Christopher Lawrence. All right, I'm Chris Lawrence with the Dupuy Institute, and I've got a little four-part presentation. Um, the first section um, covers force ratios and success at division-level combat, and this is drawn from my book, War by Numbers, so you can go back and check and read all the footnotes and figure out all the little exceptions and details of what I'm talking about. Second section is new. I actually ha We actually have an old campaign database that we had developed about 20 years ago, so I went back through and I did some running of the numbers from it to look at, see what the differences were in force ratios and success in operations above division level. So we'll first look at division level, and then we'll look at force ratios and their success above division level. This, of course, leads into a discussion on human factors. I've got um, three chapters on human factors in my book, War by Numbers. And then I'll briefly look at whether there's a <laughs> whether it's possible to generate a, ba a, a breakthrough at above division level um, with, with lower force ratios. Um, um, there is some, I have been working 
on a follow-up book to War by Numbers called More War by Numbers. And I've gone through and reshot a lot of the data, etc. And I put it all as backup slides to this slide. So this whole slide presentation is 100 slides. You're going to see about 35 of them this morning. And um, if anyone wants to look through the additional material, they can order up a copy of the presentation. Uh, the force ratios being discussed here are simple counts of personnel. Doing something more complicated is more complicated. And um, I decided not to do that. I just simply decided to add up the numbers of people on each side. So here's what we got. This is 116 division level engagements from the European Theater of Operations in 1944. We have a database of division level combat that has 752 cases covering from 1904 to uh, 1991. And so I pulled out of here just the European Theater of Operations engagements from 1944. So if you take a look at that, you will see that there was five cases where people attacked at about one to one or lower. All five of them failed. Uh, there was about um, 48 cases where they attacked between 1.15 and 1.88 to one odds. Those succeeded almost 80 percent of the time. Um, then there's um, 21 cases where they attack between 1.95 and 2.56 to 1, and they succeed 90% of the time. You know, it's pretty easy to tell if somebody succeeds, they advance, they take the ground, et cetera. It's, it is a value judgment, but it's a value judgment that doesn't leave a whole lot in question. Once they get above 2.71 to 1, they succeed all the time. Um, there's been various 3 to 1 rules that people have put out, put them all outside, they, they don't mean anything. This is real data from the real world, real combat, et cetera. Um, this might be, be worth looking at. Now, many years ago, back in the early 90s, we did extensive research on the Battle of Kursk. We got access to the Soviet records. We got access to the Soviet archives. We hired retired friends and military academy professors to give us those access, et cetera, so on and so forth. And so here's a split out of the case of the force ratios when Germans are attacking the Soviets at battles of Kharkov and Kursk and when the Soviets are attacking the Germans in 1943. So you can see Germans are actually succeeding four out of five times when they attack at below one to one odds when they're attacking the Soviets. Um, and they pretty much usually succeed at whatever odds they attack. Almost every attack they do succeeds. On the other hand, when the Soviets are attacking, you can see that they are failing more often than not. And they do a considerable number of, atta number of attacks at below one to one odds. And 30% of those succeed, but 70% fail. And you can see even when they get up to 3 to 1, or up towards 3 to 1, um, they're still succeeding. They're, they're still only succeeding about 60% of the time. This is a very clear measurement of human factors, the difference between the capabilities of the armies. Their equipment was similar. Their, they, they had all had time to rest and recuperate it. This is in uh, July of 43, except for the battles of Kharkov, but the curse was July of 43. This is clearly a difference in the capabilities and performance of the armies. Um, training, experience, morale, doctrine, etc. cetera. And, um, and that shows it in very, very sharp terms, the differences in um, capabilities. I'm going to skip the next slide. I actually meant to move that into a backup slide. But one will note among this data, there are only seven cases the attackers succeeding when outnumbered. Um, and only one of these cases, he succeeds when outnumbered by a factor of two. Uh, furthermore, the attacker almost always wins when he outnumbers the opponent by at least two to one. So, let's look at Clausewitz for a moment. <laughs> I did do the math and put the tables together years before I bothered to open up and, 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 and go through this passage in Clausewitz, but it's very interesting. At Luthen, Frederick the Great, with 30,000 men, defeated 80,000 Austrians. At Rossbach, he defeated 50,000 allies with 25,000 men. These, however, are the only examples of victories over an opponent two or even three times as strong. Okay, this matches my data. Um, we'll skip the next bat, 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 batch of batch and go down towards the end of that paragraph. At Colin, Frederick the Great's 30,000 men could not defeat 50,000 Austrians. Similarly, victory eluded Bonaparte at the desperate Battle of Leipzig, even though his 160,000 men against 280,000 and his opponent was far from being twice as strong. These examples may show that in modern Europe, of course, modern Europe is 1820 when he's writing this, in modern Europe, even the most talented generals 
will find it very difficult to defeat an opponent twice his strength. When we observe that the skill of the greatest commanders can be counterbalanced by a two-to-one ratio in fighting forces, we cannot doubt that superiority in numbers, and it does not have to be more than double, will suffice to assure victory, however adverse the other circumstances. Again, this matches what we got. More Clausewitz, and this first paragraph is critical. If we thus strip the engagement of all variables arising from its purpose and circumstance and disregard the, fight, the fighting value of the troops involved, which is a given quantity, which is what Clausewitz says. So at this point, he is doing a mathematical construct. And I've had many Clausewitz scholars get uptight when you say that, but here he is, he is thinking mathematically. Um, so if we disregard the fighting value of the troops involved, which is a given quality, we are left with the bare concepts of the engagement, a shapeless battle in which other disti only distinguished factors is the number of troops on, on either side. These numbers, therefore, will determine victory. And then he puts all his qualifying clauses beneath there, which I leave in the slide, but I'm not going to bother to read. Obviously, there's a whole lot more going on in combat with terrain, situation, forces, position, posture, etc., uh, weather, etc., going on in combat that influences all this. But it does reach a re re reach a point when numbers is still ends up being the dominating factor, and once it gets above four to one, it's a factor you cannot overcome. Um, and this continues his um, his statements, um, qualifi qualifying on it, but still basically. There's no disagreement. Now, I always like to pull this slide up because I claim that this is operations research is done in 1863, and I usually talk to the operations research communities who don't think that 1863 is particularly relevant to what they're discussing. But this is a letter written by Abraham Lincoln, the President of the United States, and basically he is saying that um, General Meade, as shown by the returns, has with him and between him and Washington of the same classes of well men, well men over 90,000. However, neither can bring the whole of his men into battle, but each can bring as large a percentage in as the other. For battle, then, General Meade has three men to General Lee's two. Having it determined that choosing ground and standing on the defensive gives so great an advantage that three cannot safely attack two, so you can see they're looking at a force ratio 1.5 to 1, um, the three are simply left standing on the defensive also. And here's Lincoln, the lawyer, talking. If the enemy's 60,000 are sufficient to keep our 90,000 away from Richmond, why, by the same rule, may not 40,000 of ours keep their 60,000 away from Washington, leaving us 50,000 to put to some other use? <laughs> so you sit there and you look at the logic, and that's, you know, it's math. It's an analysis saying, hey, they got 60, we can leave 40,000 and move 50,000 elsewhere. This, of course, leads into the campaign database because the question I had in my mind is, you know, I've, been, I've got 750 cases in my division-level database. You know, I can see what the force ratios are there. So what are we looking at if we look at bigger than our division level? And we put together about 20 years ago, we put together a campaign database. We got it about two-thirds complete, um, and um, it was fairly extensive. It was 196 campaigns from 1905 to 1991. They ranged from two days in length to 155 days. They were mostly army level operations, et cetera. We never completed the database. We got two thirds done. I said, well, I can still, if I got 196 cases, I can still analyze from a da database that is two thirds done. So, you know, here's your duration of engagements over time across the campaign and the periods. Most of it's from Italy. We pretty much documented everything in Italy in 43, 44. We got Northwest Europe. We got some stuff on the Eastern Front. We got the Arab-Israeli wars. We got a scattering of material put into that campaign database. So you can see what makes up the total 196 cases. Um, extensively covered North Africa also. Um, and what we're showing is that the average attack was done at about two to one. In these campaign videos, the average battles, the attacker outnumbered the defender about two to one. Losses were roughly one to 1.3 to one. Um, 
um, losses per day as a percent of the force, of course, because the defender is smaller, was about one, almost 1 1.2627 to 1 because the defender force is smaller, half the size of the attacker. Therefore, if they suffer roughly equal losses, the defender is going to be on the downside of percent exchange. Um, so we had 97 cases where the attacker was ruled as the winner and 38 cases where we ruled the defender as the winner and 28 draws, which we just ignore. Um, so here is, here, is, here is the lineup of attacker, defender, and draw. And so you can see that the force ratio of the of the ones where the attacker won um, is, is 2.228 to 1. The force ratio of the cases where the defender won is 1.56 to 1. So what we're seeing is fairly similar force ratios between success and failure at the Army level as we're already seeing at the division level. And that was what's so, what, what sort of amazed me when I assembled the data is that this data doesn't look any different than division level. It looks like you know, you think, you, you, you sort of, or at least I was trying to convince myself that as you go up to higher levels of operations, core and army, force ratios are not as critical. You've got more maneuver, you've got more options, et cetera, so on and so forth. But there's no evidence that shows that. It appears that, um, it appears that you know, the same relationships that exist at division level combat exist at army level combat. You can see it on the losses. You know, if the, when the attacker wins, they tend to lose less than the defender. When the attacker loses, the, they tend to lose more than the defender. I mean, this is all kind of what you expect to see, but, you know, and you can see on percent per day, the ratio of exchange as a percent per day is even if the defender holds. Uh, that's what we're looking here. And so the end result is, um, is there is a difference in force ratios between winning and losing engagements. There is a different difference in casualties between winning and losing engagements. Again, this is all no surprise. Um, the data for these army level operations does not look significantly different than for a division level operation. This is significant. And then I tried to figure out, well, what exceptions are I looking at? You know, I got one case where the force ratio was less than 0.5 to 1, and most of you know what that case is. Um, I've got a whole bunch of other low odds cases, but there's only a few of them. There's like 13 down in there. I tried to look at them. Um, um, okay. I tried to look at them, and I could not find any pattern in them. I may have moved that slide out of the way. Okay. This, of course, all leads us back to the issue of human factors, just to repeat the table from earlier in the briefing. Um, and, um, and again, the quote from Clausewitz, if we strip the engagement of all variables arising from its purpose and circumstances and disregard the fighting value of troops involved, which is a given quantity, and that little phrase I like to keep repeating because some people keep saying you cannot quantify or you cannot measure human factors. Well, in 1820, Clausewitz thought you could. <laughs> and in all of our analysis, and I got three chapters on it in War by Numbers, you can clearly differentiate human factors, you know, after the fact, looking at the historical data, et cetera. But you can clearly differentiate and you can quantify the differences in human factors. So if anyone tells you you cannot measure human factors, um, it's been done. I got a book on it. It's been done. Can be done. Um, so let's look at this in depth. In the battle of curse for a table we were doing on enemy prisoner war capture rates for a little study we were doing for Center for Army Analysis on enemy prisoner capture rates, we ended up coding the engagements by outcome. The three outcomes that matter here are three, four, and five. Three is attack fails. Four is attack van advances. Five is an attacker is the is the defender is penetrated so you can see in the cases where the germans are attacking you can see their percent losses never get above about one percent per day whereas the defenders percent losses the soviet forces are losing start start by losing over one percent per day and as they get as the attack advances or they get penetrated, they go up to 5% or 7% losses at division level combat. Now, Soviet divisions were about 8,000 people, but, you know, you're, you know, but they were literally suffering on a daily basis, 5 to 7% losses per day 
as they were being pushed back. So this is, you know, what, 600 killed, wounded, and missing on the average per day, and we got days where they, where they take a lot worse than that. On the other hand, when the Soviets attack, Category 3 and Category 4, you will see that they continue, they suffer over 3% losses per day when they attack, whereas the defender is suffering about 1% losses per day. And there's your human factors not measured by su mission success, but measured by casualty exchange ratios. So you can measure human factors by looking at mission success. You can measure it by looking at casualty exchange ratios. You can also look at, at, at measuring it by advance rates, but I don't get into that this time. And um, um, so human factors also affect casualty exchange rates, not just winning and losing. Um, for example, in our urban warfare studies, we compared engagements from the Eastern Front where the performance differences between the two armies were very clear. Um, and that's where some of this is from. In the case of outcome three, which is coded as failed attacks, when the Germans attacked, they suffered 0.68% losses while their opponents suffered 1.33% losses. If you go to outcome four, which is where the attack succeeds, the attacker advances, and we see the Germans lose 1.3% while their opponents lose 5.34%. 5.34%. In contrast, when the Soviets are attacking, they lose 3.54%, even though it is an attack of success, even though they succeeded um, in their mission, but their opponents lose 1.03%. So there is a casualty exchange difference in, in performance between our armies. Clearly, no matter whether attacker or defender, the Soviets lose more than the Germans, often more than three times as much as measured as a percent of force. There is a clear performance difference between these forces. Um, um, now, casualty effectiveness is an outcome. It's not necessarily a direct means of measuring combat effectiveness. Um, in our world, combat effectiveness is a value that we put in our combat models um, when we're running our combat models. Um, as far as I can tell, casualty effectiveness is higher than combat effectiveness. So if you're doing a casually, if you're doing a casualty exchange rate of four to one with your opponent, it doesn't mean you're four times better. It means you may be twice as good, but the result is that you're getting four times as good a result. We have never f solidly established the mathematical relationship there, but it's clear that that you know. 30 or 50 percent better performance by your army will generate more than twice as many casualties on your opponent. So casualty effectiveness is not necessarily the same as combat effectiveness. Um, and then there's of course the issue of casually insensitive armies. There's armies that simply are more than willing to take casualties and of course one can look at World War I, Soviet Army in World War II, of course the most infamous case Japanese Army in World War II, and perhaps the Wagner Group at Bakhmut. Um, applications to analysis, you know, theoretically we do analysis. And so, and so therefore, if you're doing any analysis based on historical data, at some point you have to address the human factors. You have to be aware of the fact that not all armies are the same. And, um, 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 so why do we need to do this? First, the U.S. Department of Defense does lots of combat modeling and their combat modelings need to address this. They don't. Almost no U.S. DOD combat models address human factors or address the differences in combat performances. And there is a institutional resistance to doing so. Some of it's based upon the fact that, gee, you can never overestimate your enemy, et cetera, so on and so forth. But, you know, fact of the matter, we saw in 1991 in the Gulf, we saw in 2003 in the invasion of Iraq, those differences do exist. And while in 1991 we chose to ignore it and overpowered the opposition in 2003, we went in with 75,000 people to invade Iraq, even though they theoretically had a bigger army than us. So it's quite clear from planning purposes, we were already making adjustments to address human factors, even though our combat models don't show this and don't address this. Uh, second, human factors needs to be understood for certain types of analysis. So, you know, in particular, if we, we were doing a study in enemy prisoner war capture rates, the number of people who desert and surrender is higher for lower morale armies than it is for other armies. So if you're sitting there doing so, you can't just put everything into a hopper and work from there. Um, third, it's essential to understand for future planning and oper efforts and operations. 
Um, and I think I already covered this. Um, <laughs> fourth, most of U.S. operations in the future are going to be against opponents who are not as highly trained and capable as the U.S. military is. Fact of the matter, when you wander into some of these operations elsewhere in the third world, you're going to be facing armies that don't have the level of experience, training, um, organization, etc., that the, that the U.S. Army has. So you, you're going to often be facing and in, 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 in potential operations against opponents who are fundamentally less capable than the U.S. military. And we need to account for that, especially if we're going to do any planning, casualty estimates, or combat modeling of the operation. So, let's get back to, um, to force ratios for a moment, because I want to address Ukraine. So we're looking Category 3. Um, you need a force ratio from the, this is a, from the campaign database. Um, for those cases that are coded, for those 10 cases that are coded as attacker failed, the force ratios were less than 2 to 1. The casualty exchange ratio uh, favored, favored the defender. Um, for those 29 cases that was attack advance, the force ratios were up towards 3 to 1, and the loss ratio still favored the defender. And then at category 5, defender penetrated. Uh, force ratios remained about three to one, and the fo and the loss exchange ratios went in favor of the attacker, and that's when the attacker started taking less losses than the defender. That's from the campaign database, and that pretty much matches what we see with the uh, division level databases. Uh, failed attacks tend to be at lower average odds than successful ones. Attacker suffers higher losses than the, than the defender until they are penetrated. There are various combat models that have tried to tie losses to force ratios. And that is a direct connection that does not exist. Um, high losses occur when you start rolling your high, uh, low losses from the attacker and high losses from the defender start occurring when you start rolling your enemy back. When the defender starts rolling back, that's when you get favorable exchange ratios. It's not based upon force ratios. If I attack at two to one and fail, I'm not going to cause two, twice as many casualties as the defender as I take. I'm going to probably lose more than the defender. And these are the same patterns we see for division level cat. Um, battles. So, you know, I tried to look at the, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, I tried to look at the 13 or so cases where the um, attacker won, even though they were attacking at low odds, and most of them are fairly easy to explain. In fact, we have a presentation coming up on Husky, my first two cases here, later on, um, conveniently, later on um, today. So, nothing in there, looking at the individual cases, I sort of know a lot about most of these cases. None in there stood out as being an exceptional case that I could somehow or the other magically apply to Ukraine and say, gee, Ukraine should be able to win if they do this. Um, and same with the breakthroughs, outcome five, where the, where the, where the, where the uh, attacker penetrated the defender at low odds. Um, so how does this all relate to fighting in Ukraine? Well, the odds, the odds are you know, I don't know what the size of the Ukrainian army is deployed. It's somewhere between 200 to 400,000 people. I don't know the size of what the Russian army is deployed in Ukraine. It's somewhere between two to 400,000 people. Um, they're, they're, they're fighting at roughly one-to-one -one odds. So if they're fighting at roughly one-to-one -one odds, then, you know, just looking at the math will sort of tell you that you expect it to stalemate. Now, there's lots of th other things going on. <laughs> <laughs> and the Ukrainians may have some advantages in artillery, air support, intelligence, morale, perhaps training, etc. So, you know, and these advantages can all add up to, 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 to move things in your favor. But fundamentally, it does not appear that Ukraine right at the moment has the odds or enough additional advantages to be able to systematically advance across, across the front. Um, and then in the backup slides, um, if you guys are so interested to go look at those 65 back, backup slides, I have more data from my book, War by Numbers. I have um, some material drawn, some elements that make up human factors drawn from my write-ups, uh, from, from my uh, write-ups that I provided for the book, Land Operations, and it's also going to be in my upcoming book, The Battle for Kiev, which covers the first six weeks of the war in uh, Ukraine. And then I'm working on a book, which I may or may not get serious about next year, called More War by Numbers. I got it half written, and, you know, writing the first half is the easy part. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'm, not, I'm not sure when that's going to come out yet. 
And, um, and I think that ends it. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Colonel Lars Karlsson, the commander of the Northern Military Region in Sweden. Colonel Karlsson's distinguished career in the military uh, has equipped him with a new unique insight into the challenges of the high north and particularly in Sweden. He will discuss the specific terrain conditions, uh, the, impact of, um, the impact of the climate and the opportunities and challenges posed by C4IS infrastructure. His presentation will also cover the organization of territorial and regular army units in Sweden, uh, emphasizing their command structure as well as lessons learned from the war games, war games and uh, importance of unified Nordic land uh, command in the region. Colonel Carlson will touch on the vital topic of functional logistics uh, at the division and core level and raise the key questions for operational success. Join me in welcoming Colonel Lars Carlson. Good morning. So uh, I came from the high north yesterday, Finnish Lapland, um, where we have the, the FISE new commanders conference. That was two one-star generals and four colonels. We meet each year two times and talk about our mission, our resources, our plans, and we often uh, war game in different uh, context those plans and see what we can learn from each other and yesterday one of the question was okay where do all the intelligence ends up who is doing the, the joint targeting in order to make sure that the sensor in northern Finland with a shooter in northern Norway can be linked and defeat the enemy system that we have identified on the battlefield That title talks a bit about that, but uh, what is it really when we are talking about unity of command? What do we mean? How can we achieve it? So hopefully I will give you some insights about that. Not so many answers, but something to think about. That is my agenda and the picture from, from a lovely uh, exercise corresponds 16 where I was uh, from time to time defeated by the evil Brigade North. <laughs> this is a lovely landscape picture from the North. And if you have a look on, on, on that terrain and the flat uh, white fields, and what is it exactly that we are looking at? Because what you see is not always what you get. There you see the, the winter condition and, and the summer condition. Meaning that if the ice or the, 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 the depth of the frozen ground is good enough, you can move er, over that field with lighter or heavier vehicle. But if it's not, then it's something uh, different. So it's a clear risk that you, you will be stepping into some nasty surprises like this and unfortunately I think we both we all have friends that we have lost due to that we have not uh, done that we have uh, made a failure in our, our judgment if the ground is good enough and of course this means that uh, you are delayed in the best case and in, in the bad case you lose that equipment for a while or for, for good And when I was a young CV-90 commander with the first mechanized company, we was having an end exercise is 1.5 meters of snow. That was a little bit too much for the CV-90 even. So we needed to push and then back and push again to get through. And it's not only the speed, it's the, the, the optics and sensor. And it's both positive and negative. The difference between the temperatures give us advantages but also, as you see on the tank, that will affect the optics and sensor in a bad way. Mobility and deployment. 
getting the, the, the logistical part off road, dispersed, spread out, that, um, that is a, a demand more or less to get away and, and survive on the battlefield. But then you must have snow plows, you must have the time, the planning to make sure that you can do it. And of course, in the north of Sweden there is a lot of river and it always goes in the wrong direction. Uh, so you need to have the ability to, to, to maintain that mobility with bridging equipment. And also, of course, maybe in some cases even reinforced ice in order to make sure that we, you can use the ice as a road that we have tested. Tested so we can use, for example, heavy transportation uh, vehicle with, with uh, a Leopard 2 on and it's good enough for, for moving over them. But that needs experience, preparations and over time reconnaissance. Cold weather operations. The mobility, the endurance or sustainment and time. Almost everything take longer time. And also how, uh, how prepared are you for that kind? Going back to the mats, one of the Finnish myths is that during the winter war there were one Finnish soldier for every 10 Russian soldier. I've heard a professor talk about that, he had them do, doing the mats and that was not the, the truth. But there were some parts when the condition between the kill ratio was one Finn for two Russians. Why? because that Russian units were trained in winter and had experience in winter conditions. Training and exercising. Okay, this is my problem. I always brag about that I have a big area of responsibility and then my friends down south say, yeah, yeah, but uh, no one is living there, so... so. And that is, uh, of course, a challenge. Making sure that you have enough of pers uh, soldiers in that, uh, because uh, you need to use every every man or woman up there in order to get them enough of resources. For the moment, in the north, we have one of the two, two brigades in in Sweden. Hopefully, we receive some more in the future. That's the army plan. We got seven of the forty home guard battalion, and we have a lack of territorial defense units. That is the, the challenge. And the military problem is, if you summarize it in my opinion, this. Mobility and reserves is essential in this area. And of course, to know where you should use your resources, then you need to, to establish and maintain a situation awareness. And I'm sure that if something is happened on, on the Russian-Finnish border, the first th that will be deployed for, from NATO is that they want to use the, the Swedish aircraft carrier up north as bases. And then we will have special forces trying to make sure that we can't do that in, in an efficient way. So reduce the special forces' freedom of action, making sure that we can hunt the Spetsnaz and make them uh, uh, not so effective. And also, there are some important, both A-ports and S-ports, that could be grabbed in a, in a surprise attack. We have seen that before. Historical back. And it will be happen again. So the ability to meet and, and limit enemy freedom of movement is really important. If you switch to how the, the Swedish armed forces structure has been, 1995, we had uh, 16 brigades and almost 100 um, local defense battalions or equivalent. And we also have a number of home guard. Then we have just started the, the transformation into battalions. But after the big downsizing, the territorial arm disappeared. So that means that both the home guard and the army has tried to fill that gap in the middle, meaning that we demand very much of a home guard soldier who is trained either four days a month uh, a year or eight days a year. So the mission is much more 
complex uh, and, and difficult than they should have in the normal protect and guard different uh, important infrastructure bases and other things. That gap is a serious problem that Sweden needs to handle sooner or later. We have it in the plan, but that plan is 2030 and beyond. So we need to push that further through us. That's my opinion. So how's the command structure in the north? Well, I'm on the... Uh, my, uh, my boss is the, the, the commander for the Joint Forces uh, headquarters. And um, aside me, we have the Army commander and the Air Force commander. In my normal uh, use of forces is the 7 Home Guard Battalion up north. And in the same area we have the Army with the, the Norbottom Brigade, the 19th Brigade, and also the two new uh, rifle or mechanized rifle battalion in in uh, in Östersund and Soleftio with a new regiment there. And on the Air Force side we have uh, a number of air base uh, units that are deployed at Galax in Luleå but also operate from Vidsel and Jokmok and the other war bases up there. It's a rather split chain of command meaning that I lead operation in that uh, area and at the same time the, the army will be operating there either getting over to Finland or getting south or hopefully with parts uh, are, are, are uh, given to me in order to solve my missions and the Air Force is crucial to make sure that they can operate both our own fighters and of course hopefully uh, our allies in the future. So how is that working? Is it a good system? Could it be better? Yeah, as you understand of my question, I think so. And I hope that I can, can come forward to, to how we would like to do it. And of course, there is a difference between uh, the soldier's skill and quality and experience that you need to handle both regarding um, training standard interoperable C C2IS or C4IS or what we call it and also integration for example of joint fires making sure that what the home guard soldier sees can be given to the shooter so we can take that threat away and we have an um, rather bad, GBAD capability on the ground in the north. I've been participating in two army commanders war game last year and, and this year. Last year in Stockholm, this is in Stockholm when Carl Engelbrechtsson was the army commander and I participated this year when, when uh, Johnny Lindfors, the new army commander, was present. And that has been really good meetings really open discussion between the countries and maybe some more open uh, insights from, from the conducted uh, that is my conclusion not uh, anyone else what I have seen is that is three countries with both similar and different resources and terrain there are three different plans hopefully now it will be two when Finland is a part of NATO there is three different chain of command, both within the forces and also between them. And uh, we have uh, done some, some alertness uh, exercises where we end up at the borderline, not so sure if we can get through the core of the bureaucracy and everything. So there is a need of more smooth border passage. We have seen borders that are more or less fixed. We don't maneuver on the other side of the border because that is another country. And we have seen if we open up that, that give us totally different uh, alternatives to how we should act. And we know that we need to mobilize and deploy, get the troops ready and in place. 
and there is partly a, a, a lack of ground forces in the high north. How can we reinforce that? And one big conclusion from those war games is more or less one mission, one plan, one commander. But we are not that we are not there yet. So hopefully we are soon a part of NATO. And what happened then? What will how will that uh, affect Sweden and how Sweden developed their forces? in the future. So and of, of course one of the questions is where will be the front areas and where will be the rear areas and uh, the main part of Sweden we uh, suppose will be a rear area focusing on securing the bases for for example for 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 fighter units uh, securing the logistical the the, the, the the ground lines of communication making sure that the logistical flow is, is continuous going into the northern Finland, if that's necessary. So what kind of military capability do Sweden need for, for, for such uh, mission? Maintaining and developing the landlines of communication, guard and protect the critical roads and logistical hubs, and establish and maintain military bases for both army and air force using units. And assure that we have uh, mobile reserves to be able to counter the enemy's freedom of movement and freedom of action. The army commander has today gathered all his uh, sub commander in Sweden. And this will be one of the, the questions that they are talking about. Well, command post. I can't have a presentation without talking about that because if you want to command you need to command from for somewhere most likely a main headquarters and also some kind of forward command post and today that's difficult the question mark is can you hide today can you even hide today when the enemy is using the el electronic spectra throughout and every resource is hand he has in order to identify and localize where, where we are with our forces. And I think that uh, one answer on, on those issues is that we are too big. For example, during 2016, my main headquarters was crushed by some American UIC chapters that uh, was directed by Brigade North after they had with electrical warfare, uh, getting the, the position of, of our main headquarters. And it was like a circus in size. And that could not be, be, be the, the, the future solution. So of course we need to make them smaller, but how do we do make them smaller? One, um, one way is that not have the comfortable of being together, but being spread out and connected with the, the different teams. So you can do the staff work, you can do the command, but you are not so <coughs> obvious. And also, of course, we need to use the, the mobile, the net, and the new modern technology in a better way. Not using the radio when we are, are, are fixed. And if we use it, we need to move. Old truth. To summarize, if you want to, to, to be in the winter, you need to have both pre-planned and preparation and that we do when we are for example exercising like we are doing next year on Nordic response making sure that our soldiers our commanders are trained and experience what uh, that means to operate in those harsh conditions and pre-planning is also of course to to make sure that your equipment is is uh, chosen wisely for example, during the army exercise of 2019, the Swedish armored battalion was in a perfect position to attack Brigade North in, in, in the side. But they couldn't do it because going up to deployment of area, they ran out of fuel and the fuel was wheel borne and the roads were not plowed. 
so they was just watching that opportunity to go out of their hands ground forces capability and the rear front areas in the north what does that mean i think that uh, one of the answer that the com uh, army commander will come come up uh, during this day or these days that are there or talking about that is of course what kind of balance between the north and south should sweden have because for a long time the main part of sweden in the south with the capital gotland has been the focus for the army when we are part of nato that might needs to be rebalanced somehow and also of course what kind of capability because if you want to operate with for example maneuver units up north then for example the logistics for example the, the fuel needs to be on track also in order to be able to follow the units like the russians d30 d40 uh, tracked vehicle that are a logistical assets for them and we will have gaps when we start looking at that for example if our one of our main mission is to make sure that the, the air bases and logistical flow and transportation of troops with uh, true Sweden is important then we need to have the mobility the flexibility to act when we see or identified threats to that and now we are rather heavily mechanized army the question is should that also be rebalanced in the future with more lighter units that are, are more mobile and can be used for hunting the Spetsnaz units and we together Finland Sweden and Norway needs to make sure that we can can push some of the bureaucracy away and get our, our, our border to be more uh, not so hard to pass so the chain of command in the north that is uh, crucial that is what the, the war game every time have shown us we need to analyze and decide in order to clarify the chain of command in Sweden should we have it like we have today or should we change it in the future should I be a part of the army directly under the army commander or should we have something else there is a number of things that we have identified in Sweden and that we have different solutions on but we are not decided on it yet I hope that we can rather quick decide on that because we need that we need both to change our plans after we are done that restructuring and we need to exercise in those structure so we know that we can lead in new uh, chains of commands and I think that NATO needs to ask themselves the question how will NATO command the high north in the future what I've seen on the war game and, and talking to my friends the commanders on, on the different uh, countries up north is that the Finnish units up north they have a they don't call it a division but it's a division structure that leads it in Sweden we have the Norbotten Brigade in Norway we have Brigade North and we receive allied units when something happens or we exercise so the Finnish has a division how should we do with the, with the, Brit the, the Swedish and, and the Norwegian Brigade should there be a multinational division headquarters somewhere taking care of that part and also taking care of the assets that the NATO will push forward in order to solve the mission and if we have a division a well, multinational and we have a Finnish division who will command that will there be a core need core command need up north or should it be the LCC or how should we do there is a number of questions that I can have um, uh, as an older Swedish uh, a colonel some some suggestion on but I think that we need to clarify that and clarify it as soon as possible and start exercising in that new chain of command because there is a need of unity of command in the high north and you need to finish with a tank picture and this is the T-80s of uh, 200, second, uh, 200 motorized rifle brigade up north and I think that those tanks are no 
longer existing. They are most likely uh, somewhere rusting in, in, in northern Ukraine. Thank you. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. Richard Harrison, a distinguished translator and independent researcher. Uh, Dr. Harrison's extensive academic journey uh, includes a bachelor degree in foreign service, a master's degree in Russian area studies from Georgetown University. He further uh, he furthered his expertise with earning a doctorate degree in war studies from Killings College in London with the desertion focused on developing the, the development of Russian Soviet operational art during the early 20th century. Dr. Harrison's research has taken him to Leningrad uh, State University, very specialized in 19, uh, 19th century uh, Russian intellectual history and the Defense Department Office of uh, POW and MIA Affairs, uh, where he conducted extensive investigative work throughout the former Soviet Union. His work as a translator and investigator has contributed significantly to our understanding of Russian Soviet military history. Today, Dr. Harrison will enlighten us with his presentation on the Red Army's command arrangements uh, in the Northern Theater of military activ activities during the 1930s and 1940s. His profound knowledge and expertise promise to shed light on a crucial period uh, in military history. Dr. Ha Richard Harrison, the floor is yours. Okay, first, thank you, uh, Major Brock. Thank you, uh, Colonel Schmidt, uh, for this uh, wonderful invitation, this opportunity to uh, address you. Um, as the Major said, I will be speaking on uh, Russian and uh, Soviet, in particularly, uh, operational strategic arrangements for conducting war along what they have t current, uh, come to term the Northwestern or Northern strategic direction. That is, that area encompassing the Eastern Baltic and the, along the border with Finland. Now, since the arrival of the Varangians from Scandinavia in the, early, in the, ninth, in the ninth century uh, to, to found or help found the uh, modern Russian state or the medieval Russian state, I should say, Russia has been vitally concerned with events along its northwestern frontier. Uh, this uh, was certainly the case in the Middle Ages when uh, first the Swedes and then the Teutonic Knights made forays into what is now Russian territory and were defeated. If uh, those of you who have seen the, the movie Alexander Nevsky will recall that uh, famous battle scene on the ice. Now for much though of the uh, medieval Russian history, uh, it was not so much a, a, a question of threat from the West, but of the East under the Mongol occupation. However, b starting with around the 14th century and the rise of the Muscovite state, uh, Moscow, or what would later become known as Russia or the Russian Empire, begins to look towards the West or the Northwest, towards the Baltic. For example, uh, in the mid 16th century, 1558 to 1583, Ivan IV, or Ivan the Terrible, as he is more popularly known, uh, began the Livonian War against a uh, Scandinavian and Polish-Lithuanian coalition in order to gain access to the uh, Eastern Baltic. However, the Russian, uh, Russians in this case were unsuccessful. Uh, they were more successful under Peter the Great more than a century later, who fought the Great Northern War against Sweden and acquired a, lo a, lar a large stretch of territory from approximately the uh, Dvina River north to the Gulf of Finland. That is about half of the Eastern Baltic coast. Uh, his successors were more successful in following the divi various uh, divisions of Poland, acquired territory in the, along the Southern Baltic all the way to the East Prussian border. And finally, the Russians consolidated their control over the Eastern Baltic in 1809 by uh, seizing Finland from Sweden. Now, despite these gains, uh, Russia, the Russians remained very sensitive about their, their uh, northwestern frontier. Uh, it's sort of a national characteristic in which uh, their search for absolute security uh, entails a good deal of insecurity for their neighbors. Uh, for example, even as late as 1914, the Quartermaster General of the Russian Armed Forces was uh, writing about Sweden as a possible opponent 
in a, in a new, uh, in a modern European war. That same year, war did break out, and the Russians, perhaps through an excess of caution, stationed an entire army in the St. Petersburg area, again, to ward off a possible Swedish attack. Uh, significantly enough, this, uh, the, the army commander was styled commander-in-chief, uh, and not just commander. Commander-in-chief was a title uh, awarded during this time to uh, the front commanders, that is, commanders of army groups, which again is testimony to the importance which the Russians attach to this, the national capital area. Now, Russia did enter the war and was defeated. Um, and the, the, the country's loss and the Bolshevik triumph in the Russian Civil War brought uh, the problems of the northwestern and frontier into sharper focus. Most notably, the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia had become independent, leaving uh, the Soviet Union at the time with only a small sliver or small foothold on the northeastern Baltic coast. Uh, Finland also achieved independence, and its border was uncomfortably close to the country's second city of Leningrad. Now, the new uh, the new regime, particularly under Stalin, uh, was engulfed by what I would choose to call institutionalized paranoia, e extreme xenophobia, uh, it, mainly conditioned by ideology, but also by national uh, tradition. Uh, Russia, uh, the Soviet Union at the time in, regarded much of the rest of the world as potential enemies. Uh, that is, a capitalist coalition which would unite at some point to renew the assault on Soviet Russia. Now, these fears took on organizational form in the Red Army's various mobilization and deployment schemes during the interwar period. Uh, they particularly were concerned about, their, again, the northwestern frontier, where the Soviets saw the Baltic states and Finland as willing pawns of a larger anti-Soviet capitalist co coalition led primarily by Great Britain and France. Now, the Soviet-German uh, non-aggression pact of 1939 changes all that completely. The secret clauses to the, to the treaty allow the Soviets to uh, uh, basically assign the Baltics and Finland to the Soviet's sphere of influence. Stalin moves quickly to reap the gains of this, of this treaty by stationing forces in the, in the Baltic countries, which was, of course, precursor to their eventual absorption. The, he presented the, made the same demands, plus, plus territorial demands on the Finns, and as you know, the Finns refused, and the Red Army attacked in November 1939. Now, during this war, for, for reasons which are not entirely clear, Stalin chose to bypass the Soviet general staff and entrusted the invasions planning and conduct to uh, the Leningrad military district and its commander, uh, Army Army Commander Second Cla Class uh, Kirill Miritskov. The, the initial Soviet assault was, as you know, it was overwhelming. It was an embarrassing disaster, and uh, as the Finns halted the uh, Soviets along the so-called Mannerheim line. As, a, as an interesting aside, uh, General Miritskov's uh, career here illustrates many of the uh, perils and ups and downs which a uh, senior officer could uh, his career could suffer under Stalin. Um, he, uh, again, presided over this disaster of the initial Finnish war, but despite that, he was later appointed Chief of Staff of the Red Army, which shows that uh, mediocrity is no barrier to promotion. <laughs> <laughs> However, as often was the case, there is a catch. So uh, he was later replaced as uh, Chief of Staff, but still remained in good graces, and uh, on the eve of the war, June 21st, 1941, he's dispatched to Leningrad in the, uh, as the Soviets by now are expecting some kind of attack from that direction, and he is sent as a representative of, of the high command in order to help the local front command repel an expected Finnish attack. However, the next day he is summoned back to Moscow and is arrested along the way. Uh, and. Um, despite the fact that he had been publicly named a member, a, an, uh, an advisor to the Stavka, the Supreme High Command, the day before. He spends the next three months at government expense being tortured until his release in September 
1941. Stalin was very much in need of experienced commanders at this time, and he, as they say, drew a lucky lottery ticket and was freed. A number of the people, <coughs> excuse me, high-ranking officers at the time were not so lucky and were executed during the, uh, the panic of, 19, of October 1941. There's a rather unintentionally humorous passage in his memoirs where Having just been freed from prison, Stalin is, I mean, excuse me, Miritskov <coughs> is summoned into Stalin's office, and Stalin asks very solicitously, uh, Comrade Miritskov, how do you feel? <laughs> How's your health? He says, oh, it couldn't be better, Comrade Stalin, and they, it went on from there. Again, you have to kind of read the lines and, and know the man's history in order to get the, uh, to get the gist of it, but it shows that uh, Stalin was not devoid of a rather macabre sense of humor. So... Now, after following the initial failure along the Karelian Isthmus, the Red Army Command s responds by creating the, the North Northwest Front. Excuse me, Major. I'm trying to advance this, but... Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, the, the, com the front is commanded by uh, Army Commander First Class uh, Konstant uh, Semyon Timoshenko. He's pictured here in his post-1943 uniform when they went over to epaulets, as opposed to the earlier collar tabs. Uh, oddly enough, the new front command, thank you, the new front command is uh, responsible for only two armies, the 7th and 13th attacking directly along the Karelian Isthmus. The rest of the armies to the north of Lake Ladiga to the Barents, Barents Sea remained uh, subject to, uh, to direct control from Moscow and the general staff. Now, under Timoshenko's command, the Red Army basically achieves its mission by bludgeoning the Finns into submission and breaking through the Mannerheim line and bringing the war to a conclusion in March 1940. Uh, as you know, uh, Finland is forced to cede territory along, uh, Kare uh, along southern Karelia and in the far north. Elsewhere that summer, the Soviets uh, complete their de facto occupation of the three Baltic states by absorbing them formally into the Soviet Union. This makes the Soviet Navy the dominant power in the Eastern Baltic. Now, despite the onset of peace, however, the Soviets are, for obvious reasons, dissatisfied with the outcome of the Finnish War. And in the latter half of 1940, they seek to take advantage of uh, the defeat of France and Britain's ejection from the continent. Now Britain is fighting for its very life during the Battle of Britain, and the Soviets see an opportunity. So in, in November of 1940, uh, Timoshenko, now defense commissar, orders the staff of the Leningrad military district to draw up a plan for a renewed war against fin the Finns. In this uh, in this, under this scenario, the Leningrad Military District again will de uh, deploy as a northwestern front responsible for uh, military operations again in Karelia. Another northern front will be formed for, uh, to control operations from the north of Lake Slotiga and Anyega. However, this plan was short-lived because, again, this is November 1940. A month later, Hitler signs the Barbarossa Decree, and the Germans begin to move forces to their eastern frontier. Uh, this sort of puts, gives a new perspective on things, and instead of now the Soviets planning an attack against the Finns, they are become increasingly concerned about the Finns joining a, a, a German attack against them. Now, this is made explicit in the... Uh, by now famous or infamous Soviet preemptive attack plan of, of May 1941, in which the, it's suggested or it's proposed to uh, Stalin by the, the general staff that the, German, uh, the so Soviet army preempt German concentrations in Pol uh, southeastern Poland. And according to this scenario, again, another northern, uh, northern front will be created to handle operations against the Finns. Uh, but this consists of only 15 divisions, so obviously it's going to be a secondary affair. And in fact, at least in the earlier, sta earlier stages, it's assumed that uh, the New Front's mission will be primarily defensive. That is, keeping the Gulf of Finland open and defending Leningrad and Murmansk. All right, now, 
As you all know, Germany invades the Soviet Union on 22nd June 1941, inaugurating what the Soviets have come to call or call the Great Patriotic War. Finland does not officially enter the war on the German side. In fact, it's the Germans who, uh, excuse me, the Soviets who provoked the Finns by bombing some of their airfields on the same day and three days later bombing Helsinki, which causes the defense, who were probably mobilizing anyway, to join in the war. And of course, at the same time, German uh, forces are attacking uh, through Norway and northern Finland toward Murmansk. Now, the Finns uh, advance more or less methodically in pushing the Soviets back nothing really spectacular, and finally, and basically by the autumn of 1941, have reached their old 1939 frontiers. For reasons of their own, the Finns really don't push the fight much more than that, uh, uh, for considerations that uh, to try to capture more territory would, would place them too squarely in the German camp, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, take away their, their excuse that they are independent power fighting what they call, uh, or fighting as what they call a non-belligerent and not an ally of Germany. This is a distinction which the uh, Finns were at pains to uh, make, although I don't think, I think the distinction was lost upon, or certainly upon the Soviets and the Western and, the rest, and their allies, including the United States and Britain. Now, in response to this attack, the Soviet command deploys, again deploys this, the Leningrad Military District as the Northern Front. The front consists of three armies and the military district's air assets. On 28th June, the Northern and Baltic fleets are subordinated directly to the Northern Front, again primarily for, for operations against the Finns, at least for the present. Now, a peculiar feature of the Soviet Union's uh, organization of the Soviet Union's war efforts during this time is the creation of the so-called high commands of the directions. Uh, this was done on 10 July 1941. Now these high commands are operational strategic bodies, each tasked with the coordinating the, uh, the, the operations of one or uh, two or more subordinate fronts, and in cases such as in the north, along maritime axes, axes even coordination of the area's uh, naval assets. The first three commands cover respectively the southwest, that is the area below the uh, marshes, primarily in Ukraine, the western strategic direction or the Moscow direction, and the northwest. These, all these directions lead to respectively Kiev, Moscow, and Leningrad. Now the northern high command, the northwestern high command, which we're concerned with here, is composed of the previously mentioned north, uh, northwestern, northern front, excuse me, as well as the northwestern front. The northwestern front was created out of the Baltic military district in the early days of the war, and is now busy falling back uh, north, north to the northeast towards Leningrad. The high command also includes the, the aforementioned northern and Baltic fleets. The high command is headed by this man. Uh, Marshal Clement Voroshilov, a longtime Stalinist toady who was uh, for many years had a highly unsuccessful, as it turned out, stint as a defense commissar until 1940 when the results of his incompetence became manifest. Uh, he uh, very highly placed, a uh, member of the, of the party Politburo, and uh, for, again, former defense commissar. His, in fact, his uh, commissar is Andrei Zhdanov, who was also a Politburo member. So the Northwestern Strategic Direction, at least politically, has the most heft of all of the, all, of all the other ones. Now, uh, developments at the front soon uh, expose the rather schizophrenic nature of the Northwestern High Command. On one hand, at least on the right-hand side, you have the Northern Front, which is looking north and northwest towards the Finns. On the other hand, you have the Northwestern Front looking to the west and southwest at the rapidly advancing Germans, so which creates a sort of bifurcated approach to operations. Which, uh, and this, so this, you have this body basically in, in a charge of two strategic directions, which is probably beyond its capabilities. Uh, the High Command is generally, is initially at first more concerned with the Finnish invasion, but as, uh, but as after mid-July, the German advance is bringing it increasingly close to Leningrad, and so their attention is drawn further to the south and southwest. Now this bifurcation of responsibility, plus Voroshilov's own incompetence in handling uh, troops in the area, uh, causes Moscow to 
uh, debate or to question the, the, uh, the necessity of maintaining such a body as the Northwestern High Command. It seems rather superfluous at this stage. So on August 23, 1941, the Northern Front is divided into the Leningrad and Karelian Fronts, with the Karelian Front is, uh, removed from the Northwestern High Command's control and subordinated directly to, subordinated directly to Moscow. The Northwestern and, and New Leningrad Front remain subordinated to the Northwestern High Command for another six days until it is disbanded altogether as being simply uh, impractical. Now, after this, after the German failure to take Leningrad in September 1941, the um, <coughs> front in the far north basically remains quiet for the next three years. Uh, by this time, following the failures of the uh, German attack against Leningrad and um, uh, Moscow, the uh, Germans no longer have the strength to take Leningrad and the war basically uh, uh, becomes stalemated for the next three years. However, Army, uh, the, the Soviets attack uh, south of Leningrad in January 1940 and, by, and exposing the weakness of the German position there. And in fact, the Finns, amongst other German allies, are already looking for a way to get out of the war. On June 9th, the Red Army launch, it launches its Wyburg Petrozavodsk offensive operation in Karelia. Uh, the, the Finns uh, retreat methodically back basically to their or 1940 border. And, uh, but however, they realize that uh, they, cannot under, uh, they cannot withstand another blow by the Red Army and begin negotiations and an armistice is signed on sep September 9th, 1944. Uh, one final act remains in the drama that is in the far north where the Karelian Front launches its Pitsamo Kirkines op offensive operation against Soviet forces in Northern Finland and Norway. And uh, the outnumbered Germans, however, are able to withdraw in safety. And at this point, the war in the Arctic is concluded. So World War II ends, uh, and the Cold War falls very closely on its heels. And Europe quickly becomes divided into two antagonistic uh, camps, both pro-Western and pro-Soviet. Uh, Norway becomes a founding member of NATO in 1949, while Sweden and Finland remain neutral in, the, uh, in this uh, uh, Cold War. Uh, Sweden, I mean, excuse me, Finland is even more constrained in its activities by virtue of its treaty with a friendship, cooperation, mutual assistance with the Soviets. Now, um, in sort of a blast from the past, the, uh, so the Red Army, or excuse me, the Soviet Army in during 1979 and 1984 resurrects the high command system, figuring, well, we're going to do it better this time. Uh, high commands are founded in the West, the Southwest, the Far East, and the South in Turkestan for conducting military operations along these strategic directions. Uh, significantly enough, the, the Soviets do not choose to organize a high command for the Northwest or Northern strategic direction. And it, it is assumed that uh, they figure, calculate that uh, in the event of war, again, responsibility will devolve on, upon the Leningrad military district to organize a front uh, apparatus in order to conduct war against uh, NATO and perhaps against the Finns and the Swedes at the same time along this particular direction. Now the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 brings about major changes in Russia's or, uh, military organization, particularly along the Northwest. You have, an, you have the breakaways, a number of states, Ukraine, uh, Belarus, uh, of course, all of Central Asia and, of course, the Baltic states. So this wipes out immediately uh, a number of uh, pre-1991 military districts. So the force, the Soviet, uh, the, excuse me, the Russians are forced to result to a number of ad hoc expedients. And of course, because the Russians have basically, at least in this area, been pushed back to the frontiers of uh, the late, late 17th century. Um, after Putin gains control in, and, uh, and so the, excuse me, uh, the, the, the Soviet Union formerly had 16 military districts and now they begin to whittle these down until by ni about ni 2010, they're down to four very large military districts. In 2010, the military political leadership merges the Leningrad and, and uh, 
uh, uh, Moscow military districts, as well as the Kaliningrad special region in that little isolated uh, bit of uh, the Soviet Union that, that remains along the Lithuanian-Polish border uh, into a single Western military district, much larger than its predecessors. In, 19, in 2014, the Northern, uh, the Northern Fleet, the Murmansk and Ar Archangel Oblasts in the Komi Republic and the Ninets Autonomous Region are removed from the Western Military District to, organize a sep to be organized into a separate Northern Fleet Joint Strategic Command. These are the military districts as of 2010. Western, Southern, which of course is responsible for handling problems in the Northern Caucasus, Central for Siberia, and the Far Eastern. This is, uh, reflects the reorganization of 2014, where the Northern District is, has been calved off as well as the Leningrad special, uh, special zone to create what it, by 2021 is, is formally classified as the Northern Military District. Now, in response to the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Finland joins uh, NATO and the Swedes are on the verge of joining NATO. And this again draws, uh, thus increasing the, the uh, point of contact with NATO considerably. And so the Soviets, or excuse me, right, old habit of this of mine, the Russians uh, <laughs> uh, respond organizationally. And uh, it's, it's uh, brooded, brooded about in the uh, late 1922 and finally decided in 2023 that the uh, former Leningrad and Moscow military districts will be restored, therefore eliminating the, the Western military district altogether. This, at least uh, the formation or the recreation of the Leningrad military district uh, uh, reflects increased Russian concern again with its northern front, uh, northwestern frontier. Uh, what the future holds uh, is anyone's guess, but upon, on that note, I will conclude my lecture and will entertain any questions you might have. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Hovard Kristiansen. He's a distinguished officer with 26 years of dedicated service in the Norwegian Army. He holds a master's degree uh, from the Norwegian Command and Staff College and has an impressive record of service various challenges in various challenges uh, and challenging in assi uh, assignments. Throughout his career, Lieutenant Colonel Kristiansen has served in Lebanon, Bosnia, Kosovo, and completed four tours in uh, Afghanistan. He has extensive experience from tank and armored reconnaissance units and has held leadership roles, including co uh, company commander at the military academy and operations officer in an armored battalion. His contributions as an instructor in tactics at the Land Warfare Center have helped shape the future of the Norwegian Army. Currently, Lieutenant Colonel Kristiansen is the Head of Concept and Doctrine at the Army School of Tactics and Operations at the Norwegian Army Land Warfare Center. Today, Lieutenant Colonel Kristiansen uh, will uh, share his insights on NATO's multi-domain operations uh, concepts and its implications at the tactical level from a Norwegian Army perspective. Colleagues, um, today, I think I will use all this. I'll talk about NATO's uh, multi-domain operations concept at, at the tactical level, and this is a Norwegian army view. <coughs> In this presentation, I will discuss uh, the concept and how it applies to uh, the tactical level in the land domain within the framework of Norwegian national security policy. I'm expressing my own views, but they are uh, naturally influenced by, the, uh, by my position at the Norwegian Army Land Warfare Center, where I'm as uh, stated, the Head of Concepts and Doctrine at the Army School of Tactics and Operations. First, let's have a click, quick look at the uh, uh, NATO's multi-domain operations concept. In order to understand which concept we are discussing, uh, I will initially ask you to pay attention to the diagram shown. 
Uh, this is from a recent study called Breaking Patterns, uh, Multi-Domain Operations and Contemporary Warfare, conducted by the Hague Center for Strategic Studies, published last month. The study compares eight different multi-domain operation concepts and categorizes them. It is worth mentioning the difference between the US Army concept, which was the first concept coining the term multi-domain operations, uh, versus NATO and the UK concept on the first axis. The US, tending to be a concept based purely on the military instrument of power versus NATO and the UK concept taking a more comprehensive approach to several instruments of war. Is instruments of power. On the other axis, it is also worth mentioning that the UK is tending to be a more organizational focused concept versus NATO and the US, which are more tech centric. Please keep this in mind uh, when I now will focus on NATO's MDO concept. NATO's multi-domain operation concept is, to my understanding, mainly an explanatory model to understand the evolution of operations and how we understand operations in an evolved operational environment as an alliance. To the concept's understanding, operations are conducted both at the operational and the strategic level. The definition is the orchestration of military activities across all domains and environments synchronized with non-military activities to enable the alliance to create converging effects at the speed of relevance. To establish a brief understanding of the concept as I see it, I will categorize the concept in three main parts. First, I consider the orchestration of joint operations being the first and main part of the concept. The concept itself is along with the uh, doctrine, uh, including both space and cyber as domains. The need to converge effects uh, within and from all five domains into the three dimensions, physical, virtual and cognitive, is a central idea. The way I see it, this part is a natural evolution of a well-established understanding of joint operations. The orchestration of operations and operational art is well-founded in our doctrines. Second, we have the synchronization and the collaboration part. This part, along with the definition of MDO, calls our attention to non-military activities and the need to synchronize them with the orchestration of military joint operations. It includes all instruments of power. It includes other allied and partners' military operations, and it includes civilian organizations, industry, and academia, to mention some. This is, to my knowledge, more of a puzzle for some of our military levels and organizations among our nations within the Alliance. Some nations seem to find this part unnecessary, at least from the tactical level perspective. Why should we disrupt or fine-tune war machinery with other instruments of power, civilian activities and resources? What could they possibly offer to our converging effects through collaboration? However, from a smaller state like Norway, this makes perfectly sense, at least within the land domain. Partly, this is what we call the total defense concept. We actually rely on this part when it comes to resources and effects created by civilian logistics, national medical and health services, transportation and infrastructure, not to mention the telecom infrastructure. These are a few examples, and several others could have been mentioned as well. Partly, this is the use of non-military instruments of power like diplomacy, information and economic resources to influence a situation. The central idea is that all resources at hand for a nation should be utilized the best possible way. This has been our strategy throughout the Cold War and has been revitalized as late as in uh, 2018. The revitalized concept, called Support and Cooperation, is also available uh, at Norwegian Ministry of Defense webpage. In the military advice of the Chief of Defense to our government this year, we see a, mo uh, a model confirming this comprehensive logic. On top, we have five domains, to the left, we have allied partners and organizations. And to the right, we see the total defense with assets such as police, health services, and industry, among others. <coughs> Third and last, there are five enablers to ensure NATO's multi-domain operations model will work and evolve. This enabling part consists of a data-centric approach, exploitation of technology advantage, command and control set up for a multi-domain environment, availability of right people with the right skill sets in command and wind staffs, 
and investment in technologically enabled training at both national and NATO levels. <coughs> to be fair, all these enabl enablers will probably be and are already important in any concept established in our time. I understand this enabling part as an acknowledgement of the evolution of a global society as a whole. Therefore, they can't be ignored by any relevant military force contributing to security for any nation or alliance. To conclude, my understanding of MDO, NATO's MDO, has to be appreciated by the whole alliance to evolve. It's a holistic concept. It's accepting a people-centric and a global understanding of our operational environment, in line with our modern Western society as a whole. Arguments about MDO concept just being the Emperor's new clothes may even be unfortunate for NATO's cohesion. Sorry. In the Norwegian army, we also showed some foresight with regards to MDO. In 2021, we established a development concept called the Army of Tomorrow. In short, this concept concludes in a very similar way as NATO's MDO. We call it the Integrated Framework. It is an inter-agency, inter-governmental way of conducting operations at the tactical level. My take on our concept, with reference to the diagram, uh, is that we are somewhere between the NATO and the UK conceptual understanding. So, that was a quick talk through of NATO's MDO concept, the way I understand it, from a Norwegian army perspective. Then, as mentioned in the beginning, the framework of my presentation will be the national security policy. Uh, the Norwegian defense concept has three main elements, as uh, confirmed by the current uh, MOD white paper, Long-Term Plan for Defense, and mentioned yesterday by Major General Lerik. It's a strong national defense with national ability to, fen to defend Norway by Norwegian armed forces. It's the ability to be part of the collective defense provided by NATO, and it's bilateral support and reinforcements from our closest allies. In order to make this defense concept able to prevent conflict, both deterrence and reassurance are the main effects in peacetime. I will therefore briefly explain the continuity that has characterized Norwegian security policy since no uh, Norway as one of the 12 founding members contributed to establish NATO as an alliance in 1949. <coughs> as a small nation, Norway has been conducting a policy of balancing both deterrence and reassurance. This is a well-established line of policy across the political scale among governments in Norway throughout the Cold War. This policy has survived into this millennium and is more valid than ever due to the current security situa situation in Europe. For Norway as a smaller nation, our deterrence towards Russia is mainly relying on our allies and NATO often referred to as extended deterrence, as discussed yesterday by Echevarri. However, within our security policy, we have balanced the deterrence we established by becoming a NATO member in 1949 with the policy of reassurance. Reassurance is traditionally understood as a form of communication the same way as deterrence is, but contrary to most other nations, who reassure their own allies that they will receive the support if needed, Norway has traditionally directed this kind of communication towards our possible opponent and not our allies. The Norwegian way of conducting reassurance policy was to make sure that the Soviet Union and now Russia understand that our armed forces and our alliance only has defensive intentions. We should not be understood as a threat to Russia. In 1949, we were the only NATO country sharing a land border directly to the Soviet Union. The risk of triggering, triggering an enemy preemptive attack into Norwegian territory based on seemingly offensive intentions on our side was the main motivation for this policy. Nowadays, due to the location of the Northern Joint Fleet Strategic Command, as you heard just now, and the nuclear capabilities, we still find it wise to ensure them that we do not pose a threat. We don't want them to establish the so-called bastion defense. <laughs> The central elements of the Norwegian reassurance policy has mainly been self-imposed restrictions. Examples are Norwegian military base policy. This was established by our government alongside the establishment of NATO and restricts other nations' possibility to establish bases on Norwegian soil 
except when we are attacked or being threatened by imminent attacks. The declaration was written by our government and was addressed directly to the Soviet Union. Another example of self-imposed restriction is our nuclear policy, the policy of foreign arrivals in Norwegian ports and the guidelines for military activity in Norway. Recently, a PhD candidate at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs established a nuanced understanding of this reassurance. He described these classical examples of the Norwegian reassurance as passive, thus introducing the understanding of the opposite, active reassurance. With this understanding of active reassurance, he includes cooperation and inter interaction with the opponent, for instance, through organizations and institutions, both military and civilian. Examples of these are the organized cooperation among pe people in the communities at both sides of the border between Norway and Russia. Other examples of such cooperation between nations could be activities in Arctic Council, cooperation on fishing policy in the Barents Sea, and constructs like uh, the Incidents at Sea Agreement. All these are examples of policies and activities that are traditionally not understood as elements of our security policy. However, they should be included, and we should search for even more elements to include in our toolbox called reassurance. If we actually fear that preemptive actions such as the best in defense is a possible scenario. And this is where I will try to link the application of the multi-domain operation concept at the tactical level to our security policy. This conference is discussing large formation at the tactical level in a Nordic context. A view uh, at our map in an allied perspective, where no borders are dividing Finland, Sweden and Norway, shows a quite clear terrain analysis, as Trygve mentioned yesterday. There is plenty of space for several divisions to fight in our area of operations. A Scandinavian or Nordic core would be a valid framework for the conduct of land warfare in this area. Moreover, the terrain has still room for more. This is, to my understanding, justifying that a trustworthy deterrence policy in our area must consist of plan plans with a larger land formation, or even several land formations. And I would be surprised if our plans within the Alliance, when they are ready, will come to a different conclusion. In the future, an allied land force will have to operate within the understanding of NATO's MDO concept. A major contribution for any land force, national or allied, operating in Norway will be the total defense assets, which have to be synchronized as a co collaboration to the joint operation. At the tactical level, total defense assets has to be coordinated by the higher tactical level. The use of other non-military instruments of power will also normally take place at the strategic, operational and higher tactical levels. The complexity of coordinating land operations combined with the necessity of coordinating with non-military actors requires a headquarters with enough capacity to plan and conduct operations with a variety of military and civilian entities within multiple time frames. This is beyond the capability of a fighting unit such as a brigade or even a lean warfighting division. This means there is need for an ability to establish a land component command at the core or division level to synchronize such assets and actions. This point was also made yesterday when Major General Deakin said that one of the roles for a core HQ is the ability to nest its tactical planning with total defense assets. Assets. This makes, in my perspective, NATO's MDO concept valid for the tactical level. Elements of this coordination will also have to take place at lower levels. This applies in particular to total defense actors and less to other actors involved in wielding non-military instruments of power. In Norway, we already do this synchronization at all levels, including at the tactical level, where it, ex where it is executed mainly by our home guard districts. 
A home guard district is a command level equivalent to a brigade level of command when it comes to cross-functional responsibilities, but not with the same capabilities for combined arms operations. As Lieutenant Colonel Anger described excellent yesterday, a home guard um, district's main capability is its distributed location at the local level and its ability to cooperate directly with other government institutions at the lower tactical level. For instance, this level coordinates directly with the police districts, all the other lo lower level and local elements from other departments as well is usually cooperating with a home guard district level, usually coordinated through a county governor or statsforalter in Norwegian. When an area of operations covers several divisions, home guard districts, police districts and other regional arrangements and government services, the highest tactical level involved to coordinate and synchronize all efforts within our AOO should be the land component commander. Within the operations framework, the Norwegian army relies on this collaboration to sustain and support our operations throughout the whole area of responsibility. It is mainly conducted by home guard districts, but directed through command and control by the Norwegian land command center in the army. And at uh, headquarters, comparable to a division headquarters, but only with limited land component command capabilities and capacity. Even within an allied framework, we would sustain operations the same way. It should be like that for an allied land component commander conducting land operations on Norwegian soil as well. Therefore, that allied land component commander should be Norwegian in my point of view. This could also be done in the context of a Scandinavian or Nordic Corps, where the commanding officer, the chief of staff and deputy chief of staffs on a rotational basis are shared among flag officers from the involved countries. The ability to have national or Nordic command in larger allied formation should be considered as reassuring towards Russia. If we assess that the Russians consider Norwegian and Nordic armed forces and policy poses a lesser threat than American or British, for instance, then the Norwegian or Nordic land component commander would be preferable. The ambition at every tactical command level should be to have the ability to include allied formations under Norwegian or Nordic command for the same reason. To conclude my presentation, I think the MDO concept is valid at the tactical level. In Norway, it relates to the total defense concept and use of non-military instruments of power. In combination with the total defense concept and its application at the tactical level, MDO also contributes directly to our security policy of reassuring. Especially if we are able to establish national or Nordic command of allied operations on Norwegian or Nordic territory. Conceptually, we are already thinking this way in the Army through our development concept and its integrated framework. In the MDO perspective, a Nordic commanding general in the land domain would have the ability and credibility to exploit total defense assets and coordinate non-military instruments of power with local governments in a way where it has a reassuring effect on Russia. If a non-Nordic general was given the same responsibility, including access to our total defense assets and non-military instruments of power, it would probably be seen as less reassuring from the outside. For this reason, it will also perhaps be difficult to accept for Nordic politicians and might lead to capabilities and cooperation not being offered for coordination or control to the same extent possibly reducing the ability to conduct a holistic multi-domain operations concept. As several speakers of this conference have stated, the higher tactical level like core fights the deep, synchronize the close and enable the rear. I think the MDO concept is conceptually supporting our understanding to integrate total defense assets and time as an enabler in the rear. And in a wider perspective, in the near future, we might be able to find good possibilities where they can directly support the close and deep as well. There are of course some current challenges, at least in Norway, with this approach to MDO as an allied model sustained by the total defense and utilization of non-military instruments of power and the ability to exploit this as a tool at the tactical level. At the moment, the individual and organizational knowledge and skills in our army of conducting large formation operations needs to be improved. But ongoing projects in the army has already identified this gap and are already looking for solutions to fill it. This conference as well is expanding our knowledge 
So we'd also like to thank Trygve and the Military Academy for arranging this conference. But to fill such a gap of knowledge and skills, it will take some time. In the meanwhile, we must focus on the abilities we need to establish and ensure we are moving in the right direction. The current NATO MDO concept and allied doctrines will help us to maintain the right direction. And if we do so, I'm sure we will succeed. And consequently, I look forward to work in the future Scandinavian or Nordic Corps sometime in the near future. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to introduce Professor Siv Hoem, a dedicated researcher at the Norwegian Cyber Engineering School. With a background in academi academia and uh, practical experience, she is at the forefront of this critical uh, domain. In her presentation titled Cyberspace Operations in the Land Domain, Why the Core Command Should Be uh, the Coordinating Entity of Cyber Operations Within the Land Domain, Dr. Uh, Professor Hoem uh, delves into the need for coordination between cyberspace and land operations. The nexus is becoming uh, increasingly essential as cyberspace operation can significantly impact various aspects of warfare in the land domain. Professor Hoem emphasizes that uh, the importance of core command as the coordinating entity for cyber operations within the land domain. Her research sheds lights on the dynamics of this intersection, where the military uh, interaction with civilian society plays a pivotal role in operational success. We are privileged to have Professor Siv Hoemb as a distinguished contrib contributor to this conference. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hoemb to the stage. My research has mainly been in the civilian area. So what I'm going to talk about today is my experience from the civilian area. And as you also see, that includes oil and gas, harsh environment offshore, uh, the beautiful northern lights, but with the power grid. And as you've or seen earlier, up north, we have power lines. We have hardly anything else in a lot of cases. <laughs> um, before I start, a uh, disclaimer um, officially. So. What all I'm saying, all I'm discussing, all opinions are my own. So if you have or anything to blame me for, please go ahead in the break. I will be av available during lunch. Um, to the case of cyberspace operations. And since this is a slightly change of topic, I thought that I'd include a few of the definitions in the beginning. So cyberspace, cyberspace operations, and defensive and offensive cyberspace. So cyberspace here uh, comprises, is a global domain, and it consists of all interconnected communication, information technology, and other electronic systems, networks, and their data including those that are separate or independent, uh, which process, store, and transmit data. And as you saw on the first slide, an oil platform is part of the cyberspace. It has network, it has electronic devices. If, even if it's not connected to the internet or to any other network, it is a cyberspace. Cyberspace operations, uh, that would be actions in or through cyberspace intended to preserve friendly freedom of actions in cyberspace and or to create effects to achieve commander's objectives. So defensive and offensive, the difference between the two, which you are very well aware of, from my point in a cyberspace setting, it's the difference between maintaining my ability to move in cyberspace and to execute my operations in cyberspace, which would be the defensive part and the offensive part using the cyberspace to achieve a goal. Uh, and then later in the presentation, um, I'm going to walk you through an offensive cyberspace operation performed by Russia on Ukraine in 2015 to some technical detail as well, because that's important in this area of, uh, of uh, well, domain in this case. So 
uh, operation in cyberspace. As you see there, um, cyberspace is are comprised of a physical layer, logical layer, and cyber per uh, personal layer. Uh, the physical layer um, is comprised of computer, you know, physical uh, components, servers, your laptop, uh, but also intelligent electronic devices and remote terminal units. In a power grid, those are very important pieces of equipment. They are intelligent, but they have no ability to protect themselves. That's the state of the fact, which Russian have, Russians have actually exploited multiple times. When you move to the logical domain, uh, some people still think that if you have a physical server, uh, it has an operating system and applications, and you execute all of the actions on this physical server. In the modern domain with cloud solutions, everything is virtual. You'll have a virtual machine that could actually exist in Russia and US at the same time, depending on the infrastructure. So if there were no rules, Microsoft, Google, Amazon could distribute the data anywhere, by definition. That is, so that, that the connection between the logical and the physical layer is blurrier than it's been earlier. And then you'd have the cyber per persona. And this layer is interesting because it, it makes it hard to do attribution. Because one person or one organization can have multiple identities. And one ad ad identity could be multiple organizations. You have no way of knowing. It's easy to hide in the cyberspace, which makes it's difficult. It makes it complicated um, both to detect indication of compromise, but it also makes it complicated for in forensics and inf uh, investigation, because the physical equipment where you see the consequence might not be linked to the logical layer that's been used to execute the consequence. And you might never figure out who actually performed the action or where they came from. So um, cyber operation used in the war in Ukraine, and this is not just after the war broke out, but also earlier, so previous and leading up to it. Um, observations, and, and I'm citing to you uh, reports there, the NISA threat landscape for 2023, and but also uh, cyber oper operations during the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, an excellent report, both of them are excellent. Uh, what they state is that you've seen a lot of series of disturbing, not destructive cyberspace operations. You've seen distributed and IRA service attack, that's not new, that's been there for ages. Uh, you've seen deception type of operations and you've also seen Sometimes, um, I would say, structured disturbing of governmental services and banking services, and you use that to confuse people or to um, make them disbelieve that you ha are in control. These attacks, pardon me for saying so, uh, are fairly easy to execute. That's not, and again, pardon me for saying so, not rocket science. Uh, We've seen no persistent cyberspace operations outside of what I assume, and also the Norwegian threat, cybersecurity threat reports uh, assume, uh, that there, that there has to be espionage or other intelligence operations. And if you read the Norwegian threat landscape report, it says that Russia has placed, we don't know where, insiders so capable, persons inside of strategic companies and governmental organizations or support organizations uh, in Norway. And the reason why they would do that is related to Black Energy 3, End Destroyer, NonPetya, and End Destroyer 2. Those are four malwares, very important malwares. Black Energy 3 was used in 2015. The 2015 cyber attack on the Ukraine power grid uh, took down 23 uh, power lines, but more than 23 power lines, but 23 very important power lines. 
in and around Kiev. Uh, the attack attacked three um, power companies, which in Norway are called distribution um, system operators, so Elvia, Lede, uh, regional operators, uh, and did not attempt to do anything on the TSO level, so the transmission system operator level. So Fingrid or Svenska Kraftnet in Sweden or Statnet in Norway. But in Destroyer 1 and 2 did. Black Energy 3 was coordinated, lots of people involved, uh, and we will go through the details of the attack in a little while. Um, it required a lot of resources, not very sophisticated, even though the effect was power out outage. In Destroyer, which came out in 2016, uh, where a, <coughs> let me just say, experimentation of how to automate an attack on multiple substations on the transmission level, and that's the high voltage level, because the effect of that would be a lot more than just taking out 23 distribution lines. It was not succeeded uh, or successful. In Destroyer 2, which was discovered in 2022, um, is moving towards being successful. The reason why I believe that is because they have uh, expanded their knowledge. Inside of the malware, uh, there are intelligence related to the protocols used in substations, which probably don't make any sense to any of you, but they're called IEC 61850, uh, IEC 104, <laughs> and then so on. And they have a configuration where you would insert a fixed IP address. And that's part of the reason why Industrial didn't succeed in 2016, because the piece of equipment in a substation they have fixed IP addresses, but they have no protection, so anyone can masquerade with an IP address, and the other end would execute the command, basically. Um, non petya you probably have already uh, heard of. Uh, I was working in the drilling industry at the time in Houston, Texas. Uh, had a meeting with Maersk, and you probably already know what happened to Maersk uh, during non petya uh, they had all of their logistics and all of their uh, ships uh, in various locations but unable to get them to port because of ransomware and encryption across the whole company, including their domain controllers, which prevented them from actually recover their systems uh, within a few days, which could have been possible. And eventually they found a computer that had uh, the domain, uh, so had all of the users for Maersk uh, in Africa because of a power outage in Africa, which meant that that machine had not been synchronized. That was the only, only uh, available um, capability for Maersk to actually restore their systems. Because if you don't know anything about any of the users, it's really, really a long process to rebuild everything. Um, if you see from all of these four, Black Energy in Destroyer, Nampetya in Destroyer 2, they're all executed by Sandworm or Voodoo Bear. Uh, bear. That is a group that we're going to uh, get a little bit more familiarized with. But I just wanted to mention before we moved, move forward the Solovin attack. So the scare here. And the scare when I work with the oil and gas industry and the power grid industry is supply chain attacks. And the Solovin attack is the one that scares most people. It's because it's not detectable. The reason why it's not detectable is because it is actually embedded before you compile the code. So when you uh, receive an update, uh, it is embedded. It is part of the code. It's already been approved. There's no way for you to know what's inside it. So that's how they executed. So they got into the source code. Um, so we haven't, to sort of to conclude here, we, we haven't seen a massive set of destructive cyber attacks related to the 
war in Ukraine. We haven't seen lots of substations being bombarded from cyberspace. What we still don't know is whether there actually is a new Solovin, Solovin type of operations in the work. We don't know where and if Russia have embedded uh, software or code and where it would be located and what it would be doing. That's the part that we, that's the big unknown. So is there a new solo wind attack in the works? And if so, where is it? What will it do? What we do know is what the Indestroyer 2 will do if it succeeds. We do just don't know what the next supply chain attack is. So that's the part that keeps me up at night, basically. So this is the Sandworm team. Um, I've studied this one quite extensively. And the reason why I've studied this extensively be is because I'd like Norway to be just as good and better. So what we've done in terms of research is that we've set up a substation system at the Institute of Energy Technique, and we have mimicked all of the capabilities that we've seen Sandworm use. And the reason why we do that is to be able to detect or build better detection mechanisms. Because if you don't know what you're looking for, there's no way for you to detect it. So, uh, before I dive into the power grid attack in 2015 in Ukraine, just wanted to mention what advanced persistent threats from a cyberspace operation is. Uh, an advanced persistent threat here is a low and slow attack. So you can hide in cyberspace. It's a lot more different than being out in the open in the northern Finland or northern Sweden or northern Norway, where there's not a lot of vegetation. In cyberspace, you can hide. So APTs are characterized by being low. They stay hidden. You can't detect them. They stay hidden. Sometimes they don't do anything for a while. And then they do something, and then they do don't do anything for a while. So they basically mimic the system that they're in. Slow is that they use time, because if they're noisy, like a denial service attack, you're going to see it. If they basically just read a little bit of information now and then, and then they send a little information back to their command now and then, then you won't detect it, because there's a lot of other things going on in the system. Targeted, they, as you've, we've seen on Sandworm, they build capabilities to destroy critical infrastructure, for instance, which is what Sandworm does. Sandworm is building up the capability to take down a full substation and all of the power lines connected to that substation. If you do that in Oslo, there's a few substations. I'd like them not to have this malware inside because it would take down most of Oslo and the southern part of Norway basically. So uh, that's the targeted part. And, and the, the, the various APTs in Russia, they have different capability skills that they're building up. Persistence is that they will maintain a foothold. They'll be there for a long time before. And the reason for that is that if you want to be successful, you need to know exactly the way, in this case, a substation is configured. If you don't do that, you won't succeed. Even though the equipment isn't protected, it is still very, pardon me for saying so, dumb. So it will only respond to the commands that it's pre-configured to respond to. But it won't care who is sending the command, but it will only respond to the command set that it's familiar with, that you configured it with. Um, the part of maintaining foothold for your next attack, or just to gather more information and send more information out, uh, that we've seen quite a lot of as well. And in some of these attacks, this is a capability that's necessary in order to succeed. So, um, 2015, this is my world. This is called the Purdue level. <laughs> it starts from the physical level and then all, of, uh, uh, all the way up to internet. It is cyberspace. Um, down here, we might have sensors, industrial, Internet of Things, various pieces of equipment. 
And then you have something called the plant DM set, which is basically a landing zone between your enterprise network, so your office computer, and a substation, for instance. And you have your office computer, then you have another landing zone before internet. And the, what I call the landing zone or the demilitarized zone is the same as in a military jargon. It is where we uh, disconnect, cut communication, and then re-establish communication. And it al it's also where we can do monitoring quite well. So Black Energy 3, which is a, um, I shouldn't say this, this is just because it's my profession. I, it's a fairly fantastic malware. Uh, in Destroyer 2 is even better. The part that makes it good is that it's a framework. It's not a, just a virus, it is a framework. It has multiple mod modules in it. And one of the first modules is to get inside using phishing emails. And then stay there, I get into a computer, somebody clicked my link, and I'm sitting there, I'm watching, you know, your username and password, username and password, you know, and I'm, I, I might figure out the IP address to the SCADA system or the substation, and then I just be, jump to another computer with this user, and then I sit there, username and password, username and password. And eventually, I have everything I need, and I move down to my actual target. And in this case here, uh, there are two parts of it. One is performed in the SCADA system, so the control center, the dispatch center, the system supporting the operator, operating the substation, operating the power grid. They basically um, manipulated the HMI, so the operator screen that, they, that you look at, and the mouse. So basically the operator is sitting there looking at the screen, seeing that breakers are being opened, and then the mouse is moving on the screen and he isn't touching the mouse, which is pretty scary if you experience it, I have to say. And the other part is that they download a new firmware, so new code that told the remote terminal unit, so the computer that the operator communicate with, uh, it had new operations. So whatever you would do to it, it would just do what it, the sandworm had programmed it to do. And that was to open breakers. If you open a breaker out in the switchyard, uh, there is no power on the power line anymore. As simple as that. And that's exactly what happened. Three com network com or power com companies at the same time within 30 minutes and 33 important power lines. More than that was actually taken out, but those were very important for the power in Kiev at that point. And as you've seen here, there are two stages, and an APT is usually defined by two stages. One is to get into the target, the other part is to actually execute the attack. Um, moving on, having said all of this, why is it important that if we look at the North Kalot, Northern Finland, Northern Sweden, Northern Norway, uh, and we've seen the roads, we've seen pictures of the terrain, and this is a picture of the power grid. You don't see a lot of lines going up in the north. This is a very critical and very sensitive part of the grid. And it has to do with that is not the highest populated area in Norway as well. Uh, and the Norwegians that have followed the, the political debate related to Melkeøya and the new power line and power production in the northern part of Norway to serve uh, Melkeøya, which is a gas and oil and gas uh, um, site, uh, probably also knows that we don't have a lot of production to draw on. So in this area, uh, not a lot of things need to go wrong before it will be dark. And, and also in some cases, um, for the winner, uh, the Finnish government, for instance, will actually set up a schedule for outage 
because there's not enough production if it's power shortage. So in the middle of winter, you might not have power and you will know of it in front so that you can prepare for it. That's another, it's another case if this happens all of a sudden. Um, so going back, we've, we've discussed the Ukraine power grid attack from 2015. It's coordinated. Uh, there were no indication of compromise. No indication of compromise. So if I'd been standing beside that substation or one of those substations in Kyiv, what I've been of experience is the big uh, noise, almost like somebody is shooting. Because the breaker is held by gas under pressure, and then when that releases, it's, uh, it's depending on the size, it's almost like a small bomb. So it, it is enough noise for you to jump. So that's the only indication that something was happening. Because the operators in this case didn't know anything um, until power was out. The customers weren't able to call because the call centers were actually bombarded by denial of service attack, which was a sort of amplifying attack, slowing down the actual uh, response in this case, and the response in this case is to manually operate the substation. It is your only way to get it back online. You actually manually have to get people to the substation and run the substation by buttons in some cases. Uh, Stuxnet, if you haven't heard of that, that is the first APT. Uh, happened in 2010. It is um, not to say anything about attribution, but what it did was that it destroyed hundreds and hundreds of centrifuges uh, in an uh, Iranian nuclear facility. Again, obfuscation of the operator, and this one was done in a, a lot better way. It actually injected itself in the middle, and it sent uh, signals up to the operator that everything is fine, you know, the spinning uh, speed is fine, it's the same. And at the same time, uh, there's a little computer called PLC, Programming Logic Controller, that then sends instruction, you know, increase speed, increase speed, increase speed. And the only way in this case to see is that they are getting reports that centrifuges are exploding without you knowing anything. That's basically the Stuxnet part. So. When at so currently we're able to detect and deter uh, a lot of uh, cyberspace operations, we're not able to do that when it comes to critical infrastructure as of yet. Um, the lessons that we've learned from these attacks is that they are carefully planned. They're carefully, over many, many years, being placed where they need to be placed in order to be executed. And the first time we've ever heard of it is when something goes wrong. So if in Destroyer 2, which right now uh, bears in it the actual protocols needed to execute this automatically, has it configured and placed in multiple substations, executed at the same time, you're gonna hear it locally before anyone know anything. You're gonna hear a big explosion. That's basically the way that you will know that something's happened. And that's also my fear when I'm at the substation, I don't wanna hear any noise. Definitely don't wanna hear any noise unless I know that something has been planned in terms of testing. Um, what you see here on the side is something called an attack navigator. It, the um, Mitre has developed the attack ontology, which has looked at all of these advanced persistent threats, all of the Russian actors, and they've divided into the various capabilities that they have and the order that these capabilities have been executed. So that is a very good database in order to uh, grasp and understand capabilities and start developing your own capabilities. Um, cyberspace operations, you know, as I told you earlier, you know, it has the physical domain, it has the logical domain, and there are people or organizations masking on the cyberspace. The physical domain 
who have to be observed locally. And in order to do anything with it, it will also require a close collaboration between the military and the civilian side for total defense. Because I would uh, bet that not a lot of you would know how to get a substation back online. Uh, and not a lot of people in Norway actually knows that. It is a very specific knowledge. Um, what you would need in terms of support, though, uh, is, I would say, the forensics, the intelligence side of it, where you look at the logical traces and the people or the APTs behind, which is an intelligence uh, activity to follow sandworm, to follow what they do, so that if you happen to be in the northern Norway or northern Sweden or northern Finland and you have a power outage just after a big explosion, you will be able to know that that might have happened and call somebody that will figure out who did what because you would need help in order to figure out how do I put the substation back online. So there needs to be a coordination, but it has to be coordinated from the people that actually understand the area that this happened in. Because as, as you saw here, the other thing about the power grid is that you can't just put a substation back online again because it might actu actually have rippling effect which will then cause a blackout in another part of the country. So, so this is highly, it needs to be highly coordinated. Um, to conclude, this is a picture. Uh, there's, there's lots of cartoons from these uh, cyberspace operations. And this particular one I find a little amusing because I'm sure some of you have already been there. Do we have a backup? Like, my dad uh, experienced this during the Chernobyl virus many, many years ago, which basically counted down from 30, and then your screen went black. And no data, no disk, no nothing. And at that point, uh, he wished he had a backup. And the same here. But when the centrifuge is gone, you need to physically replace it. It's not about code that needs to be uh, restored to any location. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to introduce Major Darren Johnson, a s distinguished uh, officer and scholar from the United States Military Academy at West Point. Major Johnson brings over 12 years of service in the U.S. Army with two combat deployments uh, to Afghanistan. Today, Major Johnson will present on the uh, historical case study of Operation Husky, the Allied invasion of Sicily in 1943. This pivotal campaign serves as a crucible of learning for the United States Army, revealing challenging, uh, challenges in synchronizing air, sea, and land operations at the divisional and core levels of command. His presentation, titled the Operation Husky, a historical case study for the contemporary U.S. Army, draws insightful parallels between the complex nature of 21st century conflict, uh, emphasizing the importance of involving partner nations in a joint environment. Major Johnson's background, which includes a master's degree in history, with a focus on the Holocaust and the Allied liberation uh, experience, positions him as a valuable resource in understanding the historical lessons that can shape the present day U.S. Army planning. We are honored to have Major Dar Darren Johnson. Please, sir, the, sh the yeah. floor <laughs> is yours. Great, thank you, uh, Thomas and Colonel Schmidt. Thank you for the opportunity to, to join you today and distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for, th for this, this opportunity. Um, it's quite a unique uh, experience to give you a, a history lesson right after lunch, which has its dangers. Um, so, so bear with me. I want to be able to give, give Jim at least a captive audience by the time he speaks uh, later on. Um, but as a disclaimer, like everyone else has, uh, has stated, uh, you know, th these are my views, my thoughts, not the Department of Defense, um, the U.S. Army, or, or West Point. Um, 
And so um, we'll go ahead and go ahead and begin. So this is where we're going to at least attempt to go. This is this is the goal. This is the plan. Um, like really any kind of historical research, you, you need to start with a question. And for this, I really, you know, in, in understanding the the intent for uh, this conference, really two, two questions really that I, I came up with as I'm looking into the research, looking into uh, to doctrine. One, you know, how does the United States Army fight at the division and core level? And this, this is new. Um, this is coming out of a 20 plus years of contingency operations in which the brigade, the brigade combat team is the, the sole driver of, of operations. Um, but now being, being that at the division level and the core level is being involved, and I know we had that um, the brief yesterday from Major General Tomlinson, and so I'm not going to reiterate anything that he said, um, but we'll get into that kind of late, later on. Um, but as a historian, I guess, um, in, in what, what I'm doing currently uh, in the Army, you know, what lessons from Operation Husky can be applied to our formations today? And so we should look at history as a lens of, you know, what, what happened in the past, and can we draw lessons from it? No situation is exactly the same, um, but we have to understand that the challenges of coalition warfare, combined arms um, operations, developing a team, that's a challenge that we've faced in the past. So this isn't anything new. Uh, we just have new challenges that really that, 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 that uh, we have to deal with. So we'll talk about Operation Husky first, discuss some of the lessons, um, highlight how the contemporary, contemporary U.S. Army is uh, postured to fight, and then um, how can we find some conclusions based out of all of that. And so in many ways, you know, why Operation Husky? What I would say is um, in, in, uh, in many circles within the United States, the thought is World War II started when Pearl Harbor was bombed on December 7th, 1941, right? And so we know that that's, that's not true. But then the next event is is Operation Overlord, the invasion of Normandy, right? And so th there's, there's no way that the United States, and I would say uh, the, the allies in general, get to Normandy if they don't experience an Operation Husky. And that's really where we can find some lessons that we can draw from. Um, and so we at the United States Military Academy, we look at, we, we use Husky as a, as a case study in which, which all 4,400 cadets uh, they cycle through um, the course that I teach, the really history of the military art, which essentially is a 20, 20th, 21st century military history course. And they are focusing on Operation Husky this year. And so I have the, the, the pleasure of, of grading about 50 papers here in the next few weeks, about eight pages. And so I'm really looking forward to that. But um, this, you know, this, this is a great really segue for that. So looking really at the strategic level of Operation Husky, we have to look at really the origins of the alliance between the British and the Americans. We can go back to uh, you know, World War I, but that interwar period is, is really a unique time in which the U.S. is not involved in um, uh, declaring war until they are attacked in, in December of 41. So we can look at the Atlantic Charter. We can look at the Lend-Lease, and, and, and before that, the cash and carry system that the uh, Americans established with, with the British. But in looking at Husky and how we got here, we really start with the Arcadia Conference, uh, January 1942. Really, that's where we set the conditions where the, the strategic viewpoint from the Americans and the British, in conjunction with the Soviet Union, is a Germany-first campaign. But how do you get to Germany? The, the lessons from, from Dunkirk, the lessons from the, the failed Dieppe raid, are fresh in the minds of the, of the, of the British military at this point. And so in looking at wh where do we attack, where we, it's a little bit more of risk averse in some ways, um, this is where you see a contention between the coalition. And what I would argue is you can't have a coalition without compromise. And so the American military leaders are advocating for what would be um, named Operation Roundup, is the cross-channel invasion into, into France from England, which, which never happens. But they advocate for an immediate attack, let's go. Uh, in typical American brashness, let's just let's just go make it happen, right? Um, but the British, and and, and le led by Winston Churchill, he's advocating for let's go on more of a periphery strategy, uh, in the the often called uh, soft underbelly of Europe. Let's go through North Africa. Let's 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 set the conditions. Let's cut our teeth in working as a coalition, and uh, eventually, the, the Americans acquiesce against really much of the thought from the American uh, military brass, but. 
that's where we get into Operation Torch, the invasion of, of North Africa. Simultaneously, the second battle of El Alamein by uh, General Montgomery is, or Field Marshal Montgomery is, um, is, is finding success. The Americans are landing at, uh, in, a, in a, um, a French Morocco and Algeria, right? And so Operation Torch for the Americans is a, really a crucible of learning. There's a lot of challenge that they face. They don't necessarily learn all the right lessons, um, but nonetheless, they, they reach Tunisia. And uh, the next step really in looking at the strategic level is the Casablanca Conference, uh, January of 1943. Um, and so from there, that's where the decision point between the Americans and the British, also understanding that they, they promised a second front to Stalin. And so they, they want to try to appease him, to keep him in the fight, not to seek a separate peace with Germany. And so they advocate for, well, we're already in, in the Mediterranean. Should we just continue on in the Mediterranean or should we try to ro rotate our forces over to back to England for another cross-channel invasion? Once again, Churchill in many ways convinces FDR, we're already here. Let's focus on knocking Italy out of the war. And so at this point, the, 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 the driving decision coming out of the Casablanca conference is a, a unconditional surrender policy with the Axis, with the Japanese, the Italians, and, and the Germans. And coming out of that conference, the, the end state for what Sicily was going to look like, which would eventually be Operation Husky, was one, alleviate pressure on the Soviet Union on the Eastern Front. They're facing vast majority of, of, the, of the German forces, and they are... Uh, um, they're, they're, they're fighting hard, but they, they need a little bit of help. Uh, that's really the first one. The second one is, is to uh, secure lines of communication within the Mediterranean. And so it, Sicily, where it's situated, is right in the middle of the Mediterranean. So it's hard to, to, to navigate to the Suez Canal, uh, hard to navigate to uh, provide lend-lease aid to the Soviet Union, with Sicily sitting, there, sitting right there. And then lastly, to try to knock Italy out of the war. And so... Um, those are really, that's really the end state in, 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 uh, in developing the plan for Operation Husky. Um, but the, the activity in, in North Africa doesn't come out without, come with, 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 uh, without any issues. In a derogatory term, the British describe the Americans as our Italians, um, which, is, which is used soon after the Castorine Pass incident in which the Americans don't don't perform the best, right? And so this is, these are the, the lessons that are being learned that's, that's going to carry forward. Um, so all that being said, at the strategic level, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. And in many ways, it takes a lot of failure. That's where the lessons are, 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 are learned the hardest. But in many ways, those can be the, the, the longest lasting. And uh, I always appreciate this quote. Uh, you know, Winston Churchill is very, very quotable. Uh, but I think that this really touches on a... Uh, um, a, a key attribute of the relationship between uh, the Americans and the British um, at, at this point in the war. So transitioning now to the operational level, uh, I can thank our uh, Department of History cartographer for, for developing this. And so it gives a, a, a pretty, pretty good idea about what, what the planning, what the idea was behind this plan. Um, on the first day of the, the invasion, July 10th, this is larger than Operation Overlord. This is seven divisions, as opposed to six um, in, in, uh, in Operation Overlord uh, in, in Normandy. In, in looking at this, it comes with a lot of natural challenges that, that the Americans and the British have to, have to try to solve. In, in identifying um, Sicily as the next step, uh, you can look into um, some of the deception operations, Operation Mincemeat, e excellent... Uh, deception operation that, that does work, that does divert German forces away from Sicily into the Balkans, um, and the thought that maybe Sardinia, might, that might be the, the next location for the, uh, for the Allies. But naturally, you look at the Port of Messina, located right here, that's, that's definitely key terrain, right? You need to secure that. Um, another aspect, especially when you're looking at into the, the joint environment, the, the, the sea component, the air component, the land component, for, for the Navy, they're advocating, we need to disperse these, 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 uh, these landing locations. Obviously, this, this is what they, they eventually settle on, is the southeast corner. But the Navy and the Air Force advocated for, let's just send the Americans up here 
because there's some ports that are valuable. Palermo, that's the capital of Sicily. That, that'd be important. As well as the airfields, th there's, there's a good amount of them here that eventually you need to, to build up your supplies, right? Um, the flight from the airfields in North Africa to Sicily takes, takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of time. It limits the amount of really dwell time that the, uh, the air elements have over Sicily to support the land components. So that's what they're advocating for. It takes until the ninth plan to come to this. It really, it takes Montgomery to say, we don't know what the, really the true disposition and the composition of the, of the enemy on Sicily. Also, we don't really know their morale. They've been bombed incessantly for nearly two months. So that, you know, that, that's going to probably affect them in, in many ways, but we need to consolidate. And so a challenge that they, that the allies face in developing this plan. So again, Casablanca is January, of 1943, this doesn't happen until July, is the major commanders for Operation Husky. In, in somewhat name only, General Eisenhower is the commander, but he never steps foot on Sicily. Um, it's really a, a, a British-led land, sea, and, and air element. Uh, General uh, Harold Alexander is the land commander. Um, General uh, Andrew Cunningham is the uh, um, commander of the, of the naval element, and then uh, um, uh, General Arthur Tedder is, is uh, the commander of the Mediterranean Air Command. And so, and, and they're planning for, for this operation. They're still fighting the fight in Tunisia. It's, the Germans aren't done until May. Um, and so you have many months here in which you have the planning cells are literally 1,600 miles apart. And so th there is an element of you know, in, in, you know, um, you know, decentralizing command, right? So th there's, this is also a different time period. But when you have one planning cell in Cairo and another one in Algiers, it's not synchronized, right? So that those are some, some natural issues that, that, uh, that the allies face in conducting this operation. Um, another aspect here is, is the inner service rivalry. The Army Air Corps wants to be the Air Force, but they're still underneath the Army. And the definitions are up to interpretation of what does air support really mean. The Army Air Corps, U.S. Army Air Corps, evaluates that as that's the deep fight because we're strategic. We, we are looking at the airfields in, on mainland Italy. We're looking at interdicting on the, uh, the supplies on the rail yards. We're looking at bombing the airfields. The Army, the land army, would identify air support as I want you to destroy that tank that's about 200 meters ahead of my position here, right? And so there's, there's some misunderstanding about what does the air support plan look like. And um, to bring forward a, a, a pri primary source here, a British liaison officer with the 7th Army offers a pretty, pretty scathing review of the air element. And I, and I say this with, I appreciate the United States Air Force. I don't have any qualms against them. But at this point, they're making a lot of people mad <laughs> in the planning in the planning phase. Um, all right, so bear with me. So the one this is this is from the the British officer. The one criticism of the Husky U.S. planning, with which I am quite confident the great majority of U.S. military and, and naval commanders would very heartily concur, was the almost complete lack of participation by the Air Force. An air an air plan ultimately arrived and was described by an American general as the most masterful piece of uninformative prevarication totally unrelated to the naval and military joint plan, which would possibly have been published, right? And so that's a pretty bad review um, of the air component. And I, it's surprising to have Army and Navy really hand in hand. Um, we have a football game at about a month or so, and it's, it's not gonna be hand in hand, I guess, up until that point. Um, but at this point, this is the joint fight, right? This is the joint team. Um, and so, the, the Army and the Navy aren't completely lockstep uh, when we get into the, the more of the tactical component. But the plan from launch from North Africa to Sicily, as, as the liaison officer mentioned, was not understood by the land and the Navy component of what does the air support plan look like. And uh, that it, it, you know, has a lot of challenges that the, uh, um, actually, I'm sorry, I'll go back. The, uh, the, uh, for, the, for the tactical element. And so getting more of the, the tactical level. So um, the, the definition of air support was unclear. The support element was relatively unclear. The 
um, the logistics of providing air support is difficult in, in the in the uh, the Army Air Corps um, uh, in, in their in their uh, their in their defense. For every 15 minutes of dwell time above Sicily, the the Germans had about 45 minutes because of that distance between um, North Africa and Sicily. Ultimately, I mean, you can't necessarily fault the Air Force too much because Operation Husky is technically a success, but there's a lot of issues that transpire upon uh, the landing and then getting getting outside the beachhead um, with with German aircraft um, interdicting. Uh, the naval involvement really at the most dangerous part of an amphibious invasion, which which some would argue this is the most um, dangerous operation you can conduct in, in warfare is an amphibious invasion. And to the, in the Army's uh, grand wisdom, they, they asked the Navy not to use naval gunfire to, to prep the objective uh, for the enemy defenses because they wanted to be, have more of a, uh, a surprise uh, to the Italians and the Germans. That, that vast of an armada, you're not surprising anybody. And so the, the lessons that they take away from that are they, they want to push the artillery to get off the beach, and that's going to support, and that's going to expand the, the, the lodgement. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to German and Italian tanks nearly uh, defeat the enemy, the, uh, the U.S. 1st uh, Infantry Division at Jella by coming right down this road because there's no one there to stop them. Um, and so it takes naval gunfire to actually preserve the beachhead, right? And so um, the aspect of learning lessons, the, um, what I've always been told is, is the best and the worst units arrive at a handover because one unit says that this unit's terrible. The other one says, well, we're the best. And so they're, they're terrible. And so learning lessons from each other is something that, that they're not doing well at this point. At this stage in the war in 1943, there's been dozens of amphibious invasions in the Pacific that they haven't looked at any of those lessons learned. The scale is different. But the use of naval gunfire to set the conditions for the, the uh, invading force uh, is not learned. Um, going into mainland Italy, that mistake is, is never made again. Um, and so this is the one instance in which they are, they are seeing the, these lessons and, um, and, and making, making adjustments. The, the, the largest friendly fire incident for the United States military in World War II happened also at, at Sicily. Um, this is... It's uh, the elements of the 82nd Airborne were going to land really where those tanks eventually landed or eventually nearly uh, nearly uh, defeated the uh, U.S. at at Jella. Um, there was a a second airborne drop. This is on July 11th, so it's a day, day and a half or so after the initial initial invasion. Um, roughly 25 C-47 Dakotas with, with paratroopers. Uh, were, were were shot out of the sky by by navy anti air um, elements because the air corridor plan that the that the army air corps developed was not passed down to the the lowest level and so you have an individual gunner who sees who's been who's been been bombed uh, incessantly um, he sees aircraft in the sky it only takes one it takes one soldier one one uh one one seaman to to engage. Um, those aircraft, and then everyone else is going to open up and, and also participate in that. So 410 uh, American paratroopers are killed, um, partly going back to the, 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 the lack of the coordination, right? So you can't look at that incident as just that time. You have to look back at the, to, the totality of the planning process and how it was un, not understood about what, what did the mission actually entail? How's, how's the Air Force supporting that land element? Um, because the, the land element, they're supporting the air by seizing those airfields, right? That's, that's the vital piece that the, that the Americans um, on the land as well as, with, as the British are trying to accomplish. All right, ultimately, getting into some, what are the, some of the lessons that are learned here? The, the co-location of planning, at least in this time period, because I know, you know, in, 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 uh, in hearing the, the, the various discussions, um, we, we, there's new technology, that, that can make that difficult, which we've already talked about um, earlier this morning. But the, the planning staffs moving forward in, in joint environment became co-located, it became a necessity. The um, lack of integrated and effective liaison officers and teams, in, in many ways, they, they, they were non-existent. 
as as discussed by the, the British liaison officer, there was no representative from the from the air component and any of the planning. And so you can't have a, a, a joint plan without that. And ultimately, the joint capabilities were unrealized with what can the Navy provide for the Army um, upon an amphibious invasion. And so um, we see the challenges that are faced during Operation Husky. In many ways, they, they act upon those, and they, they solve that issue in the invasion of Italy as well as into France and, and down the line. Um, but it takes events like this, unfortunately, uh, for, for learning to happen. Um, and, the, and the last thing I think with, with these lessons here are, is what, what I think history teaches us is that the, the human element, the hu human domain in warfare is never going to change. Right? That is a constant within warfare. Uh, the, the domains may be added, right? So cyberspace and space, uh, but there's going to be a person behind that. There's going to be a person acting upon that. And so if we're able to integrate, build the teams, um, understand commander's intent, and be, be able to articulate that um, to a, a gaining uh, echelon or a gaining organization, that's only going to make, um, make it a better product. Um, what I see in, in current U.S. Army doctrine, as well as in some of the, these AARs um, uh, after Operation Husky, um, is the liaison officers, they need to be able to have the confidence and the trust from their sending organization, as well as that gaining organization. And so um, th those are critical components. And so the contemporary U.S. Army, and I know really just hitting on this for a few minutes, we're going to have time for questions at the end, but uh, the force design updates. And so I won't talk about the core level, but the consolidation capabilities at the, at the division level. Um, as, as I mentioned before, the contingency operation the last 20 years for the U.S. Army is focused on the brigade combat team, and now it's going to be at the division level. And so what that, what that does is you can mass fires greater because all those fires have been pulled, pulled up to the division level. Intelligence is going to be more directed um, to the decisive operation, um, as well as uh, the logistics, be able to, to manage that, really creating the, that the division is the primary tactical level that can operate relatively independently with a, with a heavy fires, heavy intelligence, heavy logistics support from the, from the core level. And then, you know, in ultimate divisions being self-deficient or self, self-sufficient. Um, but what I, what I think that really necessitates this is, is the role of a liaison officer in many ways, granted, I don't have in, in based on this room, that much experience in the military, to be honest. Um, but in seeing it, liaison officers is almost a, a throwaway position. Like, I'll just, just send somebody there. And I think that we, we, we do a much better job than, than what was transpired in, in uh, the Second World War. But choosing the right person can make the world of a difference in, in, in building that trust, developing that team, uh, creating that environment uh, in which um, liaison officers can, um, and ba based on Army doctrine, monitor, coordinate, advise and assist. And, uh, and we, we don't necessarily see, see that transpire within Operation Husky. And I think that could be a challenge moving forward for the U.S. Army and, and, and having this different echelon. And what does that look like? And we've talked about, you know, what does a com uh, command post look like at the division level, especially in, in, the, in, the, in the nature of, uh, of the technology at this, at this time. Um, and so that, that's a challenge that, w that we're going to face. In large-scale combat op operations, I mean, that's, uh, you know, I, I've, in my opinion, liaison officers and or teams, depends on what echelon that is, are, are a vital piece to developing that plan, developing that operation in which it can actually be effective. And, uh, and ultimately, in, in, in relation to the, the, you know, the human element, the human domain, um, trust is something that is obviously it's easily lost. It's hard, it's hard to gain that. It takes time. It takes a lot of energy, exercise, operations to develop that. And in the nature of how we do command and staff turnover so rapidly, that's something that's really, really difficult. Um, and so that, that challenge um, will remain, um, much like the human element within, within war. We have the privilege of closing this conference with a highly distinguished speaker who is also contributing to our conference for the third time. We have three speakers that have been there now three times. Uh, Professor Jim Storr is an esteemed 
uh, independent defense consultant with a wealth of expertise uh, will, who will provide the final insight of the day and also of the conference. In the, his presentation titled The Core Level of Command in the British Army in the 21st Century. Prof uh, so 20th. 20th. Sorry, what did I say? 21st. 21st. Sorry, 20th <laughs> century. <laughs> Professor Storr will explore a lesser known aspect of the British military history. Despite the small size of the British uh, regular army, it plays a significant role in conducting warfighting operations at the army and army group levels uh, during the Great War and the Second World War. However, the focus has often overlooked the crucial role of core level operations. Professor Storr's research brings to light the experience of the British Army, uh, which, raised, uh, which raised corps and their headquarters from scratch, conducted num numerous operations and accumulated uh, a wealth of knowledge. This presentation draws on that historical experience to provide a valuable observation for contemporary operations. With his, his, with his extensive background as a former British Army officer and decades of experience in military doctrine, Professor Jim Storr will offer us a unique perspective. Please join me in welc uh, welcoming the last speaker, Professor Jim Storr. Thank you so much. That's what I'll be talking about. Why core? Partly, Trigva Smith asked me to do this because it connects into what he was talking about, the core level of command in the North Cal Calotte and so on and so forth. But I think there's another issue, which is that in military history, you can often find any number of division histories, and some of them are really quite interesting. I effectively do some teaching at the University of Birmingham, which is a center for Great War, meaning First World War studies. And I have heard many great accounts of, for example, the 4th Division at the Battle of the Somme or the 55th West Lancashire Division at the 3rd Battle of Ypres or whatever. You get a lot of that. You get a lot of unit histories. You tend to get campaign or theatre histories, but the core tends to get missed in the middle. And I think it can tell us some, some useful stuff. Why British? Well, there is a wealth of information out there. If this is going to be relevant, then it needs to be uh, an army who has contributed to where NATO is today. It should be, if possible, an army that has gone through all of both world wars. Um, there are some understandable problems. With due respect to some of our colleagues, I think they would say that the so Soviet archives have long since been closed. Um, my former Bundeswehr colleagues, friends I would say, would say, I'm sure there is a great amount of stuff from the German army in the Second World War but they just can't access it. That's not a thing that the Bundeswehr does. So I'm not apologizing for presenting about the British Army, but uh, I think that the, the, the relatively, there is a relatively short list of armies which you could choose. Um, history, and again reflecting something that Darren said. Um, there's two takes on that, and one is uh, Abraham Lincoln, which is uh, the only lessons that you have not learned come from the history books that you haven't read. Um, I think that's a little bit cynical, but uh, another way of, of looking at it is that history, to my mind, is our only good guide to the events of the future, but it's an imperfect mirror. So we have to look at this and say, okay, fine, but what does that actually mean, and how would we apply it in a future context? The volume of information, as I think you'll gather as I go through, in relation because of the, the, the military archives, um, which in the, in the British Army's case are all intact in the National Archives, is massive. So there is a lot of stuff in there, and we're now in the situation where colleagues at, for example, University of Birmingham, or equally, for that matter, uh, King's College London and others, have done studies at this level. And accessing those, to be quite honest, it made my life a lot easier, but I was familiar with some of it from be before. Um, British Corps, you might think that's an obvious, you, well, you know what that means. Actually, not quite, and I need, need to be a little bit more specific. Until relatively late in the First World War, practically all of the Corps, no matter where the soldiers came from, were actually commanded by British officers. So, with due respect to our Canadian colleagues, their great success on Vimy Ridge in the Canadian Corps was actually commanded by General Sir Julian Bing, who was a British officer, and his artillery staff officer, was uh, one Alan Brooke, who went on to be Field Marshal Lord Alan Brooke. So in the first war, I refer to 
any corps which was under British command. In the Second World War, I don't do that, and I exclude, for example, First and Second Canadian Corps, which fought exclusively under Canadian officers during that period. And just as an aside, in both the First and the Second World War, there were two Indian Army Corps, but again, entirely officered by British officers, so I would include those in there. The numbers, I think, uh, speak for themselves. Before 1914, we had no corps. And in fact, there were only three British officers in 1914 who had ever commanded a corps at all on exercise. <laughs> and when they deployed in August of 1914, one of those officers was on a train and he actually dropped dead of a heart attack, so that brings it down to two. Between the wars, there were effectively no corps. What we had was that Britain was divided into commands, so Northern Command, so Southern Command, Scottish Command, and so on and so forth. And they were the framework for corps that would be stood up. But as far as I know, they never exercised at all before mobilization in 1939. So effectively, we had no experience in that 20-year interwar period. After the war, the uh, army reduced quite dramatically, but we did have the first British Corps in the Northern Army Group, which then, after 1989, became initially the ACE Rapid Rap Reaction Corps, now the Al Al Allied Rapid Reaction Corps, and we had John James um, talking from today. But the real point is there, for most of the 20th century, we had very little experience of Corps Command. However... Sorry, just to go back slightly. Effectively, we had no doctrine. We had nothing at all about, apart from a thing called field service regulations, which spoke in general terms about how formation should be commanded. So we had to put together the staffs um, with, to be fair, we had previously nominated commanders. So Douglas Haig, for example, had been in charge of the Aldershot command, and that became one of the cores, for example. But we effectively had to invent them. Now... This, to my mind, is, is the, the interesting graph because this is the months of the First World War. And this is where we start very early on with two, rapidly comes up to four corps very early on in the war. And that's how it grows. And you can see up there, that's 20. So we're at 21, 22 corps for the last two years of the war. The numbers become quite big. But by comparison for the Second World War, if you work backwards for the end of the war, into the war, you would... Oh, sorry, just before I do that. I'll be referring to some of these things. It's the Battle of the Somme, it's the Third Battle of Ypres, and it's the Hundred Days Campaign. But they're, they are four months long, those things. They are effectively campaigns rather than battles, so the com terminology can be a bit confusing. But if I go back to go on to the Second World War, that is Northwest Europe, 1944-45. By comparison, the experience is tiny. It's four British Corps for about 10 months. And to be fair to our American allies, if you did the same sort of thing for um, the US uh, 12th Army Group, you would come up with something like that. And once you add in the forces that land in southern France, you come up with something like that. Uh, I wouldn't belittle that at all, but you can see that the sheer bulk of British experience from the First World War gives us a lot to go from and a lot of useful stuff to learn from. But there were other theatres apart from Northwest Europe in both world wars. Um, and those are the statistics that by 1918 we deployed eight corps in other theatres. To the end of the Second World War we deployed another six. But what that means is when you actually add up the numbers that outside of France and Flanders in the Great War we had almost as many as the whole of the British Army in the Second World War. So that I go back to the point, the experience in the First World War is massive, and it starts from effectively no knowledge and no corporate um, um, experience at all. So what did they do and how did they do it? The initial idea was very, very simple. We borrow, borrowed it from the, the continent, but in simple round terms, the British Expeditionary Force, BEF, of... Um, 1914 was six divisions and a cavalry division, so they divided it into two corps. It was as simple as that, and they had incredibly small staff and more of that in a moment. Later, first of all, um, far more artillery was added into the corps, and this is a, a, a subject that I'll keep coming back to, and therefore controlling that artillery and then command, formal command of that artillery developed in a very, very major way. 
um, there was, as a matter of practice, no artillery held at the army level. It was always pushed down for a given battle. The medium and heavy artillery was pushed down to core level. And in particular, in a critical way about the way that they fought on the Western Front and elsewhere, in late 1915, early 1916, core became the focus of counter-battery or depth fire. Almost all depth fire was counter-battery, partly because it was a relatively short range. Virtually never could project artillery fire more than about 16 kilometers in front of your own front line. Um, but they had dedicated counter-battery staff officers at core level from early 1916. And in round terms, I know for a fact that that continued in practice right through to 1989. I wouldn't like to say exactly what happened after that, but counter-battery always was a core level function. <sighs> in a way that I'll explain in a moment, the way that they used to run the battle was that in simple terms, a core would be given a section, a sector of the front for an attack, and that divisions would be rotated through, but in large terms, or in broad terms, the cores would not be uh, rotated. It's not quite true, and here's an example. So the Battle of the Somme, four months in 1916. There were six, if you like, core sectors, couple in Fourth Army, a uh, couple in fifth, fifth Army. But of those six sectors, they employed uh, nine core headquarters in total, but four of them didn't change. One of them was rotated once, and another one was rotated twice. Typically, a well, in fact, invariably, a corps either had three or occasionally four divisions. But at the time, the strength of the British Expeditionary Force was 63 divisions. 62 of them fought on the Battle of the Somme, practically every single one. And just to give you a sample of some of six of those nine, you can see there, if you look at 13 corps and 14 corps, they're not the biggest numbers. The biggest number employed was actually in 10 corps. But if I told you that 13 Corps was in the front line for one month and then 14 Corps took over from it. So in that sector, we employed 35, sorry, 33 separate divisions. So the Corps gives the continuity of the operations and the divisions are rotated through it. But there's, there's a wider issue from that. And if you think of, for example, a Corps defending or holding of an area of the front line, on the Western Front for months, or in some cases even years, there's a real practical issue about the physicality of the trench system, shall we say. Who's responsible for oversight of where the trenches are and their maintenance and so on and so forth? Who's responsible for the, telephone, the buried telephone cable network? Who's responsible for the roads that have been built in the area? And the answer is all these things fall to the Corps. And so later on, for example, there is a designated Corps roads officer and a Corps light railway officer and so on and so forth. Because the divisions are coming and going all the time. And although they have temporary responsibility for those things, ongoing responsibility becomes a core issue. Air liaison often. Early in 1916, the Royal Flying Corps at the time designated one squadron specifically for each Corps. It wasn't a question that you could ask for air support. Each corps had its own Air Corps, Army Corporation squadron. And from that point onwards, you always had air liaison at the corps level and higher, but not necessarily any lower. And that had some interesting consequences. The main reason for doing that was that those aircraft were used for observation and control of counter-battery fire. So they contributed to air photography. But also, as the battle developed, they developed techniques by which they would report on the progress of the forward troops. And they would report that sometimes in actual real time, because by 1918, they have radios in some of the aircraft, and they were reporting in real time back to core where the forward um, attacking troops had got to. Uh, there's more to it than that, but you get the, the general practice, the general idea. One thing that I would caution you about in this discussion is practically every single core that I've mentioned, and there were lots of them, and there's lots of experience, Practically all of them existed in a higher level for formation. Trigva was talking about creating a core for the Northern Calotte. That would be, by this definition, outside of a higher level framework. And you wouldn't, for example, have a core on each side or something like that. I'm just expressing caution about taking forward this. So how did they do it? What sort of things did they get up to? Well, now, one of the points was that 
if you think about what I said about 62 divisions fighting on the Somme, is every single division was utterly interchangeable. You could literally take one out and put one, out, put, put one in to replace it overnight, and they got very good at doing that, but they were functionally interchangeable because everything was standard. And this is effectively a, um, a facsimile of the, the, um, the doctrine for the division in the attack. And every single division in the BEF and those in Salonika and elsewhere were using that particular thing. It's called SS-135, just the, the pamphlet name. You have to remember, though, that the um, communications hardware was absolutely rudimentary. Yes, there was a lot of buried telephone cable, but it was forever getting sh cut up and had to be re relayed, reburied, and so <laughs> forth. And a lot of messages were being carried by either dispatch riders, usually on motorcycles, or runners actually physically carrying orders and dispatches. Even in the Second World War, we did not have secure radio. Um, RT is radio telegraphy, but the point of the story is that much of it was done in using Morse codes, and it was subject to intercept by the Germans, who were actually very good at that sort of thing. Many of these corps were um, three divisions, sometimes four, but sometimes you actually saw them got considerably smaller than that. Probably uh, typical would be the winter of 1943-1945 in Italy, where over the spine of the mountains, the corps were just two frontline divisions, usually with one brigade held back as the corps reserve. But that did the job. But the cor other corollary was that sometimes they were just too big. And what do I mean by that? This example is uh, actually taken from... Uh, later on in uh, the uh, Second World War, uh, Operation Veritable is where Montgomery and 21st Army Group are attacking through the wood wooded area down to the Rhine. Uh, they crossed the Rhine in April of 1945 and then on to victory. But for various reasons, 30 Corps was given seven divisions. And it was just too big and too inflexible. And there are lots of reasons why Veritable didn't go particularly well. They did eventually get down to the Rhine. But part of it, to my mind, is that simply that the Corps was far too big. And what I think they should have done was just give it to two different Corps headquarters. And you might ask why they didn't. And there's actually a reason for that, but I'll come back to that later. So how were they commanded? Very small staffs. And this really, to my mind, is a takeaway. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, those are the sort of numbers that you had. Total staff officers, and that's about right. I have spoken to people who, spoke, who, who worked in 1BR Corps then. That's about right. I can't actually find a wiring diagram for it, but uh, they were very small. Now, interesting here, and this goes right back to Darren's earlier point, think of the interchangeability of those divisions. What that meant was that Corps had no habitual relationship with the assigned divisions. So one of the things that they did, I think, in late 1917, was appoint about eight corps liaison officers, mostly to go downwards into the divisions who were with them at the time. So that was quite institutionalized. And the other point is that the growth from there through to there is almost exclusively in attached services, logistic, medical, uh, air defense, and so on and so forth. And this is the point that the core, what you would now call the G3 and the G5 staff, were tiny. Now, I know because I worked for the captain who was one of those. It was two lieutenant colonels, three majors, and one captain. And that was the operations staff of headquarters, first British Corps, right up to the end of the Cold War. Absolutely tiny. Oh, and those ones, we didn't actually have a thing called the chief of staff, but that number included the person who was functionally the chief of the staff. At best, they could work incredibly quickly. What do I mean by that? Beginning of the Third Battle of Ypres, the two of the main corps for the beginning of the operation... Um, sorry, I'm ahead of myself. During most of these battles, they could get a new order from army for the next attack, and they could execute in three days. However, <coughs> later on, they had got to the point where even during the First World War, from new order from army down to execution, they could actually do it in about 19 hours. And the big problem there, which we'll go into a little bit more detail later, was about how to physically produce the map overlays. At best, they could do with incredibly short orders. So go back to the, the Battle of Ypres and those, first, those corps who were there for the beginning of what would turn into a four-month-long campaign. 
One of the corps wrote an order which was including all of their annexes, 23 pages, and another corps wrote a one which was all of 27 pages. That's including all annexes. By 1918, those people could do it on one side of one piece of paper and an annotated map. This is actually one taken from 1917. This is actually the Battle of Messines. In round terms, the thick lines are the German trench systems, which immediately become objectives. Those lines are typically 100 yards apart, and they show you how the artillery would lift through the phases of the operation. It's on a printed map. A uh, Royal Artillery draftsman, usually a warrant officer, would physically draw those. You then had to get them onto a printing press and get those at least down within a corps, at least down to one every battalion and every field artillery battery. So actually physically producing those took quite a long time. And that's why it took anything up to 19 hours. Very, very little uh, doctrine. That is the last edition. There were three in total of SS-135. You can see how small it is. And divisions within that had their own SOPs. That is a regular division, 4th Division. That's actually a facsimile. You can actually see the, 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 t uh, the typeface is original. That's not a techno, that's um, a territorial army, an army reserve division. It's slightly bigger. But you can see they had incredibly little doctrine. How can they do that? Who were, first of all, who were the commanders? Um, this is an interesting one. It's a bit of an aside. Who was promoted, who was sacked, and who, who stayed in post? Well, the great thing about the, the First World War is we have a large sample. There were 42 of them in total. 11 of them were promoted, but only 10 of them commanded uh, a British army. More of that in a moment. 10 of them were sacked, and that's really quite interesting. 19 stayed in post, and two were moved elsewhere. Um, just to, again as a small aside, 10 of, them, 10 of those who were promoted commanded British armies. The other one, uh, General Lord Cavan, commanded the 10th Italian Army. Wow. <laughs> These things happen. The sackings are interesting, but when you look at it, actually the British Army in the Second World War, and also, and Darren was being um, quite, quite um, open about this, actually the American Army in the be beginning of the Second World War, we all went through the same sort of processes that many of the people are pro uh, promoted relatively early on failed. What can we observe? What can we deduce? Were these corps headquarters anything more than post boxes where army sent orders down to division? In some cases, yes, but there was a good reason for that. By 1918, that was definitely not the case. The corps was writing division was sorry, army was writing a very small order. Corps was writing a small but sufficient order, and then divisions got on to do with it. And the main thing that Corps had to do was the artillery fire plan, as I, as I suggested earlier. But uh, ironically, what we saw in the Second World War was it wasn't division that there was post box, it was army that was the post box, and there's some reasons for that. In Normandy, Montgomery commanded an army group nominally, but it only had five corps in it, and it nominally had one British army, the second British army, and first Canadian army. Before uh, the first Canadian army was put in place, basically he used, Monty used the army commander as a post box, and he sent things straight down to corps. In other words, he basically says, write this and send it down to the corps. So the army was being used as a post box. Slightly later in Veritable, however, we got to the point where the relevant army commander was actually the Canadian, Harry Crerer. And although the corps commander, Guy Simons, was very, very competent, Monty had no trust and no faith at all in Harry Crerer. So basically, he told Harry Crerer to order 30 corps what to do. In other words, he used army as a post box. But this really what it comes to it. It's about the circumstances and the personalities of the people involved. In 1917, in a grossly expanding army, in divisions that didn't exist in 1915 or 1916, you had to centralise. You had to tell people that they had to do things the same way. And we didn't have much published, published doctrine, and that's one of the reasons why things were quite centralised right through, certainly through the Battle of the Somme and into um, 1917. Same point as before. 
The point about counter-battery was a massive thing in the First World War, and for what it's worth, El Alamein looks very much like the Battle of the Somme, but with sand, in terms of how the artillery is commanded and the corps were directed and so on and so forth. Until the point where you've gone beyond the initial barrage and everything is released down to divisions for them to control. I think, and that comes from an analysis of that book, and it's not a quote from that book, but the PhD I was referring to, actually by 1918, Corps were not over-centralizing, they were giving divisions as much flexibility as they, they genuinely could. There was very little experience early on, they had to make this up as they went along, but they had four years and a big campaign to do it. Here's an interesting point to you, and it reflects something that I found by uh, interviewing people in current and, and recent headquarters, going back a couple of... If you actually ask them what happened last year, you find that one or two of them can remember. If you ask them what happened two years ago, they can't remember. It's a strange thing, but I think it's probably true in most of our armies, is that actually formations have no collect or very little collective memory. The issue that I'm pointing out there is, by the end of the Cold War, we had forgotten all that stuff. I'm sure the ARC has been doing a brilliant job since then, but I'm sure that the ARC has no real insight about what was going on back then. I may be wrong. It'd be interesting to see what John has to say about that. This goes back to, if you like, the Royal Flying Corps. What situational awareness ha did who have at what point? Well, once the soldiers had gone over the front line, because everything else relied on uh, telephone cables which didn't go forward to the front trenches, battalion, brigade, division commanders lost situational awareness. But here we have a corps whose sensors, those aircraft, could see where the lead leading troops were. They could report that in near real time, and the corps could then report that downwards. And that's probably the first instance I've ever seen of that sort of thing happening. I'm not saying it's generic. I'm saying you have to look at those kind of issues and where the feeds go in. This is a very, very specific, specific comment. In order to have small corps, which aren't too big, you need a lot of corps headquarters. Monty only had five. And one of the reasons why, for example, 30 Corps was too big in, in Veritable was he couldn't just whistle up another Corps headquarters. It, it's all, all part of it. And this goes back to something, what was it? Oh, Dr. Harrison was saying this earlier, incompetence is no bar to promotion. Um, and there's a lovely story there, I can tell you about that one. But anyway, the real point is how could they do this? How could Corps get things done with incredibly small amounts of paperwork and incredibly small staff. Well, the real issue is familiarity. And a serving British officer, when I was talking about this uh, 18 months ago, he said, what do you mean by familiarity? So we discussed it, and he said, what you mean is familiarity with the theatre of operations, familiarity with the task. By the end of the war, some divisions had attacked something like 30 times. So they knew how to do the attack and familiarity with the team with which you are planning, and where possible with your subordinate commanders. But that was one of the problems, and I go back to the issue about liaison officers, because if the divisions are always rotating, you can't be expected to know every divisional commander in the army, for example. And I think that is a much bigger, wider issue. One of the big issues, I think, why NATO staff, procedures, headquarters, and all the rest of it get into the situations of doorstopper orders is quite simply because they're, they're, they're the procedures that we use at the moment don't allow them to get deeply familiar by these standards with theatre team and task. And I think we can and we should be doing something differently. And I think that's probably the most important issue that we should be facing now. And so I know some of you have seen it outside and some of you bought the book. It's all in there. If you want more details, please, there. But one other point for any of you, if you ever get round to, to writing a book, never, ever miss the opportunity to advertise it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to just uh, make a few uh, Final remarks uh, immediately. I know that several of you are looking forward to uh, yeah, 
doing something else. So um, first of all, I would thank you all, all speakers at the conference. Because of you, this has been su successful. And I thank you all for your contributions. Very high quality. So a short applause for all the speakers. I also thank all the participants. We do this for you, and it is through your participation that you show us that there is an interest for this and there is a requirement for this kind of conference. Uh, I would also like to thank all of you who have participated uh, online. It also tells us uh, that there is a requirement to uh, attend this kind of conferences throughout NATO, and I also know of other um, of participants from other countries. Tomorrow you will receive an email with a questionnaire, and I would highly appreciate any recommendations for improvements and for future topics. Also, any praise for uh, this year's conference is also welcome, so that we know what we should continue with. I still think that this kind of conference is an important activity, because it provides a great learning opportunity with a set of academics and practitioners, which are highly no no knowledge knowledgeable about their subjects, and it's difficult to find that kind of group within one institution. You have to make this kind of forum to get them together so that we can lift our, ourselves with our institutions. And it also provides a valuable opportunity for networking, both for the practitioners and planners, which can uh, lead to better operational outputs, and for academics and researchers, to gain and share access to research communi communities and deep knowledge. Most of these valuable relations would otherwise not be established or available. As has been mentioned by many of our speakers, the interpersonal relationships are crucial for operations. And I would also argue that this goes also for academic cooperation and research. Although some research is conducted by individuals in isolation, a lot is teamwork. And most often, individual work also requires some part with teamwork. My vision is to continue this conference activity for these particular reasons. And finally, I look forward to invite you for the next year's conference and also to read your feedback. And I wish you all safe travels home. Thank you. Thank you.